5-2. The Quest for Jesus Christ. 13-3. The Holy Forgery Mill. 21-4. Biblical Sources. 26-5. Non-Biblical Sources. 38-6. Further Evidence of a Fraud. Preface. Preface. The liberation of the human mind has never been furthered by dunderheads, it has been furthered by gay fellows who heaved dead cats into sanctuaries and then went roy- The liberation of the- Preface. 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 The liberation of the human mind has never been fur- furthered by dunderheads, it has been furthered by gay fellows who heaved dead cats into sanctuaries and then went roistering down the highways of the world, proving to all men that doubt, after all, was safe that the God in the sanctuary was finite in his power and hence a fraud. One horse laugh is worth ten thousand syllogisms. It is not only more effective, it is also vastly more intelligent. H. L. Mencken The search for the conspiratorial origins of the name of this book's author takes a circuitous route. Acharya means teacher, but the title conjures an image of a little old man in India. Mahatma Gandhi, for instance, bestowed the title onto his spiritual heir, Acharya Vinoba Bhave, who began the Buddhan land movement in India in the early 1950s. More strictly, the word means preceptor, the headmaster or principal of a school. A student could further fine-tune that definition by discovering, only in some dictionaries, that preceptory includes reference to the Knights Templar, an order ostensibly founded in 1119 CE to protect Holy Land pilgrims during the Second Crusade until it was banned and went underground two centuries later. Today, Freemasonry continues to claim descent from this medieval brotherhood. None of this rumination suggests that Acharya S. claims title as a preceptor or direct kinship to the Freemasons, although she has helped repopularize an essay by Thomas Paine regarding Masonic sun worship. Acharya's preceptory resides in cyberspace, on the web at www.truthbenown.com, on her discussion list, through her posts in such e-places as conformist.com and Steam Shovel Press, of which I am the publisher, and through her non-profit Institute for Historical Accuracy. Acharya S. is also not a kindly little old guru. Her writing reflects a wicked wit and the intelligence of a person who does not suffer fools gladly. Under the flashing head of Bob Dobbs on her website and the words God is bored your essays rants on earth and the cosmos, the existence or non-existence of God, the spiritual paucity of organized religion, as well as conspiracy and UFO alien realities. The believers theists feel my views are intolerant, she writes, while the non-believers atheists object to the mysticism and perceive me as creating new beliefs. While I do not wish to live in a world where everyone is deluded by blind belief, I also do not want to totally dismiss all imagination or color. A certain contemporary, straight-talking style distinguishes the work of Acharya S., which is surprising in that her scholarship sets out to recover ancient understanding from the relatively modern corruption of Judeo-Christian culture. Her style and perception are reminiscent of the late novelist and satirist William S. Burroughs, and she no doubt agrees with this assessment of his, perhaps the most basic concept in my writing is a belief in the magical universe, a universe of many gods often in conflict. The paradox of an all-powerful, all-seeing God who nonetheless allows suffering, evil and death, does not arise. Indeed, Acharya S. likes to say, there is no single giant male god in charge. There are six billion little gods all jockeying for position. What is most interesting, perhaps, about Acharya S.S. work is that, while a rabble-rousing rebel, she has an impressive set of academic credentials. She belongs to one of the world's most exclusive institutes for the study of ancient Greek civilization, the American School of Classical Studies at Athens, Greece. She has taught on Crete and worked on archaeological excavations in Corinth, site where legend holds Paul addressed the Corinthians, and in New England. She has also traveled extensively around Europe and has a working knowledge of Greek, French, Spanish, Italian, German, Portuguese and other languages. She has read Euripides, Plato and Homer in Ancient Greek and Cicero in Latin, as well as Chaucer in Middle English, 
and has clearly sat down with the Bible, in English, as well as in the original Hebrew and Greek, long enough to understand it more than most clergy. So, as entertaining and edifying as is the Dharma combat carried on by Acharya S. via her expository cyberprose, this book, The Christ Conspiracy, the greatest story ever sold, reflects the scholarship from which her fiery perspective comes. Some readers may find different aspects of it familiar. For instance, her survey of the lack of evidence for the existence of the historical Jesus contains information that has become increasingly accepted even by Christian revisionist groups such as the Jesus. Seminary. As inflammatory as that material remains in many circles, it serves only as the beginning for Acharya S. She takes hammer and tongue to many other non-historical figures, fraudulent church scams and misrepresented history in a matter-of-fact way, with chapters containing mythological character cross-references and details of legends. She recovers astronomical and cosmological elements in biblical texts that are far older than the corrupted versions revered in churches. The thesis of her work, that Christianity was created artificially out of older religions to consolidate Roman state control over those religions, as well as various mystery schools and secret societies, is a wellspring of awareness for students of conspiracy. Acharya S. also makes a clear case for the existence of an ancient global civilization. While some may wonder about her motives for creating such a monumental work that will no doubt shake up many people's perceptions of reality, Acharya S. told me in no uncertain terms that one of the reasons for doing this work is that I spent the first decade of my life literally becoming ill at war, violence, death and man's inhumanity to man and other creatures. Such vile behavior has all too often occurred because of religion and unfounded beliefs. The deception of the religion business is appalling, and it's high time it is exposed. Amen. Ken Thomas January 1, 1999 Beginning the last year of the second common era millennium. 1. Introduction. Believe not because some old manuscripts are produced, believe not because it is your national belief, believe not because you have been made to believe from your childhood, but reason truth out, and after you have analyzed it, then if you find it will do good to one and all, believe it, live up to it and help others live up to it. Buddha. The history of religious belief on earth is long and varied, with concepts, doctrines and rituals of all sorts designed to propitiate and beseech any number of gods and goddesses. Although many people believe religion to be a good and necessary thing, no ideology is more divisive than religion, which rends humanity in a number of ways through extreme racism, sexism and even speciesism. Religion, in fact, is dependent on division, because it requires an enemy, whether it be earthly or in another dimension. Religion dictates that some people are special or chosen while others are immoral and evil, and it too often insists that it is the duty of the chosen to destroy the others. An organized religion puts a face on the divine itself that is sectarian, sexist and racist, portraying a male god of a particular ethnicity, for example. The result is that, over the centuries, humankind has become utterly divided among itself and disconnected from nature and life around it, such that it stands on the verge of chaos. More horrors have been caused in the name of God and religion than can be chronicled, but some examples can be provided, as well as an assessment of how religions function. The fires of Moloch in Syria, the harsh mutilations in the name of Astarte, Sibylle, Jehovah, the barbarities of imperial pagan torturers, the still grosser torments which Roman Gothic Christians in Italy and Spain heaped on their brother men, the fiendish cruelties to which Switzerland, France, the Netherlands, England, Scotland, Ireland, America, have been witnesses, are none too powerful to warn man of the unspeakable evils which follow from mistakes and errors in the matter of religion, and especially from investing the God of love with the cruel and vindictive passions of erring humanity and making blood to have a sweet savour in his nostrils, and groans of agony to be delicious to his ears. Man never had the right to usurp the unexercised prerogative of God, and condemn and punish another for his belief. Born in a Protestant land, we are of that faith. If we had opened our eyes to the light, under the shadows of St. Peter's in Rome, we should have been devout Catholics. Born in the Jewish quarter of Alep, we should have condemned Christ as an impostor, in Constantinople, 
we should have cried Allah Illinois Allah, God is great and Muhammad is his prophet. Birth, place and education give us our faith. Few believe in any religion because they have examined the evidences of its authenticity, and made up a formal judgment, upon weighing the testimony. Not one man in ten thousand knows anything about the proofs of his faith. We believe what we are taught, and those are most fanatical who know least of the evidences on which their creed is based. I. Even today, when humankind likes to pretend it has evolved, battles go on around the world over whose God is bigger and better, and religious fanatics of any number of faiths repeatedly call for and receive the blood of unbelievers and infidels. Few religions of any antiquity have escaped unscathed by innumerable bloodbaths, and, while Islam is currently the source of much fear in the world today, Christianity is far and away the bloodiest in history. The briefest glance at the history of the Christian churches, the horrible rancors and revenges of the clergy and the sects against each other in the 4th and 5th centuries AD, the heresy-hunting crusades at Beshias and other places and the massacres of the Albigenses in the 12th and 13th centuries, the witch findings and burnings of the 16th and 17th, the hideous science-urged and bishop-blessed warfare of the 20th horrors fully as great as any we can charge of the Aztecs or the Babylonians, must give us pause point too. Defenders claim that Christianity ended human sacrifice. This may be true, but to do so, it had to sacrifice millions of humans. Christians also claim Christianity ended slavery, an assertion that is not true, as not only did Christians widely practice slavery, but the ideology itself serves as oppression and soul enslavement, believe or go to hell. Submit your will to God or suffer eternally. As Barbara Walker relates, anthropologist Jules Henry said, organized religion, which likes to fancy itself the mother of compassion, long ago lost its right to that claim by its organized support of organized cruelty, three to deflect the horrible guilt off the shoulders of their own faith. Religionists have pointed to supposedly secular ideologies such as communism and Nazism as oppressors and murderers of the people. However, few realize or acknowledge that the originators of communism were Jewish, Marx, Lenin, Hess, Trotsky, Four, and that the most overtly violent leaders of both bloody movements were Roman, Catholic, Hitler, Mussolini, Franco, or Eastern Orthodox Christian, Stalin, despotic and intolerant ideologies that breed fascistic dictators. In other words, these movements were not atheistic, as religionists maintain. Indeed, Hitler proclaimed himself a Christian and fighter for his Lord and Saviour, using the famous temple scene with Jesus driving out the brood of vipers and adders as a motivation for his evil deeds. V said Hitler. It is of no matter whether or not the individual Jew is decent. He possesses certain characteristics given to him by nature, and he can never rid himself of those characteristics. The Jew is harmful to us. My feeling as a Christian leads me to be a fighter for my Lord and Saviour. It leads me to the man who, at one time lonely and with only a few followers, recognised the Jews for what they were, and called on men to fight against them. As a Christian, I owe something to my own people. Hitler also remarked to one of his generals, I am now as before a Catholic and will always remain so. Whether or not Hitler was a true Christian is debatable, as he also reputedly considered Christianity a Jewish invention and part of the conspiracy for world domination. In addition, Hitler's paternal grandmother was allegedly Jewish. But Hitler himself was raised a Roman Catholic, and he was very much impressed by the power of the church hierarchy. He pandered to it and used it and religion as a weapon. All during his regime, Hitler worked closely with the Catholic Church, quashing thousands of lawsuits against it and exchanging large sums of money with it. In addition, thousands of Nazis were later given safe passage by the Vatican, as well as by multinational governmental agencies, to a number of locales, including North and South America, via the rattling from Germany through Switzerland and Italy. Vi. In reality, Hitler was only building on a long line of imputation against the Jews. As Christ killers, a charge used numerous times over the centuries whenever the Catholic Church wanted to hold a pogrom against common Jews and seize their assets. The events of World War II, in fact, were the grisly culmination of a centuries-old policy, started by the Church and continued by Martin Luther, as was well known by Hitler. 
Indeed, Hitler was embraced as a Christian instrument, as Walker relates. The rise of Hitler's Germany provides an interesting case in point, showing a nation swept by militaristic sentiment coupled with a sense of divine mission. The churches accepted Hitler's warmongering with religious joy. In April 1937, a Christian organization in the Rhineland passed a resolution that Hitler's word was the law of God and possessed divine authority. Reichsminister for Church Affairs Hans Kerl announced, there has arisen a new authority as to what Christ and Christianity really are, that is, Adolf Hitler. Adolf Hitler, is the true Holy Ghost. And so the pious gave him their blessing, and the churches gave him God's point seven. But Hitler and the church's behavior was not an aberration in the history of Christianity, as from its inception, the religion was intolerant, zealous and violent, with its adherents engaging in terrorism. For example, while blessing peacemakers and exhorting love and forgiveness of enemies and trespassers, the gentle Jesus also paradoxically declares. Do not think that I have come to bring peace on earth, I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's foes will be those of his own household. Mount 1034. Jesus further states that nation will rise up against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, thus, with a few sentences, Jesus has seeded extreme division, sedition and enmity wherever Christianity is promulgated. In thus exhorting his followers to violence, However, Jesus himself was building on centuries-old Jewish thought that called for the extermination of non-Jews, i.e., unbelievers, in Christian parlance. As an example of this Judeo-Christian fanaticism, the Apostle Paul was a violent zealot who as a Jew first persecuted the Christians and as a Christian subsequently terrorized the pagans. As Joseph Wheelis says in Forgery in Christianity, and, Paul, the tergiversant slaughter-breathing persecutor forepay of the early Christians, now turned for profit their chief apostle of persecution, pronounces time and again the anathema of the new dispensation against all dissenters from his superstitious, tortuous doctrines and dogmas, all such whom I have delivered unto. Satan, I Tim, I, 20, as he writes to advise his adjutant Timothy. He flings at the scoffing Hebrews this question, he that despised Moses's law died without mercy, of how much sore a punishment, suppose ye, shall he be thought worthy, who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God. Heb X, 28, 29. All such are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire, Jude 7, that they might all be damned who believed not the truth, 2 Thess, 2, 12, and even he that doubteth is damned, Rom 14, 23. This Paul, who with such bigoted presumption deals damnation round the land on all he deems the foe of his dogmas, is first seen consenting to the death of the first martyr Stephen, Acts 8, 1, then he blusters through the country breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, Acts 9, 1, the new converts to the new faith. Then, when he suddenly professed miraculous conversion himself, his old masters turned on him and sought to kill him, and he fled to these same disciples for safety, to their great alarm, Acts 9, 23-26, and straightway began to bully and threaten all who would not now believe his new preachments. To Elimars, who withstood them, the doughty new dogmatist set his eyes on him, and thus blasted him with inflated vituperation, O full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? Acts 13, 8, 10. Even the meek and loving Jesus is quoted as giving the fateful admonition, fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell, Matt, X, 28, here first invented and threatened by Jesus the Christ himself, for added terror unto belief. Paul climaxes the terror, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, Heb X, 31, 8. The myth of massive martyrdom. Along with the tale that Christianity began with a prince of peace comes the myth that the early Christians were gentle lambs served up in large numbers as martyrs for the faith by the diabolical Romans. The myth of martyrdom starts with 
The purported passage of the Roman historian Tacitus in which he excoriated Nero for killing a great multitude of Christians at Rome in 64 CE, however, this passage is a forgery, one of many made by the conspirators in the works of ancient authors, and there is little other evidence of such a persecution under either Nero or Domitian, the alleged notorious persecutor of Christians. As G. A. Wells says in Did Jesus Exist? The earliest unambiguous Christian reference to persecution under Nero is a statement made by Melito, Bishop of Sardis, about AD 170. It would be surprising if a great multitude of Christians lived at Rome as early as AD 64. The evidence for persecution under Domitian is, also, admitted to be very slight indeed. Point 9. What persecutions the Christians did suffer were not as gross as portrayed by propagandists in either number or severity. These punishments, of Christians, lack the public finality of the death sentence, until, 180, no governor in Africa was known to have put a Christian to death. In the late 240s, Origen insisted with rare candor that few Christians had died for the faith. They were easily numbered, he said. X and, as the editor of Eusebius's The History of the Church states, in fact, up to the persecution under the Emperor de Seuss, 250-51 there had been no persecution of Christians ordered by the emperor on an imperial scale. Point 11. To bolster their claims of massive martyrdom, pious Christians began around the 9th century to forge the martyrdom traditions. As Walker relates, the martyrs of the famous Roman persecutions under such emperors as Nero and Diocletian, seven centuries earlier, were largely invented at this time, since there were no records of any such specific martyrdoms. Names were picked at random from ancient tombstones, and the martyr tales were written to order. In reality, it was the Christian church that did much more persecuting and made many more martyrs than Rome had ever done, because religious tolerance was the usual Roman policy. Point 12. To weave their martyr tales, the conspirators used the Jewish apocryphon the fourth book of Maccabees, which described gruesome martyrdom by torture. The tale told in the Four Maccabees was widely read by Greeks and early Christians and served as a model for Christian martyrdom stories. 13 The methods described in 4 Maccabees are disturbingly similar to those used by the later Catholic Church. The guards had produced wheels, and joint dislocators, and racks, and bone crushers, and catapults, and cauldrons, and braziers, and thumbscrews, and iron claws, and wedges, and branding irons. 14. The author of 4th Maccabees goes on to describe the most foul torture imaginable, including the infamous racks being used to tear limbs from the body, as well as the flesh being stripped off and tongues and entrails ripped out, along with the obligatory death by burning. These techniques were later adopted with tremendous enthusiasm by the Christians themselves, who then became the persecutors. As Wheelis says, when the Christians were weak and powerless and subjected to occasional persecutions as enemies of the human race, they were vocal and insistent advocates of liberty of conscience and freedom to worship whatever god one chose. The Christian apologies to the emperors abound in eloquent pleas for religious tolerance, and this was granted to them and to all by the Edict of Milan and other imperial decrees. But when by the favour of Constantine they got into the saddle of the state, they at once grasped the sword and began to murder and despoil all who would. Not pretend to believe as the Catholic priest commanded them to believe. Point 15 The melodramatic portrayal of the early Christian movement as consisting of righteous mom and pop Christians being driven underground and ruthlessly persecuted is not reality, nor are the stories of massive martyrdom. What is reality is that from the 4th century onward, it was the Christians who were doing the persecution. The myth of the rapid spread of Christianity. It is widely believed that Christianity spread because it was a great idea desperately needed in a world devoid of hope and faith. Indeed, the myth says that Christianity was such a great idea that it caught on like wildfire in a lost world barren of spiritual enlightenment and crying out like a voice in the wilderness. It is further maintained that Christianity spread because of the martyrdom of its adherents, which purportedly so impressed a number of the early church fathers that they cast off their pagan roots to join the true faith. In reality, Christianity was not a new and surprising concept, and the impression of the ancient world given in this story is incorrect, as the ancient cultures possessed every bit of wisdom, righteousness and practically everything else found in Christianity. Furthermore, 
according to noted historian Gibbon, as related by Taylor, by the middle of the 3rd century, there were at Rome, the hotbed of Christianity only one. Bishop, 46 presbyters, 14 deacons, 42 acolytes and 50 readers. Exorcists and porters. We may venture, concludes the great historian, to estimate the Christians at Rome, at about 50,000, when the total number of inhabitants cannot be taken at less than a million. It should never be forgotten, that miraculously rapid as we are sometimes told the propagation of the gospel was, it was first preached in England by Austin, the monk, under commission of Pope Gregory, towards the end of the 7th century. So that the good news of salvation, in travelling from the supposed scene of action to this favoured country, may be calculated as having posted at the rate of almost an inch in a fortnight, 16 and as Robin Lane Fox says. In the 240s, Origen, the Christian intellectual, did admit that Christians were only a tiny fraction of the world's inhabitants. If Christians were really so numerous, we could also expect some evidence of meeting places which could hold so many worshippers. At this date, there were no church buildings on public ground, 17. If the rest of the empire is factored in, it is estimated that by the middle of the 3rd century Christians constituted only perhaps 2% of the total population. 18 also, as noted, there were in fact few martyrs, and the early forgers of Christianity were impressed not by such alleged martyrdom but by the position of power they would earn by their conversion. In actuality, Christianity did not spread because it was a great idea or because it was under the supernatural guidance of the resurrected Lamb of God. Were that so, he would have to be held accountable, because Christianity was promulgated by the sword, with a bloody trail thousands of mile long, during an era called by not a few a shameless age. Like so much else about Christianity, the claims of its rapid spread are largely mythical. In reality, in some places it took many blood-soaked centuries before its opponents and their lineage had been sufficiently slaughtered so that Christianity could usurp the reigning ideology. Pagan Europeans and others fought it tooth and nail, in an epic and heroic effort to maintain their own cultures and autonomy, in the face of an onslaught by those whom the pagans viewed as idiots and bigots. As Walker says, Christian historians often give the impression that Europe's barbarians welcomed the new faith, which held out a hope of immortality and a more kindly ethic. The impression is false. The people didn't willingly give up the faith of their ancestors, which they considered essential to the proper functioning of the earth's cycles. They had their own hope of immortality and their own ethic, in many ways a kinder ethic than that of Christianity, which was imposed on them by force. Justinian obtained 70,000 conversions in Asia Minor by methods that were so cruel that the subject populations eventually adopted Islam in order to rid themselves of the rigors of Christian rule. As a rule, heathen folk resisted Christianity as long as they could, even after their rulers had gone over to the new faith for its material rewards. Certain words reveal by their derivation some of the opposition met by missionaries. The pagan Savoyards called Christians idiots, hence Cretan, idiot, descended. From Cretan, Christian. German pagans coined the term bigot, from bagot, an expression constantly used by the monks. 19. Christianity was thus fervently resisted wherever it invaded, as nation after nation died under the sword fighting it off, because its doctrines and proponents were repugnant and blasphemous. As Walker also relates, Radbord, king of the Frisians, refused to abandon this faith when a Christian missionary informed him that Valhalla was the same as the Christian's hell. Where were his own ancestors, Radbod wanted to know, if there was no Valhalla. He was told they were burning in hell because they were heathens. Dastardly priest. Radbod cried. How dare you say my ancestors have gone to hell? I would rather, yes, by their god, the great wooden, I swear I would ten thousand times rather join those heroes in their hell, than be with you in your heaven of priests, xx some of the barbarians who resisted Christianity were actually far more advanced than those who followed what the pagans considered a vulgar ideology. For example, the Irish Fenians, whose rule was never to insult women, were said to have gone to hell for denying Christian anti-feminist doctrines, Sai when the great idea, threats of hell and other sweet talk failed to impress the 
Pagans, the Christian conspirators began turning the screws by establishing laws. Banning pagan priests, holidays and superstitions. Pagans were barred from being palace guards or holding civil and military office. Their properties and temples were destroyed or confiscated, and people who practiced idolatry or sacrifices were put to death. As Charles Waite says in History of the Christian Religion to the year 200, under Constantine and his sons, commissions had been issued against heretics, especially against the Donatists, who were visited with the most rigorous punishment. The decrees for the extirpation of heathenism were even more severe. Jerome and Leo the Great were in favor of the death penalty. I. Under the great Christian Constantine, the followers of Mithra were hounded with such pertinacity that no one even dared to look at the sun, and farmers and sailors dared not observe the stars for fear of being accused of the heresy. 23 And where hellfire, repressive laws and bribery did not work, force was used. Leaders who were tolerant of religions other than Christianity, such as Emperor Julian, were murdered. In Bible myths and their parallels in other religions, Doan relates how this great faith was in reality propagated by the most atrocious methods. In Asia Minor the people were persecuted by orders of Christian Emperor, Constantius. The rites of baptism were conferred on women and children, who, for that purpose, had been torn from the arms of their friends and parents, the mouths of the communicants were held open by a wooden engine, while the consecrated bread was forced down their throats, the breasts of tender virgins were either burned with red-hot eggshells, or inhumanly compressed between sharp and heavy boards. Persecutions in the name of Jesus Christ were inflicted on the heathen in most every part of the then known world. Even among the Norwegians, the Christian sword was unsheathed. They clung tenaciously to the worship of their forefathers, and numbers of them died real martyrs for their faith, after suffering the most cruel torments from their persecutors. It was by sheer compulsion that the Norwegians embraced Christianity. The reign of Olaf Tryggvason, a Christian king of Norway, was in fact entirely devoted to the propagation of the new faith, by means the most revolting to humanity. The recusants were tortured to death with fiend-like ferocity and their estates confiscated. These are some of the reasons why Christianity prospered, Xiv. The standard excuse for this vile behavior has been that Christian proponents had the right to purge the earth of evil and to convert the heathen to the true faith. Over a period of more than a millennium, the Church would bring to bear in this purification and conversion to the religion of the Prince of Peace the most horrendous torture methods ever devised, in the end slaughtering tens of millions worldwide. These conversion methods by Catholics against men, women and children, Christians and pagans alike, included burning, hanging and torture of all manner, using the tools described in 4th Maccabees. Women and girls had hot pokers and sharp objects slammed up their vaginas, often after priests had raped them. Men and boys had their penises and testicles crushed or ripped or cut off. Both genders and all ages had their skin pulled off with hot pincers and their tongues ripped out, and were subjected to diabolical machinery designed for the weakest parts of the body, such as the knees, ankles, elbows and fingertips, all of which were crushed. Their legs and arms were broken with sledgehammers, and, if there was anything left of them, they were hanged or burned alive. Nothing more evil could possibly be imagined, and from this absolute evil came the rapid spread of Christianity. So far this despicable legacy and crime against humanity remains unavenged and its main culprit unpunished, not only standing intact but inexplicably receiving the undying and unthinking supports of hundreds of millions, including the educated, such as doctors, lawyers, scientists, etc. This acquiescence is the result of the centuries of destruction and degradation of their ancestors' cultures, which demoralized them and ripped away their spirituality and heritage. In annihilating these cultures, the Christian conspirators also destroyed countless books and much learning, prizing the subsequent illiteracy and ignorance, which assisted in allowing for Christianity to spread. Wheelis recounts the state of the world under Christian dominance. With the decline and fall of the Roman Empire the Christian religion spread and grew, among the barbarian destroyers of Rome. The Dark Ages contemporaneously spread their intellectual pull over Europe. Scarcely any but priests and monks could read. 
Charlemagne learned to wield the pen only to the extent of scrawling his signature. The barons who wrested Magna Carta from John Lackland signed with their marks and seals. The worst criminals, provided they were endowed with the rare and magic virtue of knowing how to read even badly, enjoyed the benefit of clergy, i.e., of clerical learning, and escaped immune or with greatly mitigated punishment. There were no books save painfully written manuscripts, worth the ransom of princes, and utterly unattainable except by the very wealthy and by the church, not till about 1450 was the first printed book known in Europe. The Bible existed only in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin, and the ignorant masses were totally ignorant of it other than what they heard from the priests, who told them that they must believe it or be tortured and killed in life and damned forever in the fires of hell after death. It is no wonder that faith flourished under conditions so exceptionally favorable. XXV. Such is the disgraceful history of the religion of the gentle Prince of Peace. Yet, there are those today who not only support its monstrous edifice, built on the blood and charred bones of tens of millions, as well as on the death of learning in the Western world, but, unbelievably, wish it to be restored to its full glory, with the whole bloody works, witch burnings, persecution, annihilation of unbelievers and all. The fact is that too much trauma and bloodshed have been caused throughout the millennia strictly on the basis of unfounded faith and excessive illogic, and too much knowledge and wisdom has been lost, such that human history has been rife with ignorance and misunderstanding. It is for these reasons, among others, including the restoration of humanity, that we hope the oppressive and exploitative conspiracy behind religion in general and Christianity in particular will be exposed. As it is said, those who do not remember the past are doomed to repeat it, and humans as a species are prone to amnesia. It is thus imperative that these all important matters of religious ideology and doctrine be thoroughly explored and not left up to blind faith. 1. Pike, 164-5. 1. Carpenter, 118. 1. Walker, WMS, 447. 1. Jewish Encyclopedia, 1905, 418, Universal Jewish Encyclopedia, 1943, Hess, Moses, Soviet Russia. 1. Walker, WMS, 474. 1. Aarons and Loftus, 13. 1. Walker, WMS, 1061. 1. Wheelis, IIGW. 1. Wells, DJE, 41. 1. Fox, 434. 1. Eusebius, Xvi. 1. Walker, WDSSO, 271-2. 1. Barnstone, 154. 1. The Forgotten Books of Eden, 187. 1. Wheelis, FC, 303. 1. Taylor, 82-3. 1. Fox, 269. 1. Fox, 317. 1. Walker, WMS, 760. 1. Walker, WMS, 1039. 1. Walker, WMS, 771. 1. Wait, 528. 1. Larson, 191. 1. Doan, 448 to 9. 1. Wheelis, IIGW. 2. The Quest for Jesus Christ. In exploring the origins of Christianity, our focus naturally is turned to its purported founder and object of worship, Jesus Christ, whose story is told in the New Testament. So much interest and fascination have circulated around this wonderworker over the centuries that numerous and sizable tomes have been composed to fill out the New Testament tale by digging into the few clues as to Jesus's nature and historical background in order to produce a biographical sketch that either bolsters faith or reveals a more human side of this godman to which all can relate. Obviously, considering the time and energy spent on them, the subjects of Christianity and its legendary founder are very important to the Western mind and culture and, 
increasingly to the eastern as well. Nevertheless, little has come of all these efforts, as the real Jesus remains a phantom, mutating to suit the needs of the era and beholder. In fact, it has been said that Jesus is all things to all people. This assertion is certainly true, as from the earliest times his nature and character have been interpreted and reinterpreted to fit the cultural context of his proponents and representatives. As Burton Mack says in the Lost Gospel of Question in the Course of Christian History, to take one example of a series of social and cultural shifts, the Christ has been refigured many times over. In the period before Constantine, when bishops were taking their place as the leaders of the churches, the Christ was commonly depicted as the good shepherd who could guide the flock to its heavenly home. After Constantine, the Christ was pictured as the victor over death and the ruler of the world. During the medieval period, when the church was the primary vehicle of both social and cultural tradition, the story of Christ's ascent from the cross, or the tomb, to the seat of sovereignty, judgment, and salvation in heaven focused the Christian imagination on a Christ of a truly comprehensive, three. Decca world. Somewhat later we see the Gothic Christ appear, and then the Christ of the crucifix, the man of Galilee, the cosmic Christ, the feminine Christ, and so on. In every case, the rearrangements were necessary in order to adjust the mythic world to new social constraints and cultural systems of knowledge. Xvi. In fact, Jesus began his omnipotent reign when sons of God and sacred kings were all the rage. After the shocking and bloody turmoil of the Middle Ages, however, he became in the minds of the desperate a compassionate yet human teacher of morality, since it was obvious he could not possibly have been supernaturally in charge of the church in his name which was torturing and slaughtering by the millions. During the political upheavals of the 20th century, Jesus was considered a heroic revolutionary striving against oppression, as well as a communist. When various Indian gurus and yogis with their magic tricks became famous, it was fashionable to locate Jesus in India and or Tibet. At that time too was the psychedelic explosion, such that Jesus soon became a magic mushroom. Within the New Age movement that began with the renaissance of spiritualism last century, he has become the cosmic Christ and Christ consciousness. He has also of late become a black, a white supremacist, a gay, a woman, a heretic, a Mediterranean peasant, an orthodox butcher whose name wasn't Jesus, a cynic sage, an Arab, as well as the husband of Mary Magdalene and father of many children from whom are descended at least one European royal family. Now, with the popular subject of UFOs and extraterrestrials, Jesus is an alien with extraordinary powers because he is of a superior race, with any number of alien groups laying claim to his parentage. As commander of an enormous spaceship, this alien Jesus is waiting in the wings to rapture true believers off the earth in the nick of time during the coming earth changes. In a sense, Jesus is an alien, in that people are so alienated from the actual history of the planet they cannot grasp his true nature. Wells adds to the list of biographies of Jesus. In the past generation, the real Jesus has been variously a magician, Smith, a Galilean rabbi, Chilton, a marginal Jew, Maya, a bastard, Shaberg, a cipher, Thiering, a Qumran dissident, Allegro, et al., a Gnosticizing Jew, Kaoista, a dissident Jew, Verms, a happily married man and father of sons, Spung, a bandit, Horsley, an enthusiastic, possible zealot, opponent of the temple cult, Sanders. Perhaps most remarkable of all is the real Jesus of the Westar Project Jesus Seminar whose existence has been pinned on just over 30 authentic sayings, derived from an eclectic application of biblical critical axioms and confirmed by vote of the seminar members. Xvi. Despite all of this literature continuously being cranked out, it is obvious that we are dealing not with biography but with speculation, and there remains in the public at large a serious and unfortunate lack of education regarding religion and mythology, particularly that of Christ. Indeed, the majority of people are taught in most schools and churches that Jesus Christ was an actual historical figure and that the only controversy regarding him is that some people accept him as the Son of God and the Messiah, while others do not. However, whereas this is the raging debate most evident today, it is not the most important. 
Shocking as it may seem to the general populace, the most enduring and profound controversy in this subject is whether or not a person named Jesus Christ ever really existed. History and Positions of the Debate The debate as to whether or not Jesus Christ is a historical character may not be apparent from publications readily found in popular bookstores, however, beginning over two centuries ago, a significant group of scholars started springing up to challenge long-held beliefs. In more recent times, this controversy erupted when G. A. Wells published Did Jesus Exist? and the historical evidence for Jesus, among others, which sought to prove that Jesus is a non-historical character. An attempt to repudiate Wells was made in Jesus, the evidence, an entire, slim, volume written to establish that Jesus did exist. It should be noted that no such book would be needed if the existence of Jesus Christ as a historical figure were a proven fact accepted by all. In addition, it is not uncommon to hear in a discussion about Jesus something to the effect, don't get me wrong I believe he existed, a strange declaration, since. According to popular belief, everybody knows he existed. With a last assertion. True, this type of doubtful don't get me wrong comment would not be necessary. No one discussing Abraham Lincoln, for example, needs to clarify her his position by expressing the belief that Lincoln existed. Indeed, it is such doubt, which has existed since the beginning of the Christian era, that has led many seekers of truth over the centuries to research thoroughly this important subject from an independent perspective and to produce an impressive volume of literature that, while hidden, suppressed or ignored, Nevertheless has demonstrated logically and intelligently that Jesus Christ is a mythological character along the same lines as the gods of Egypt, England, Greece, India, Phoenicia, Rome, Sumeria and elsewhere, entities presently acknowledged by mainstream scholars and the masses alike as myths rather than historical figures. Delving deeply into this large body of work, one uncovers evidence that the Jesus character is in fact based. Upon these much older myths and heroes, one discovers that the gospel story is not, therefore, a historical representation of a Jewish rebel carpenter who had physical incarnation in the Levant 2000 years ago. In other words, it has been demonstrated continually for centuries that the story of Jesus Christ was invented and did not depict a real person who was either a superhuman son of God or a man who was evemeristically built up into a superhuman fairytale by enthusiastic followers. Within this debate regarding the nature and character of Jesus Christ, then, there have been three main schools of thought, the believers and the evemerists, both of which are historicizers, and the mythicists. The believers the believers take the Judeo-Christian Bible as the literal word of God, accepting on faith that everything contained within it is historical fact infallibly written by scribes inspired by God. As we shall see, this position is absolutely untenable, and requires blind and unscientific devotion, since, even if we discount the countless mistakes committed over the centuries by scribes copying the texts, the so-called infallible word of God is riddled with inconsistencies, contradictions, errors and yarns that stretch the credulity to the point of non-existence. In order to accept the alleged factuality of the Christian tale, i.e., that a male God came down from the heavens as his own son through the womb of a Jewish virgin, worked astonishing miracles, was killed, resurrected and ascended to heaven, we are not only to suspend critical thinking and integrity, but we must be prepared to tolerate a rather repulsive and generally false portrayal of the ancient world and peoples. In particular, we must be willing to believe fervently that the gentle Jesus, who was allegedly the all-powerful God, was mercilessly scourged, tortured and murdered by Romans and Jews, the latter of whom possessed the ignominy and stigma of being considered for eternity as vipers, serpents, spawn of Satan and Christ-killers guilty of deicide who gleefully shouted crucify him and let his blood be upon us and our children. In addition to this hideous notion, we are also expected to believe that the omnipotent and perfect God could only fix the world, which he created badly in the first place, by the act of blood atonement, specifically with his own blood, yet, we know that such blood atonement is rooted in the ancient custom of sacrificing humans and animals, serving basically as a barbaric, scapegoat ritual. Indeed, the sacrifice of God seems far worse than that of either animals or humans, yet this 
Deicide is supposed to be one of the highest religious concepts. In fact, it is God's plan. As Kersey Graves says in The World's Sixteen Crucified Saviors, and hereafter, when they laugh at the Jewish superstition of a scapegoat, let them bear in mind that the more sensible and intelligent people may laugh in turn at their superstitious doctrine of a scapegoat. The blood of God must atone for the sins of the whole human family, as rams, goats, bullocks and other animals had atoned for the sins of families and nations under older systems. Somebody must pay the penalty in blood, somebody must be slaughtered for every little foible or peccadillo or moral blunder into which erring man may chance to stumble while upon the pilgrimage of life, while journeying through the wilderness of time, even if a god has to be dragged from his throne in heaven, and murdered to accomplish it whose soul, possessing the slightest moral sensibility, does not inwardly and instinctively revolt at such a doctrine. We hold the doctrine to be a high-handed insult to the all-loving Father, who, we are told, is long-suffering in mercy, and plentiful in forgiveness, to charge him with sanctioning such a doctrine, much less originating it. In embracing Christianity as reality, we are also required to assume that, in order to get his important message across, God came to earth in a remote area of the ancient world and spoke the increasingly obscure language of Aramaic, as opposed to the more universally spoken Greek or Latin. We must also be prepared to believe that there is now an invisible man of a particular ethnicity omnipresently floating about in the sky. In addition, we are asked to ridicule and dismiss as fiction the nearly identical legends and tales of many other cultures, while happily receiving the Christian fable as fact. This dogmatic stance in effect represents cultural bigotry and prejudice. All in all, in blindly believing we are faced with what can only appear to be an abhorrent and ludicrous plan on the part of God. The Evemerists. It is because of such irrational beliefs and prejudicial demands that many people have rejected Christian claims as being incredible and unappealing. Nevertheless, Numerous such dissidents have maintained that behind the fabulous fairytales found in the Gospels there was a historical Jesus Christ somewhere, an opinion usually based on the fact that it is commonly held, not because its proponents have studied the matter or seen clear evidence to that effect. This meme or mental programming of a historical Jesus has been pounded into the heads of billions of people for nearly 2,000 years, such that it is assumed a priori by many including scholars who have put forth an array of clearly speculative hypotheses hung on highly tenuous threads regarding the life of Jesus. Such speculators often claim that a historical Jewish master named Jesus was deified or evemorized by his zealous followers, who added to his mundane history a plethora of supernatural qualities and aspects widely found in more ancient myths and mystery religions. This school of thought, called evemorism or euhemerism, is named after Evemeris, or Euhemeros, a Greek philosopher of the 4th century BCE who developed the idea that, rather than being mythical creatures, as was accepted by the reigning intellectuals, the gods of old were in fact historical characters, kings, emperors and heroes whose exploits were later deified. Of these various Evemerist biographies, the most popular are that Jesus was a compassionate teacher who irritated the Romans with his goodness, or a political rebel who annoyed the Romans with his incitement of discord, for which he was executed. Wells comments upon the theory du jour. As political activism is today a la mode, it is widely felt that a revolutionary Jesus is more relevant than the Jesus of the 19th century liberal theologians who went about doing good, Acts, 1038. Both these Jesuses simply reflect what in each case the commentators value most highly rather than the burden of the texts. If Jesus had been politically troublesome, his supporters would have been arrested with him. But there is no suggestion of this in any of the Gospels. Xvi. He further states, there are three obvious difficulties against the supposition that a historical Jesus was actually executed as a rebel. 2. All Christian documents earlier than the Gospels portray him in a way hardly compatible with the view that he was a political agitator. 2. If his activities had been primarily political, and the evangelists were not interested in or deemed it inexpedient to mention his politics, then what was the motive for their strong interest in him? How did they 
Come to suppose that a rebel, whose revolutionary views they tried to suppress in their gospels, was the universal saviour. 3. If such an episode as the cleansing of the temple was not a religious act, as the gospels allege, but an armed attempt to capture the building and to precipitate a general insurrection, then why does Josephus say nothing of it? As Trochmi has observed, a military attack on the temple would not have been ignored by this writer who was so concerned to show the dangers of revolt and violence. Josephus' silence is corroborated by the positive affirmation of Tacitus that there was no disturbance in Palestine under Tiberius, AD 14-37, whereas the preceding and following reigns were characterized by rebellion and unrest there, six of these various lives of Jesus, Wells also says. It is now customary to dismiss with contempt many 19th-century lives of Jesus on the grounds that their authors simply found in him all the qualities which they themselves considered estimable. But the wide circulation today of books which portray him as a rebel seems yet another illustration of the same phenomenon. XXX Evemerist scholar Shea Cohen, professor of Judaic and Religion Studies at Brown University, admits the desperate situation of trying to find this historical reformer rebel under the accreted layers of miracles. Modern scholars have routinely reinvented Jesus or have routinely rediscovered in Jesus that which they want to find, be it rationalist, liberal Christianity of the 19th century, be it apocalyptic miracle workers in the 20th, be it revolutionaries, or be it whatever it is that they are looking for, scholars have been able to find in Jesus almost anything that they want to find. Even in our own age scholars are still doing this. People are still trying to figure out the authentic sayings of Jesus, all our middle-class liberal Protestant scholars will take a vote and decide what Jesus should have said, or might have said. And no doubt their votes reflect their own deep-seated, very sincere, very authentic Christian values, which I don't gainsay for a moment. But their product is, of course, bedeviled by the problem that we are unable to have any secure criteria by which to distinguish the real from the mythic or what we want to be. So from what actually was so? These various theories in the end constitute will spinning in a futile effort to rescue historicity, any historicity, in the gospel tale. Because of the dearth of personality in the gospels and the irrationality of the tale, historicizers must imbue the character with their own personalities and interpretations of reality, such as, when Jesus said, blessed are the poor, he surely didn't mean that poverty is a blessing but that those who lived with poverty are good because they are not resorting to robbery, xi and in order to pad out the real Jesus after most of his life is removed, scholars must resort to reasoning of the most tortured kind. While the miracles of Jesus could easily be created and multiplied by the credulity of his followers, the followers could never have devised ethical, speculative, or soteriological doctrines, which, although in no instance original, presented new combinations of established religious concepts and ethical principles. Xixi. Thus, we have an admission that Jesus brought nothing new, but an insistence nevertheless that Jesus deserved merit because he novelly combined his unoriginal concepts. In reality, this type of eclecticism also was not new but quite common long before the Christ character arose. In the historical Jesus and the mythical Christ, Gerald Massey says of these scholars' efforts, it is pitiful to track the poor faithful gleaners who picked up every fallen fragment or scattered waif and stray of the mythos, and to watch how they treasured every trait and tint of the ideal Christ to make up the personal portrait of their own supposed real one. Xixi. In Ancient History of the God Jesus, Edouard Dujard in Remarks of Ephemerism. This doctrine is nowadays discredited except in the case of Jesus. No scholar believes that Osiris or Jupiter or Dionysus was an historical person promoted to the rank of a god, but exception is made only in favor of Jesus. It is impossible to rest the colossal work of Christianity on Jesus, if he was a man. Indeed, Ephemerist scholars will admit that this humanized Jesus stripped of all miracles would not have made a blip on Pilate's radar screen, being insignificant as one of the innumerable rubble rousers running about Palestine during this time. If we were to take away all the miraculous events surrounding the story of Jesus to reveal a human, we would certainly find no one who could have garnered huge crowds around him because of his preaching. And the fact is that this crowd-drawing preacher finds his place in history only in the New Testament, completely overlooked by the dozens of historians of his day, an era considered one of the best documented in history.
such an invisible character, then, could never have become a god worshipped by millions. In fact, the standard Christian response to the Evemerists has been that no such Jesus, stripped of his miracles and other supernatural attributes, could ever have been adored as a god or even been saluted as the Messiah of Israel. This response is quite accurate, no mere man could have caused such a hullabaloo and hellish fanaticism, the product of which has been the unending spilling of blood and the enslavement of the spirit. The crazed inspiration that has kept the church afloat merely confirms the mythological origins of this tale. Furthermore, the theory of ephemerism has served the Catholic Church, as Higgins remarks. That the gods of the ancients were nothing but the heroes or benefactors of mankind, living in very illiterate and remote ages, to whom a grateful posterity paid divine honours, appears at first sight to be probable, and as it has served the purpose of the Christian priests to enable them to run down the religion of the ancients, and, in exposing its absurdities, to contrast it disadvantageously with their own, ephemerism, has been, and continues to be, sedulously inculcated, in every public and private seminary. Although the pretended worship of heroes appears at first sight plausible, very little depth of thought or learning is requisite to discover that it has not much foundation in truth. Xixiv. In Pagan Christs, J. M. Robertson states of Ephemerism. It is not the ascription of prodigies to some remarkable man that leads us to doubt his reality. Each case must be considered on its merits when we apply the tests of historical evidence. We must distinguish between what the imagination has added to a meagre biography, and those cases in which the biography itself has been added to what has grown out of a ritual or doctrine. XXXV The bottom line is that when one removes all the elements of those preceding myths that contributed to the formation of the Jewish godman, there remains no one and nothing historical left to which to point. As Walker says, scholars' efforts to eliminate paganism from the Gospels in order to find a historical Jesus have proved as hopeless as searching for a core in an onion. Massey remarks, a composite likeness of twenty different persons merged in one, is not anybody. And, it is clear that in their desperate attempts, ephemerist scholars have added their own likenesses to the composite. The Mythicists This missing core to the onion has been recognized by many individuals over the centuries who have thus been unable to accept the historical nature of Jesus Christ because not only is there no proof of his existence but virtually all evidence points to him being a mythological character. As stated, this mythicist school began to flourish starting a few hundred years ago, propelled by archaeological and linguistical discoveries and studies, as well as by the reduction of the church's power and vicious persecution of its critics. This group has consisted of a number of erudite and daring individuals who have overcome the conditioning of their culture to peer closely and with clear eyes into the murky origins of the Christian faith. Massey elucidates the mythicist's perspective. The general assumption concerning the canonical gospels is that the historic element was the kernel of the whole, and that the fables accreted round it, whereas the mythos, being pre-extant, proves the core of the matter was mythical, and it follows that the history is incremental. It was the human history that accreted round the divinity, and not a human being who became divine. XV. While the mythicist school has only made real inroads in the past couple of centuries, and even though its brilliant work and insight have been ignored by mainstream experts in both the believing and evamorist camps, the mythicist arguments have been built upon a long line of Bible criticism. Indeed, this controversy has existed from the very beginning as is evidenced by the writings of the church fathers themselves i.e., those who founded the Christian Church, who revealed that they were constantly forced by the pagan intelligentsia to defend what the non-Christians and other Christians, heretics, alike saw as a preposterous and fabricated yarn with absolutely no evidence of it ever having taken place in history. As Rev. Robert Taylor says in the Diegesis, and from the Apostolic Age downwards, in a never-interrupted succession, but never so strongly and emphatically as in the most primitive times, was the existence of Christ as a man most strenuously denied. In fact, as Taylor also states, those who denied the humanity of Christ were the first class of professing Christians, and not only first in order of time, but in dignity of character, in intelligence, and in moral influence. The deniers of the humanity of Christ, or, in a word, 
professing Christians, who denied that any such man as Jesus Christ ever existed at all, but who took the name Jesus Christ to signify only an abstraction, or prosopopoeia, the principle of reason personified, and who understood the whole gospel story to be a sublime allegory, these were the first, and, it is not dishonor to Christianity to pronounce them, the best and most rational Christians. Again, this denial of Christ in the flesh is found numerous times in the writings of the day, including the New Testament itself, yet it is ignored by historicizers, believers and ephemerists alike. Indeed, in their exhaustive research into this all-important subject, historicizers have either willfully and unreasonably ignored the great minds of the mythicist school or have never come across them. If we assume that the historicizers' disregard of these scholars is deliberate, we can only conclude that it is because the mythicists' arguments have been too intelligent and knife-like to do away with. Of course, the works of the mythicists have not been made readily available to the public, no doubt fearfully suppressed because they are somewhat irrefutable, so we cannot completely fault the experts for having never read them. The arguments of these particular mythicists are, however, the most important work done in this field to date, so any refutation that has not dealt with them properly is neither exhaustive nor convincing. Those historicizers who have acknowledged the mythicists' contentions, not being able to refute the voluminous amount of evidence as to Christ's mythical nature, are forced to dismiss the mythicists' research and conclusions by claiming their work to be outdated. Yet, the mythicist argument has existed from the beginning of the Christian era, and there is still no cogent argument that demonstrates it to be outdated. Also, if it is outdated merely because it comes before, how much more outdated is the Bible, which came even more so before? It is also claimed that the mythicists make too much of the pagan origins and ignore the Jewish aspects of the gospel tale. The Jewish elements, argue historicizers, must be historical and, therefore, Jesus existed. Specious and sophistic though it may be, since anyone can interpolate quasi-historical data into a fictional story and many people have done so, from the composers of the Iliad to those of the Old Testament and any number of other novels, this historicizer argument has conveniently allowed for the dismissal of the entire mythicist school, despite the overwhelming evidence in its favor and absolute dearth thereof in the historical camp. The fact is that it is historicizing scholars themselves who do not pay enough attention to the Jewish aspects, because if they did, they would discover that these elements are frequently erroneous, anachronistic and indicative of a lack of knowledge about geography and other details that would not have been so, had the writers been indigenous to the era and eyewitnesses to the events. Massey summarizes the mythicist position. It can be demonstrated that Christianity pre-existed without the personal Christ, that it was continued by Christians who entirely rejected the historical character in the second century, and that the supposed historic portraiture in the canonical Gospels was extant as mythical and mystical before the Gospels themselves existed. And he further states, whether considered as the God-made human, or as man-made divine, this character never existed as a person. Moreover, the claim of pre-existence of the Gospel portraiture was repeatedly confirmed by Christians, as shall be seen. According to the mythicist school, then, the New Testament could rightly be called, gospel fictions and the Christian religion could be termed the Christ conspiracy. 3. The Holy Forgery Mill J. Accuse. From the very beginning of our quest to unravel the Christ conspiracy, we encounter suspicious territory, as we look back in time and discover that the real foundation of Christianity appears nothing like the image provided by the clergy and mainstream authorities. Indeed, far more rosy and cheerful than the reality is the picture painted by the vested interests as to the origins of the Christian religion, to wit, a miracle-making founder and pious, inspired apostles who faithfully and infallibly recorded his words and deeds shortly after his advent and then went about promulgating the faith with great gusto and success in saving souls. Contrary to this popular delusion, the reality is that, in addition to the enormous amount of bloodshed which accompanied its foundation, Christianity's history is rife with forgery and fraud. So rampant is this treachery and chicanery that any serious researcher must immediately begin to wonder about the story itself. In truth, the 
Christian tale has always been as difficult to swallow as the myths and fables of other cultures, yet countless people have been able to overlook the rational mind and to willingly believe it, even though they may equally as easily dismiss the nearly identical stories of these other cultures. Indeed, the story of Jesus as presented in the Gospels, massive impossibilities and contradictions that it is, has been so difficult to believe that even the fanatic Christian doctor and saint, Augustine, 354-430, admitted, I should not believe in the truth of the Gospels unless the authority of the Catholic Church forced me to do so, six nevertheless, the monumentally superstitious and credulous child of faith Augustine must not have been too resistant, because he already accepted as historic truth the fabulous founding of Rome by Romulus and Remus, their virgin birth by the Godmars, and their nursing by the she-wolf, XL. Apparently unable to convince himself rationally of the validity of his faith, early. Church Father Tertullian, c. 160-200, made the notorious statement, Credo quia incredibilis ist I believe because it is unbelievable, Xlion ex pagan. Tertullian vehemently and irrationally defended his new faith, considered fabricated by other pagans, by acknowledging that Christianity was a shameful thing and monstrously absurd. I maintain that the Son of God was born, why am I not ashamed of maintaining such a thing? Why? But because it is itself a shameful thing. I maintain that the Son of God died, well, that is wholly credible because it is monstrously absurd. I maintain that after having been buried, he rose again, and that I take to be absolutely true, because it was manifestly impossible. Xli. In addition to confessions of incredulity by pagans and Christians alike, we also encounter repeated accusations and admissions of forgery and fraud. While the masses are led to believe that the Christian religion was founded by a historical wonderworker and his devoted eyewitnesses who accurately wrote down the events of his life and ministry in marvelous books that became God's Word, the reality is that none of the Gospels was written by its purported author and, indeed, no mention of any New Testament text can be found in writings prior to the beginning of the second century of the Common Era, CE, long after the purported events. These holy books, then, so revered by devotees, turn out to be spurious, and since it is in them that we find the story of Christ, we must be doubtful as to its validity as well. Regarding the canonical Gospels, Wheeler states. The Gospels are all priestly forgeries over a century after their pretended dates. As said by the great critic, Salomon Reynek, with the exception of Papias, who speaks of a narrative by Mark, and a collection of sayings of Jesus, no Christian writer of the first half of the second century, i.e., up to 150 AD, quotes the Gospels or their reputed authors, Xlai. Bronson Keeler, in A Short History of the Bible, concurs, they are not heard of till 150 AD, that is, till Jesus had been dead nearly 120 years. No writer before 150 AD makes the slightest mention of them. Live. In the book Your Church Doesn't Want You to Read, John Remsberg elucidates. The four Gospels were unknown to the early Christian fathers. Justin Martyr, the most eminent of the early fathers, wrote about the middle of the second century. His writings in proof of the divinity of Christ demanded the use of these Gospels, had they existed in his time. He makes more than 300 quotations from the books of the Old Testament, and nearly 100 from the apocryphal books of the New Testament, but none from the four Gospels. Reverend Giles says, the very names of the evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, are never mentioned by him, Justin, do not occur once in all his writings XLV. And Waite says. At the very threshold of the subject, we are met by the fact that nowhere in all the writings of Justin does he want so much as mention any of these Gospels. Nor does he mention either of their supposed authors, except John. Once his name occurs, not, however, as the author of a Gospel, but in such a connection as raises a very strong presumption that Justin knew of no Gospel of John the Apostle. Xlai. Waite further states. No one of the four Gospels is mentioned in any other part of the New Testament. No work of art of any kind has ever been discovered, no painting, or engraving, no sculpture, or other relic of antiquity, which may be looked upon as furnishing additional evidence of the existence of those Gospels, 
and which was executed earlier than the latter part of the second century. Even the exploration of the Christian catacombs failed to bring to light any evidence of that character. The four Gospels were written in Greek, and there was no translation of them into other languages, earlier than the 3rd century. Xy. In the Woman's Encyclopedia of Myths and Secrets, Barbara Walker relates. The discovery that the Gospels were forged, centuries later than the events they described, is still not widely known even though the Catholic Encyclopedia admits, the idea of a complete and clear-cut canon of the New Testament existing from the beginning has no foundation in history. No extant manuscript can be dated earlier than the 4th century AD, most were written even later. The oldest manuscripts contradict one another, as also do even the present canon of synoptic gospels. Xy. In fact, as Waite says, nearly everything written concerning the Gospels to the year 325, and all the copies of the Gospels themselves to the same period, are lost or destroyed. Xlix the truth is that very few early Christian texts exist because the autographs, or originals, were destroyed after the Council of Nicaea and the retouching of 506 CE under Emperor Anastasius which included revision of the Church Fathers' works, l catastrophic acts that would be inconceivable if these documents were truly the precious testaments of the very apostles themselves regarding the Lord and Saviour, whose alleged advent was so significant that it sparked profound fanaticism and endless wars. Repeating what would appear to be utter blasphemy, in the 11th and 12th centuries the infallible word of God was corrected again by a variety of church officials. In addition to these major revisions have been many others, including copying and translation mistakes and deliberate mutilation and obfuscation of meaning. It has never been only non-believing detractors who have made such allegations of falsification and deceit by the biblical writers. Indeed, those individuals who concocted some of the hundreds of alternative gospels and epistles being circulated during the first several centuries even admitted that they forged the texts. Of these numerous manuscripts, the Catholic Encyclopedia acknowledges, as quoted by Wheelis. Enterprising spirits responded to this natural craving by pretended gospels full of romantic fables, and fantastic and striking details, their fabrications were eagerly read and accepted as true by common folk who were devoid of any critical faculty and who were predisposed to believe what so luxuriously fed their pious curiosity. Both Catholics and Gnostics were concerned in writing these fictions. The former had no motive other than that of a pious fraud. Li. Forgery during the first centuries of the Church's existence was thus admittedly rampant, so common in fact that this phrase, pious fraud, was coined to describe it. Furthermore, while admitting that the Catholics were engaged in fraud, the Catholic Encyclopedia is also implying that the Gnostics were truthful in regard to the fictitious and allegorical nature of their texts. Regarding this Catholic habit of fraud, Mangasarian states in The Truth About Jesus, the church historian, Mosheim, writes that, the Christian fathers deemed it a pious act to employ deception and fraud. Again, he says, the greatest and most pious teachers were nearly all of them infected with this leprosy. Will not some believer tell us why forgery and fraud were necessary to prove the historicity of Jesus? Another historian, Milman, writes that, pious fraud was admitted and avowed by the early missionaries of Jesus. It was an age of literary frauds, writes Bishop Ellicott. Speaking of the times immediately following the alleged crucifixion of Jesus, Dr. Giles declares that, there can be no doubt that great numbers of books were written with no other purpose than to deceive. And it is the opinion of Dr. Robertson Smith that, there was an enormous floating mass of spurious literature created to suit party views, Lee. So fundamental to the faith was fraud that Wheelis remarked. The clerical confessions of lies and frauds in the ponderous volumes of the Catholic Encyclopedia alone suffice to wreck the Church and to destroy utterly the Christian religion. The Church exists mostly for wealth and self aggrandizement, to quit paying money to the priests would kill the whole scheme in a couple of years. This is the sovereign remedy. Lee. According to Christian father and Church historian Eusebius, 260 340, Bishop of Corinth Dionysius lashed out against forgers who had mutilated not only his letters but the Gospels themselves. When my fellow Christians invited me to write letters to them I did so. 
These the devil's apostles have filled with tares, taking away some things and adding others. Small wonder then if some have dared to tamper even with the word of the Lord himself, when they have conspired to mutilate my own humble efforts. Live. These statements by Dionysius imply that the letters and gospels were mutilated by his fellow Christians themselves, as the letters were presumably in their possession, unless they were hijacked along the way by some other devil's apostles, and as the the word of the Lord certainly was in the possession of Christians and no others. In addition, a number of the fathers, such as Eusebius himself, were determined by their own peers to be unbelievable liars who regularly wrote their own fictions of what the Lord said and did during his alleged sojourn upon the earth. In one of his works, Eusebius provides a handy chapter entitled, How it may be lawful and fitting to use fossid as medicine, and for the benefit of those who want to be deceived. Of Eusebius, Waite writes, not only the most unblushing fossids, but literary forgeries of the vilest character, darken the pages of his apologetic and historical writings L.V. Wheelis also calls Justin Martyr, Tertullian and Eusebius three luminous liars, L.V. Keeler states, the early Christian fathers were extremely ignorant and superstitious, and they were singularly incompetent to deal with the supernatural. Larson concludes that many early bishops like Jerome, Antony, and Saint Martin, were definitely psychotic. In fact, there was scarcely a single father in the ancient church who was not tainted with heresy, mental aberration, or moral enormity, LVI. Thus, deceiving, mentally ill individuals basically constitute the genesis of Christianity. Of their products, Wheelis further remarks. If the pious Christians, confessedly, committed so many and so extensive forgeries and frauds to adapt these popular Jewish fairy tales of their God and holy worthies to the new Christian Jesus and his apostles, we need feel no surprise when we discover these same Christians forging outright new wonder tales of their Christ under the fiction of the most noted Christian names and in the guise of inspired gospels, epistles, acts and apocalypses. LVI. He continues. Half a hundred of false and forged apostolic gospels of Jesus Christ, together with more numerous other scripture forgeries, was the output, so far as known now, of the lying pens of the pious Christians of the first two centuries of the Christian age of apocryphal literature, licks. Wheelis also reports the Protestant Encyclopedia Biblica as stating, almost every one of the apostles had a gospel fathered upon him by one early sect or another, L.X. Stone relates the words of Dr. Cunius Middleton on the subject of biblical forgery. There never was any period of time in all ecclesiastical history, in which so many rank heresies were publicly professed, nor in which so many spurious books were forged and published by the Christians, under the names of Christ, and the apostles, and the apostolic writers, as in those primitive ages. Several of these forged books are frequently cited and applied to the defense of Christianity, by the most eminent fathers of the same ages, as true and genuine pieces. Luxi. Wheelis demonstrates how low the fathers and doctors of texts were willing to stoop. If the gospel tales were true, why should God need pious lies to give them credit? Lies and forgeries are only needed to bolster up falsehood, nothing stands in need of lying but a lie. But Jesus Christ must needs be propagated by lies upon lies, and what better proof of his actuality than to exhibit letters written by him in his own handwriting? The little liars of the Lord were equal to the forgery of the signature of their God false letters in his name, as above cited from that exhaustless mine of clerical falsities, the Catholic Encyclopedia, C.E. LXI. Indeed, Christian tradition pretends that Christ was extremely renowned even during his own time, having exchanged correspondence with King Abgar of Syria, who was most pleased to have the Christian saviour take refuge in his country. Of course this story and the silly letters alleged to have been exchanged between the two are as phony as three-dollar bills, illustrating the ridiculous mendacity to which historicizers had to resort to place their invented character and drama at this time. Furthermore, the forgers were not very skilled or conscientious, such that they left many clues as to their underhanded endeavors. As Wheeler states, the Hebrew and Greek religious forgers were so ignorant or careless of the principles of criticism, 
that they interpolated their fraudulent new matter into old manuscripts without taking care to erase or suppress the previous statements glaringly contradicted by the new interpolations LXII we have established the atmosphere of the foundation of Christianity, conspiracy, forgery and fraud, the result of which are its sacred texts, falsely alleged to be infallible accounts by eyewitnesses to the most extraordinary events in human history. Let us now examine the evidence left to us by these pious forgers. As to the historicity of the great Saviour and God-man Jesus Christ. 4. Biblical Sources The story of Jesus Christ can be found only in the forged books of the New Testament, an assortment of Gospels and Epistles that required many centuries and hands to create. As Dr. Lardner said, even so late as the middle of the 6th century, the canon of the New Testament had not been settled by any authority that was decisive and universally acknowledged. Elixiv Mead describes the confused compilation of the infallible Word of God. The New Testament is not a single book but a collection of groups of books and single volumes, which were at first and even long afterwards circulated separately. The Gospels are found in any and every order. Egyptian tradition places JN first among the Gospels. LXV. In fact, it took well over a thousand years to canonize the New Testament, and the Old Testament canon remains different to this day in the Catholic and Protestant versions. This canonization also required many councils to decide which books were to be considered inspired and which spurious. Contrary to the impression given, these councils were not peaceful gatherings of the Good Shepherds of Christ but raucous free-for-alls between bands of thugs and their arrogant and insane bishops. As Keeler says, the reader would a greatly did he suppose that in these assemblies one or two hundred gentlemen sat down to discuss quietly and dignifiedly the questions which had come before them for settlement. On the contrary, many of the bishops were ignorant ruffians, and were followed by crowds of vicious supporters who stood ready on the slightest excuse to maim and kill their opponents. LXVI. In fact, at the Council of Ephesus in 431 mobs consisting of the dregs of society and representing the warring factions of Anch and Alexandria broke out in riots and killed many of each other. This melee was merely one of many, and this shedding of blood by Christian followers was only the beginning of a hideous centuries-long legacy. Church historian Eusebius admits the chaotic atmosphere of the Christian foundation. But increasing freedom transformed our character to arrogance and sloth, we began envying and abusing each other, cutting our own throats, as occasion offered, with weapons of sharp-edged words, rulers hurled themselves at rulers and laymen waged party fights against laymen, and unspeakable hypocrisy and dissimulation were carried to the limit of wickedness. Those of us who were supposed to be pastors cast off the restraining influence of the fear of God and quarreled heatedly with each other, engaged solely in swelling the disputes, threats, envy, and mutual hostility and hate, frantically demanding the despotic power they coveted. LXVII. Such were the means by which the New Testament was finally canonized. Concerning the NT as it stands today, Wheeler says. The 27 New Testament booklets, attributed to eight individual apostolic writers, and culled from some 200 admitted forgeries called Gospels, Acts, and Epistles, constitute the present canonical or acceptedly inspired compendium of the primitive history of Christianity. LXVII. The various Gospels, of which only four are now accepted as canonical or genuine, are in actuality not the earliest Christian texts. The earliest canonical texts are demonstrably the epistles of Paul, so it is to them that we must first turn in our investigation. The Epistles the various Pauline epistles contained in the New Testament form an important part of Christianity, yet these earliest of Christian texts never discuss a historical background of Jesus, even though Paul purportedly lived during and after Jesus's advent and surely would have known about his master's miraculous life. Instead, these letters deal with a spiritual construct found in various religions, sects, cults and mystery schools for hundreds to thousands of years prior to the Christian era. As Dujardin points out, the Pauline literature does not refer to Pilate or the Romans, or Caiaphas, or the Sanhedrin, or Herod or Judas, or the holy women, or any person in the Gospel account of the Passion, and that it also never makes any allusion to them, lastly, that it mentions absolutely none of the events of the Passion, either directly or by way of allusion. 
Alexiak Mangasarian notes that Paul also never quotes from Jesus's purported sermons and speeches, parables and prayers, nor does he mention Jesus's supernatural birth or any of his alleged wonders and miracles, all of which would presumably be very important to Jesus's followers, had such exploits and sayings been known prior to Paul. Mangasarian then understandably asks, is it conceivable that a preacher of Jesus could go throughout the world to convert people to the teachings of Jesus, as Paul did, without ever quoting a single one of his sayings? Had Paul known that Jesus had preached a sermon, or formulated a prayer, or said many inspired things about the here and the hereafter, he could not have helped quoting, now and then, from the words of his master. If Christianity could have been established without a knowledge of the teachings of Jesus, why then, did Jesus come to teach? and why were his teachings preserved by divine inspiration? If Paul knew of a miracle-working Jesus, one who could feed the multitude with a few loaves and fishes, who could command the grave to open, who could cast out devils, and cleanse the land of the foulest disease of leprosy, who could, and did, perform many other wonderful works to convince the unbelieving generation of his divinity. Is it conceivable that either intentionally or inadvertently he would have never once referred to them in all his preaching. The position, then, that there is not a single saying of Jesus in the Gospels which is quoted by Paul in his many epistles is unassailable, and certainly fatal to the historicity of the Gospel Jesus. In fact, even though the Lord's Prayer is clearly spelled out in the Gospels as being given directly from Jesus's mouth, Paul expresses that he does not know how to pray. Paul's Jesus is also very different from that of the Gospels. As Wells says, These epistles are not merely astoundingly silent about the historical Jesus, but also that the Jesus of Paul's letters, the earliest of the NT epistles and hence the earliest extant Christian documents, is in some respects incompatible with the Jesus of the Gospels, that neither Paul, nor those of his Christian predecessors whose views he assimilates into his letters, nor the Christian teachers he attacks in them, are concerned with such a person. LXX. So it appears that Paul, even though he speaks of the Gospel, had never heard of the canonical Gospels or even an orally transmitted life of Christ. The few historical references to an actual life of Jesus cited in the epistles are demonstrably interpolations and forgeries, as are the epistles themselves, not having been written by the Pharisee Roman Paul at all, as related by Wheelis. The entire Pauline group is the same forged class, says E.B., Encyclopedia Biblica with respect to the canonical Pauline epistles. There are none of them by Paul, neither 14, nor 13, nor 9 or 8, nor yet even the for so long universally regarded as unassailable. They are all, without distinction, pseudographia, false writings, forgeries. They are thus all uninspired anonymous church forgeries for Christ's sweet sake, elekexi. In the myth of the historical Jesus, Hayim ben Yehoshua evinces that the orthodox dates of the Pauline epistles, c. 49-70, cannot be maintained, also introducing one of the most important individuals in the formation of Christianity, the Gnostic Christian heretic Mark Ion of Pontus, c. 100-160, a well-educated man of letters who entered the Brotherhood and basically took the reins of the fledgling Gnostic Christian movement. We now turn to the epistles supposedly written by Paul. The first epistle of Paul to Timothy warns against the Martianist work known as the Antithesis. Mark Ion was expelled from the Church of Rome in c. 144 CE and the first epistle of Paul to Timothy was written shortly afterwards. Thus we again have a clear case of pseudepigraphy. The second epistle of Paul to Timothy and the epistle of Paul to Titus were written by the same author and date to about the same period. These three epistles are known as the pastoral epistles. The ten remaining non-pastoral epistles written in the name of Paul, were known to Mark Ion by c. 140 CE. Some of them were not written in Paul's name alone but are in the form of letters written by Paul in collaboration with various friends such as Sosthenes, Timothy, and Silas. The non-canonical first epistle of Clement to the Corinthians, written c. 125 CE uses the first epistle of Paul to the Corinthians as a source and so we can narrow 
down the date for that epistle to see 100 to 125 CE. However, we are left with the conclusion that all the Pauline epistles are pseudepigraphic. The semimythical Paul was supposed to have died during the persecutions instigated by Nero in c. 64 CE. Some of the Pauline epistles appear to be have been altered and edited numerous times before reaching their modern forms. We may thus conclude that they provide no historical evidence of Jesus. It is clear that the epistles do not demonstrate a historical Jesus and are not as early as they are pretended to be, written or edited by a number of hands over several decades during the second century, such that the historical Jesus apparently was not even known at that late point. As is also evidenced, these texts were further mutilated over the centuries. The Gospels Although they are held up by true believers to be the inspired works of the Apostles, the canonical Gospels were forged at the end of the second century, all four of them probably between 170 to 180, a date that just happens to correspond with the establishment of the orthodoxy and supremacy of the Roman Church. Despite the claims of apostolic authorship, the Gospels were not mere translations of manuscripts written in Hebrew or Aramaic by Jewish Apostles, because they were originally written in Greek. As Waite relates, it is noticeable that in every place in the Gospels but one, and the total number is nearly a hundred, where Peter is mentioned, the Greek name Petros is given, which is supposed to be used by Jews as well as others. This would indicate that all the canonical Gospels, Matthew included, are original Greek productions. LXXI. Of these Greek texts and their pretended apostolic attribution, Wells states, a Galilean fisherman could not have written what Kimmel calls such cultivated Greek, with many rhetorical devices, and with all the Old Testament quotations and allusions deriving from the Greek version of these scriptures, not from the Hebrew original. LXXI. Furthermore, as stated and as is also admitted by the writer of Luke when he says that there were many versions of the narrative, there were numerous Gospels in circulation prior to the composition of his Gospel. In fact, of the dozens of Gospels that existed during the first centuries of the Christian era, several once considered canonical or genuine were later rejected as apocryphal or spurious, and vice versa. Out of these numerous Gospels the canonical Gospels were chosen by Church Father and Bishop of Lyons, Irenaeus, c. 120 c. 200, who claimed that the number four was based on the four corners of the world. In reality, this comment is Masonic, and these texts represent the four books of magic of the Egyptian ritual LX of facts that provide hints as to where our quest is heading. According to some early Christians, the Gospel of Matthew is the earliest, which is why it appears first in the canon. However, as noted, the Gospels have been arranged in virtually every order, and scholars of the past few centuries have considered Mark to be the earliest, used by the writers compilers of Matthew and Luke. Going against this trend, Wait evinced that Luke was first, followed by Mark, John and Matthew. In fact, these Gospels were written not from each other but from common source material, including the narrative, or diegesis, as it is in the original. Greek. The first Gospel of the narrative type, in actuality, appears to have been the Proto-Lucan text, the Gospel of the Lord, published in Rome by the Gnostic Christian Marcion, as part of his New Testament. As Waite relates, the first New Testament that ever appeared was compiled and published by Marcion. It was in the Greek language. It consisted of the Gospel and the Apostolican. No Acts, no Revelation, and but one Gospel. The Apostolican comprised ten of Paul's epistles, as follows Galatians, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Romans, except the 15th and 16th chapters. 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, Ephesians, Colossians, Philemon and Philippians, arranged in the order as here named. This canon of the New Testament was prepared and published shortly after his arrival in Rome, probably about 145 AD bearing Gould thinks he brought the Gospel from Sinope. Martians, Gospel resembles the Gospel of Luke, but is much shorter. LXXV. It is interesting to note that the two missing chapters of Romans are historicizing, whereas the rest of the epistle is not. Furthermore, the gospel referred to by Paul in this epistle and others has been termed the Gospel of Paul, 
presumed lost but in reality claimed by Mark Ion to be a book he found at Ansch, along with ten Pauline epistles, and then edited, bringing it around 139 to 142 to Rome, where he translated it into both Greek and Latin. The Gospel of the Lord Originally in the Syro-Chalde or Samaritan language, Martian's Gospel of the Lord, which predated the canonical Gospels by decades, represents the basic Gospel narrative, minus key elements that demonstrate the conspiracy. Although much the same as the later Gospel of Luke, Martian's Gospel was Gnostic, non-historical, and did not make Jesus a Jewish man, i.e., he was not born in Bethlehem and was not from Nazareth, which did not even exist at the time. In Martian's Gospel there is no childhood history, as Martian's Jesus was not born but came down at Capernaum, i.e., appeared, in the fifteenth year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, the very sentence used in Luke to prove Jesus's historicity. Martian's original, non-historicizing and non-Judaizing New Testament was a thorn in the side of the carnalizing conspirators, who were compelled to put a spin on the facts by claiming that the heretic had expurgated the Gospel of Luke, removing the genealogies and other historical and biographical details, for example. Thus, Mark Ion was accused of purging the letters of Paul and Luke of Jewish traits, an allegation that served as a subterfuge to hide the fact that Martian's Jesus was indeed not a Jewish man who had incarnated a century before. However, as demonstrated by Waite and others, Martian's Gospel was first, and Luke was created from it. Thus, it was not Mark Ion who had mutilated the texts but the historicizers who followed and added to his The Gospel of Luke 170 CE. The Gospel of Luke is acknowledged by early church fathers to be of a late date. As Waite states, Jerome admits that not only the Gospel of Basilides, composed about AD 125, and other Gospels, admitted to have been first published in the 2nd century, were written before that of Luke, but even the Gospel of Apelles also, which was written not earlier than AD 160.LXVI. Like the rest of the Gospels Luke fits into the timeframe of having been written between 170 to 180, as admitted by the Catholic Encyclopedia. According to the Catholic Encyclopedia the Book of Luke was not written till nearly 200 years after this event, of Jesus's departure. The proof offered is that the Theophilus to whom Luke addressed it was Bishop of Anch from 169 to 177 a.d.lxvii. The Gospel of Luke is a compilation of dozens of older manuscripts, 33 by one count, including the Gospel of the Lord. In using Martian's Gospel, the Lucan writers interpolated and removed textual matter in order both to historicize the story and to Judaize Martian's Jesus. In addition to lacking the childhood or genealogy found in the first two chapters of Luke, Mark Ion also was missing nearly all of the third chapter, save the bit about Capernaum all of which were interpolated into Luke to give Jesus a historical background and Jewish heritage. Also, where Martian's Gospel speaks of Jesus coming to Nazareth, Luke adds, where he had been brought up, a phrase missing from Mark Ion that is a further attempt on Luke's part to make Jesus Jewish. Another example of the historicizing and Judaizing interpolation of the compilers of Luke into Mark Ion can be found in the portrayal of Christ's Passion, which is represented in Mark Ion thus saying, the Son of Man must suffer many things, and be put to death, and after three days rise again. LXVIII. At Luke 9.22, the passage is rendered thus. Saying, the Son of Man must suffer many things, and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. The inclusion of elders and the chief priests and scribes represents an attempt to make the story seem as if it happened one time in history, as opposed to the recurring theme in a saviour god cult and mystery school indicated by Mark Ion. Of this Lucan creation, Massey says. It can be proved how passage after passage has been added to the earlier gospel, in the course of manufacturing the later history. For example, the morning over Jerusalem, Luke 13. 29-35, is taken verbatim from the second Esdras, I, 28-33, without acknowledgement, and the words previously uttered by the Almighty Lord are here assigned to Jesus as the original speaker. LXCX. The Gospel of Mark, 
175 CE. After the final destruction of Jerusalem and Judea by the Romans in 135, the Jerusalem church was taken over by non-Jews. Of this destruction and appropriation, Eusebius says. When in this way the city was closed to the Jewish race and suffered the total destruction of its former inhabitants, it was colonized by an alien race, and the Roman city which subsequently arose changed its name, so that now, in honor of the emperor then reigning, Elias Hadrianus, it is known as Elia. Furthermore, as the church in the city was now composed of Gentiles, the first after the bishops of the circumcision to be put in charge of the Christians there was Mark.LXXX. This devastation and changeover occurred in the 18th year of Hadrian's rule, i.e., 135 CE. Thus, we see that this Mark of whom Eusebius speaks could not have been the disciple Mark. The date is, however, perfect for the Gnostic Markion. Eusebius provides confirmation of this association of Mark with Markion when he immediately follows his comment about Mark with a discussion of leaders at that time of knowledge falsely so called, i.e., Gnostics and Gnosis. Indeed, legend held that Mark wrote his gospel in Rome and brought it to Alexandria, where he established churches, while Mark Ion purportedly published his gospel in Rome and no doubt went to Alexandria at some point. Like wait, Mede also does not put Mark first, it is very evident that Mount and LK do not use RMK, though they use most the material contained in RMK, LXXI in fact, all three manuscripts used Mark Ion as one of their sources. Like Mark Ion, Mark has no genealogy, unlike Mark Ion, he begins his story with. John the Baptist, the hero of the Nazarenes Mandeans, added to incorporate that faction. The Gospel of Mark was admittedly tampered with, as is noted in the New Testament, with several verses, 16.9-20, regarding the resurrected apparition and ascension added to the end. Here we have absolute proof of the Gospels being changed to fit the circumstances, rather than recording history. Mark also provides an example of how interpolation was used to set the story in a particular place. For instance, MK 116 reads, And passing along by the Sea of Galilee he saw Simon and Andrew. Almost all commentators agree that the words by the Sea of Galilee were added by Mark. They are placed quite ungrammatically in the Greek syntax. Mark, then, has interpolated a reference to place into a report which lacked it, LXXII. As to the authorship of Mark, Ben Yehoshua says, the style of language used in Mark shows that it was written, probably in Rome, by a Roman convert to Christianity whose first language was Latin and not Greek, Hebrew or Aramaic. It would seem, then, that the compiler of Mark used the Latin version of Martian's Gospel, while Luke and Matthew used the Greek version accounting for the variances between them. Indeed, the author of Mark was clearly not a Palestinian Jew, as Wells points out that Mark betrays in 731 an ignorance of Palestinian geography, LXXII. The Gospel of John, 178 CE. The Gospel of John is thought by most authorities to be the latest of the four, but Waite provides a compelling argument to place it third and reveals its purpose not only in refuting the Gnostics but also in establishing the primacy of the Roman Church. So strong is the evidence of a late date to this gospel, that its apostolic origin is being abandoned by the ableist evangelical writers. Both Irenaeus and Jerome assert that John wrote against Cerinthus. Cerinthus thus flourished about AD 145. T. Here is evidence that in the construction of this gospel, as in that of Matthew, the author had in view the building up of the Roman hierarchy, the foundations of which were then, about AD 177-89, being laid. There is a reason to believe that both, John and Matthew, were written in the interest of the supremacy of the Church of Rome. The tone of this gospel is anti-Jewish, revealing that it was written compiled by a non-Jew, possibly a Gentile or an exiled Israelite of a different tribe, such as a Samaritan, who not only spoke of the Jews as separate and apart from him but also was not familiar with the geography of Palestine. As Waite also says, There are also many errors in reference to the geography of the country. The author speaks of Enon, near to Salim, in Judea, also of Bethany, beyond Jordan, and of a city of Samaria, called Sichar. 
If there were any such places, they were strangely unknown to other writers. The learned Dr. Britt Schneider points out such mistakes and errors of geography, chronology, history and statistics of Judea, as no person who had ever resided in that country, or had been by birth a Jew, could possibly have committed .lxxxv. In addition, as Keeler states, the Gospel of John says that Bethsaida was in Galilee. There is no such town in that district, and there never was. Bethsaida was on the east side of the Sea of Tiberias, whereas Galilee was on the west side. St. John was born at Bethsaida, and the probability is that he would know the geographical location of his own birthplace. LXXVI. Furthermore, the writer of John relates several events at which the Apostle John was not depicted as having appeared and does not record others at which he is said to have been present. Moreover, John is the only gospel containing the story of the raising of Lazarus from the dead, which is an Egyptian myth. That the Gospel of John served as a refutation of the Gnostics, or an attempt to usurp their authority and to bring them into the fold, is obvious from its Gnostic style. In fact, it has been suggested that the author of John used Cerinthus's own gospel to refute the heretic. As Waite relates, The history as well as the writings of Cerinthus are strangely blended with those of John the Presbyter, and even with John the Apostle. A sect called the Elogy attributed to him, Cerinthus, so says Epiphanius, the Gospel, as well as the other writings of John. LXVII. The Gospel of Matthew, 180 CE. Although it was claimed by later Christian writers to be a translation of a manuscript written in Hebrew by the Apostle Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew did not exist prior to the end of the second century and was originally written in Greek. As Waite says, The Greek Gospel of Matthew was a subsequent production, and either originally appeared in the Greek language, or was a translation of the Gospel of the Hebrews, with extensive changes and additions. There is reason to believe it to have been an original compilation, based upon the oracles of Christ, but containing, in whole, or in part, a number of other manuscripts. LXVIII. The Gospel of Matthew is particularly noteworthy in that it contains the interpolation at 16:17-19 not found in either Mark or Luke that gives authority to the Roman Church, to wit, the statement by Jesus that Peter is the rock upon which the Church is to be built and the keeper of the keys to the Kingdom of Heaven. The appearance of this Gospel determining Roman dominance corresponds to the violent schism of 180-190 between the branches of the Church over the celebration of Easter. It is clear that the canonical Gospels are of a late date, forged long after the alleged time of their purported authors. Such they are, and, as Doan says, in these four spurious Gospels, we have the only history of Jesus of Nazareth, LXXX. The Narrative Even knowing this fact of falsity, some believers will claim the Gospels are nonetheless inspired by the omnipotent God and represent an infallible representation of the life of the Lord. Far from being infallible, these spurious Gospels contradict each other in numerous places. As noted by Otto Schmiedel, considered one of the greatest authorities on the life of Jesus, if John possesses the genuine tradition about the life of Jesus, that of the first three evangelists, the synoptists, is untenable. If the synoptists are right, the fourth Gospel must be rejected as a historical source, xc in fact, as Wheeler says. The so-called canonical books of the New Testament, as of the Old, are a mess of contradictions and confusions of text, to the present estimate of 150,000 and more variant readings, as is well known and admitted. Xi. In regard to these variant readings, Waite states. Of the 150,000 variant readings which Griesbach found in the manuscripts of the New Testament, probably 149,500 were editions and interpolations. XCRII. In this mess, the Gospels' pretended authors, the Apostles, give conflicting histories and genealogies. The birth date of Jesus is depicted as having occurred at different times, in Matthew about two years before and in Luke more than nine years after Herod's death. Jesus's birth and childhood are not mentioned in Mark, and although he is claimed in Matthew and Luke to have been born of a virgin, his lineage is also traced through Joseph to the house of David, so that he may fulfill prophecy. Furthermore, the genealogies presented in Luke and Matthew are irreconcilable. In fact, as Wheeler says, 
Both genealogies are false and forged lists of mostly fictitious names, xca number of the names, in reality, are not patriarchs but older gods. Regarding the contradictory chronology found in the NT, Ben Yehoshua states. The New Testament story confuses so many historical periods that there is no way of reconciling it with history. The traditional year of Jesus's birth is 1 CE Jesus was supposed to be not more than two years old when Herod ordered the slaughter of the innocents. However, Herod died before the 12th of April the 4th BCE. This has led some Christians to redate the birth of Jesus to 6-4 BCE. However, Jesus was also supposed to have been born during the census of Quirinius. This census took place after Archelaus was deposed in 6 CE, 10 years after Herod's death. Jesus was supposed to have been baptized by John soon after John had started baptizing and preaching in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberias, i.e., 28-29 CE when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, i.e., 26-36 CE. According to the New Testament, this also happened when Lysanias was tetrarch of Abilene and Annas and Caiaphas were high priests. But. Lysanias ruled Abilene from c. 40 BCE until he was executed in 36 BCE by Mark. Antony, about 60 years before the date for Tiberias and about 30 years before the supposed birth of Jesus, also, there were never two joint high priests, in particular, Annas was not a joint high priest with Caiaphas. Annas was removed from the office of high priest in 15 CE after holding office for some nine years. Caiaphas only became high priest in C. 18 CE, about three years after Annas. Many of these chronological absurdities seem to be based on misreadings and misunderstandings of Josephus's book Jewish Antiquities which was used as reference by the author of Luke and Acts. Thus, the few incidents useful for dating are found mainly in Luke and turn out to be false. Doan states. Luke 2. 1. Shows that the writer, whoever he may have been, lived long after the events related. His dates, about the 15th year of Tiberius, and the government of Cyrenius, the only indications of time in the New Testament, are manifestly false. The general ignorance of the four evangelists, not merely of the geography and statistics of Judea, but even of its language, their egregious blunders, which no writers who had lived in that age could be conceived of as making, prove that they were not only no such persons as those who have been willing to be deceived have taken them to be, but that they were not Jews, had never been in Palestine, and neither lived at or at anywhere near the times to which their narratives seem to refer. XCIV. As concerns Jesus's birthplace, while the synoptics place it in Bethlehem, such that he is from David's village, John says he is from Galilee and that the Jews rejected him because was not from Bethlehem, whence the Messiah must come to fulfill scripture, JN 7 colon 41-42. Also, in the conflicting and illogical gospel account, Jesus's birth is heralded by a star, angels, and three magi or wise men traveling from afar, and represents such a danger to Herod that he takes the heinous and desperate act of slaughtering the male infants in Bethlehem. Yet, when Jesus finally appears in his hometown, he is barely acknowledged, as if the inhabitants had never heard of his miraculous birth with all the fanfare, or of Herod's dreadful deed, or of any of Jesus's wisdom and mighty works, not even the purportedly astounding temple teaching at age 12. Even his own family, who obviously knew of his miraculous birth and exploits, rejects him. In addition, in the Christian tale, the three wise men are represented as following the star until they arrive near Herod's house, whereupon he tells them to continue following the star until they reach the place where the baby Jesus lies. The wise men then go off and find the baby, but Herod cannot, so he must put to death the firstborn male of every family. One must ask, how is it that the wise men needed Herod's help to know that the star would lead them to the babe, when they were already following it in the first place? And why wouldn't Herod simply have followed the star himself and killed only Jesus, rather than all the boys? In reality, the terrible story of Herod killing the infants as portrayed only in Matthew is based on ancient mythology, not found in any histories of the day, including Josephus, who does otherwise chronicle Herod's real abuses. In the Gospel story, practically nothing is revealed of Jesus's childhood, 
and he disappears completely from the age of 12 to about 30, when he suddenly reappears to begin his ministry. After this dramatic and unhistorical appearance out of nowhere, Jesus is said in the synoptics to have taught for one year before he died, while in John the number is around three years. Furthermore, in Matthew, Mark and Luke, Jesus's advent takes place in Galilee, except for the end in Jerusalem, while John places the story for the most part in Jerusalem and other sites in Judea, discrepancies that reveal two important forces at work in the Gospels, i.e., the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern of Judah. Ben Yehoshua continues the critique as to the purported history of the New Testament. The story of Jesus's trial is also highly suspicious. It clearly tries to placate the Romans while defaming the Jews. The historical Pontius Pilate was arrogant and despotic. He hated the Jews and never delegated any authority to them. However, in Christian mythology, he is portrayed as a concerned ruler who distanced himself from the accusations against Jesus and who was coerced into obeying the demands of the Jews. According to Christian mythology, every Passover, the Jews would ask Pilate to free any one criminal they chose. This is, of course, a blatant lie. Jews never had a custom of freeing guilty criminals at Passover or any other time of the year. According to the myth, Pilate gave the Jews the choice of freeing Jesus the Christ or a murderer named Jesus Barabbas. The Jews are alleged to have enthusiastically chosen Jesus Barabbas. This story is a vicious anti-Semitic lie, one of many such lies found in the New Testament, largely written by anti-Semites. Walker points out other errors of fact and perception about the part of the world in question during the era of Jesus's alleged advent. The most historical figure in the Gospels was Pontius Pilate, to whom Jesus was presented as King of the Jews and simultaneously as a criminal deserving the death penalty for blasphemy because he called himself Christ, Son of the Blessed. This alleged crime was no real crime. Eastern provinces swarmed with self-styled Christs and messiahs, calling themselves sons of God and announcing the end of the world. None of them was executed for blasphemy. XCV Mangasarian concurs that the story is implausible. A Roman judge, while admitting that he finds no guilt in Jesus deserving of death, is nevertheless represented as handing him over to the mob to be killed, after he has himself scourged him. No Roman judge could have behaved as this pilot is reported to have behaved toward an accused person on trial for his life. And Massey states. The account of Pilate's shedding the blood the Galileans and mingling it with their sacrifices, Luke 13. 1, has been added by someone so ignorant of the Hebrew history, that he has ascribed to Pilate an act which was committed when Quirinius was governor, 24 years earlier than the alleged appearance of Jesus. Jesus.xcvi. In order to shore up their fallacious claims of Christ being crucified under Pilate, Christian forgers even went so far as to produce the Acts of Pilate, which at one point was considered canonical. After the canon was formalized, the book was deemed spurious, thus demonstrating that it was merely an opinion as to what was inspired and what was forged. The Acts of Pilate purports to relate the trial of Jesus before Pilate, in accordance with the canonical gospel accounts but in greater detail. Some of the scenes of this book were lifted from the Iliad. Pilate has been turned into Achilles. Joseph is the good old Priam, begging the body of Hector, and the whole story is based upon the dramatic passages of the 24th book of the Iliad. XCVII. The Acts of Pilate, also called the Gospel of Nicodemus, even goes so far as to purport to be a record of the actual conversations of the astonished faithful and prophets of old, such as David and Enoch who have been resurrected from the dead after Jesus' own resurrection and ascension. This true gospel also contains a ludicrous conversation between Satan and his prince in hell. The fictitious nature of such writings is obvious, as is, ultimately, that of the gospels. Furthermore, the gospel accounts of Jesus' passion and resurrection differ utterly from each other, and none states how old he was when he died. In fact, the early church fathers were constantly bickering over how old the Lord was when he died, with Irenaeus, who was widely respected by his peers as a highly educated establisher of doctrine, fervently insisting that Jesus was at least 50 years old, rather than the 30 or 33 held by other traditions, including the four gospels he helped. Canonize. 
Indeed, Irenaeus flatly den, eyed, as heresy the gospel stories as to his. Crucifixion at about thirty years of age, XCVII if the gospel narrative as found in the canon had existed earlier than 170 to 80, and if it constituted a true story, there would be no accounting for the widely differing traditions of the Saviour's death, to wit, by the third century AD, there were no fewer than twenty-five versions of Jesus' death and resurrection. Some have him not being put to death at all, some have him revived back to life and some of Jesus living on to an old age and dying in Egypt, xciac these various details of the lives of Christ and his apostles should have been set in stone, had the story been true and these books been written by the apostles, or even had an orally transmitted life of Christ been widespread during the decades that followed. Various other aspects of the gospel accounts reveal their non-historical nature, including faulty geography, as mentioned, and incidents such as Jesus's preaching in Galilee, which allegedly occurred precisely during the time Herod was building the city of Tiberias. Of this incident, Jujardin says, we should here note the total lack of historic verity as to facts and places in the Gospels. With the methods then available a town was not built rapidly, and the work would not have been completed in AD 27 or even 30. The Gospel writers were therefore unaware that they were placing in a countryside overturned by demolition and rebuilding the larger part of the teaching of Jesus. If the stories are historical, it is in the middle of timber yards that one must picture the divine precepts delivered, with the accompaniment of the noise of pikes and mattocks, the grinding of saws, and the cries of the workers. C. Furthermore, in the Gospels Jesus himself makes many illogical contradictions concerning some of his most important teachings. First he states that he is sent only to the lost sheep of Israel and forbids his disciples to preach to the Gentiles. Then he is made to say, Go ye therefore, and teach all nations. Next, Jesus claims that the end of the world is imminent and warns his disciples to be prepared at a moment's notice. He also tells them to build a church from which to preach his message, an act that would not be necessary if the end was near. This doomsday prophecy in fact did not happen, nor has Jesus returned soon, as was his promise. Even if he had been real, his value as a prophet would have been very little as his most important prophecies have not occurred, thus proving that he was no more prophetic or divine than the average newspaper astrologer or palm reader. In reality, the contradictions in the Gospels are overwhelming and irreconcilable. By the rational mind. In fact, the Gospel was not designed to be rational, as the true meaning of the word Gospel is God's spell, as in magic, hypnosis and delusion. As Mac says. The narrative gospels can no longer be viewed as the trustworthy accounts of unique and stupendous historical events at the foundation of the Christian faith. The gospels must now be seen as the result of early Christian mythmaking. CI. The Acts of the Apostles, 177 CE. In addition to the hundreds of epistles and gospels written during the first centuries were many acts of this apostle or that. The canonical Acts of the Apostles cannot be dated earlier than the end of the second century, long after the purported events. Acts purports to relate the early years of the Christian Church, yet in it we find a well-established community that could not have existed at the time this book was alleged to have been written, i.e., not long after the death of Christ. In Acts we read that the first Christians are found at Ansh, even though there was no canonical gospel there until after 200 CE. Taylor calls Acts a broken narrative, and Higgins states that it was fabricated by monks, devil drivers and popes, who wished to form an alliance by writing the book, the Latin character of which is visible in every page, CII according to Wheelis, even the Protestant Encyclopedia Biblica admits Acts to be untrustworthy. The purpose of Acts was not, in fact, to record the history of the early church but to bridge the considerable gap between the Gospels and the Epistles. Like Matthew and John, it was also designed to empower the Roman hierarchy. As Waite says, It is plain that the Acts of the Apostles was written in the interest of the Roman Catholic Church, and in support of the tradition that the Church of Rome was founded by the joint labours of Peter and Paul. Ge. The authors of Acts used text from Josephus and, evidently, from the writings of Aristides, a sophist of the latter part of the 2nd century 
to name a couple of its sources, which also purportedly included the life of Apollonius of Tyana, the quasi-mythical Cappadocian Samaritan Greek miracle worker of the 1st century CE. Bible Prophecy Many people believe that the biblical tale of Jesus must be true because the Bible itself predicted his advent and because so many other Old Testament prophecies had come true, demonstrating that the book was indeed God's word. First of all, much of the biblical prophecy was written after the fact, with merely an appearance of prophecy. Secondly, the book has served as a blueprint, such that rulers have deliberately followed to some degree its so-called prophecies, thus appearing to bring them to fulfillment. Thirdly, very few if any prophesies, particularly of the supernatural kind, have indeed come true. Fourthly, biblical interpreters claim that records of events centuries in the past somehow refer to the future. As concerns purported prophetic references to Jesus in the OT, Wells says. Nearly all New Testament authors twist and torture the most unhelpful Old Testament passages into prophesies concerning Christianity. Who, ignorant of Mount. 2 colon 16-9, could suppose that Jeremiah 31 15, Rachel weeping for her children, referred to Herod's slaughter of the innocents, civilian. To demonstrate that their Messiah was predicted, Christians have also grabbed onto the brief reference made at Psalms 2 to the Lord and his anointed, a word that in the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, the Septuagint, is Christus. In fact, the Septuagint, allegedly translated and redacted during the 2nd and 3rd centuries BCE at Alexandria, Egypt, contains the word Christus at least 40 times. CV this title Christus or anointed, however, referred only to an Israelite king or priest, not a superhuman savior. This Christian defense, in fact, proves that there were other Christs long before Jesus, including David, Zadok and Cyrus. The title Christ or anointed, Messiah, was in reality held by all kings of Israel, as well as being so commonly assumed by all sorts of impostors, conjurers, and pretenders to supernatural communications, that the very claim to it is in the gospel itself considered as an indication of imposture v. As to the reliability of both Old and New Testaments, Hilton Hotima declared. Not one line of the Bible has a known author, and but few incidents of it are corroborated by other testimony, CVI thus, Christianity is based upon a false proposition, and, without the inspired authorship of apostles under an infallible God, the church is left with little upon which to base its claims. Regarding this state of affairs, Wheelis declared. The Gentile Church of Christ has therefore no divine sanction, was never contemplated nor created by Jesus Christ. The Christian Church is thus founded on a forgery of pretended words of the pretended Christ. Qve. 5. Non-Biblical Sources We have seen that the Gospel accounts are utterly unreliable as history and cannot serve as evidence that Jesus Christ ever existed. Now we shall examine if there are any non-Biblical, non-partisan records by historians during the alleged time of the astonishing events, to wit, a virgin-born son of God who was famed widely as a great teacher and wonderworker, miraculously healing and feeding multitudes, walking on water and raising the dead who was transfigured on a mountain to a shining sun, whose crucifixion was accompanied by great earthquakes, the darkening of the sun and the raising from their graves of numerous saints, and who himself was resurrected from the dead. Of these alleged events, Eusebius asserts, because of his power to work miracles the divinity of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ became in every land the subject of excited talk and attracted a vast number of people in foreign lands very remote from Judea. CIX. Surely these extraordinary events known far and wide were recorded by one or more competent historians of the time. As noted, the centuries surrounding the beginning of the Christian era, the periods of Tiberius and Augustus, were, in fact, some of the best documented in history, as admitted even by Christian apologists. CX, for example, the Roman historian under Augustus, Livy, 59 BCE 17 CE alone composed 142 volumes, over a hundred of which were subsequently destroyed by the conspirators trying to cover their tracks. Despite this fact, however, there are basically no non-biblical references to a historical Jesus by any known historian of the time during and after Jesus's purported advent. As Walker says, no literate person of his own time mentioned him in any known writing. 
eminent Hellenistic Jewish historian and philosopher Philo, 20 BCE 50 CE, alive at the purported time of Jesus, was silent on the subject of the great Jewish miracle maker and rabble rouser who brought down the wrath of Rome and Judea. Nor are Jesus and his followers mentioned by any of the some 40 other historians who wrote during the 1st and 2nd centuries of the Common Era, including Plutarch, the Roman biographer, who lived at the same time, 46 to 120 CE, and in the same place where the Christians were purportedly swarming yet made no mention of them, their founder or their religion. As is related in McClintock and Strong's Cyclopedia of Theological Literature, enough of the writings of, these, authors, remain to form a library. Yet in this mass of Jewish and pagan literature, aside from two forged passages in the works of a Jewish author, and two disputed passages in the works of Roman writers, there is to be found no mention of Jesus Christ. Xi. Flavius Josephus, Jewish historian, 37 at 95 CE. Flavius Josephus is the most famous Jewish historian, especially because he wrote during the first century. His father, Matthias, was a reputable and learned member of a priestly family, and lived in Jerusalem contemporaneously with Pilate. Certainly he would have told his historian son about the bizarre and glorious events depicted in the Gospels, had they occurred just years earlier. Josephus himself was appointed to Galilee during the Jewish wars and was in Rome at the same time Paul was supposed to have been there incurring the wrath of the authorities upon him and his community of Christians. Yet, in the entire works of the Josephus, which constitute many volumes of great detail encompassing centuries of history, there is no mention of Paul or the Christians, and there are only two brief paragraphs that purport to refer to Jesus. Although much has been made of these references, they have been dismissed by scholars and Christian apologists alike as forgeries, as have been those referring to John the Baptist and James, brother of Jesus. No less an authority than Bishop Warburton of Gloucester, 1698-1779, labelled the Josephus interpolation regarding Jesus a rank forgery, and a very stupid one, too, CXII of Josephus and this stupid forgery, Wheeler says. The fact is, that with the exception of this one incongruous forged passage, section 3, the wondermongering Josephus makes not the slightest mention of his wonderworking fellow countrymen, Jesus the Christ, though some score of other Joshua's, or Jesus's, are recorded by him, nor does he mention any of his transcendent wonders. The first mention ever made of this passage, and its text, are in the church history of that very dishonest writer, Bishop Eusebius, in the 4th century. CE, Catholic Encyclopedia, admits, the above-cited passage was not known to Origen and the earlier patristic writers. CXE. Wheelis, a lawyer, and Taylor, a minister, agree with many others, including Christian apologists such as Dr. Lardner, that it was Eusebius himself who forged the passage in Josephus. In any case, the Josephus passages are fraudulent, leaving his sizable works devoid of the story of Jesus Christ. Of this absence, Waite asks. Why has Josephus made no mention of Jesus, called Christ? It is true that Josephus was not contemporary with Jesus if the latter was crucified at the time commonly supposed. But during the administration of Josephus in Galilee, the country must have been full of traditions of the crucified Galilean. But a single generation had passed, and the fame of Jesus being now spread abroad in other lands, could it have been any less in Galilee? Paul was contemporary with Josephus, and in his travels, if the accounts in the Acts of the Apostles can be at all relied upon, he must, more than once, have crossed the track of the Jewish priest and magistrate. CXEV. Thus, Josephus is silent on the subject of Christ and Christianity. Pliny the Younger, at 62 to 113 CE. One of the pitifully few references held up by Christians as evidence of Jesus's existence is the letter to Trajan supposedly written by the Roman historian Pliny the Younger. However, in this letter there is but one word that is applicable, Christians, and that has been demonstrated to be spurious, as is also suspected of the entire document. It has been suggested on the basis of Pliny's reportage of the Essenes that, if the letter is genuine, the original word was Essenes, which was later changed to Christians in one of the many revisions of the works of ancient authorities by Christian forgers. 
Tacitus, at 55 to 120 CE. Like Pliny, the historian Tacitus did not live during the purported time of Jesus but was born two decades after the Saviour's alleged death. Thus, if there were any passages in his work referring to Christ or his immediate followers, they would be secondhand and long after the alleged events. This fact matters not, however, because the purported passage in Tacitus regarding Christians being persecuted under Nero is also an interpolation and forgery, as noted. Zealous defender of the faith Eusebius never mentions the Tacitus passage, nor does anyone else prior to the 15th century CE. As Taylor says, This passage, which would have served the purposes of Christian quotation better than any other in all the writings of Tacitus, or of any pagan writer whatever, is not quoted by any of the Christian fathers. It is not quoted by Tertullian, though he had read and largely quotes the works of Tacitus. There is no vestige or trace of its existence anywhere in the world before the 15th century. CXV. Suetonius, at 69 to 140 CE. Christian defenders also like to hold up as evidence of their godman the minuscule and possibly interpolated passage from the Roman historian Suetonius referring to someone named Crestus or Crestos at Rome. Obviously, Christ was not alleged to have been at Rome, so this passage is not applicable to him. Furthermore, while some have speculated that there was a Roman man of that name at that time, the title Crestus or Crestos, meaning good and useful, was frequently held by freed slaves, among others, including various gods. Regarding these historical references, Taylor says, but even if they are authentic, and were derived from earlier sources, they would not carry us back earlier than the period in which the gospel legend took form, and so could attest only the legend of Jesus, and not his historicity. In any case, these scarce and brief references to a man who supposedly shook up the world, can hardly serve as proof of his existence, and it is absurd that the purported historicity of the Christian religion is founded upon them. There were indeed at the time of Christ's alleged advent dozens of relatively reliable historians who generally did not colour their perspectives with a great deal of mythology, cultural bias and religious bigotry where are their testimonies to such amazing events recorded in the Gospels. As Mead relates, it has always been unfailing source of astonishment to the historical investigator of Christian beginnings, that there is not a single word from the pen of any pagan writer of the first century of our era, which can in any fashion be referred to the marvellous story recounted by the Gospel writer. The very existence of Jesus seems unknown, CXVO the silence of these historians is, in fact, deafening testimony against the historicizers. Talmudic or Jewish References one might think that there would at least be reference to the historical Jesus in the texts of the Jews, who were known for record-keeping. Yet, such is not the case, despite all the frantic pointing to the references to Jesus ben Pandira, who purportedly lived during the 1st century BCE, or other Jesuses mentioned in Jewish literature. Unfortunately, these characters do not fit either the story or the purported timeline of the Gospel Jesus, no matter how the facts and numbers are fudged. The story of Jesus ben Pandira, for example, related that, a century before the Christian era, a magician named Jesus came out of Egypt and was put to death by stoning or hanging. However, ritualistic or judicial executions of this manner were common, as were the name Jesus and the magicians flooding out of Egypt. In addition, there is in this story no mention of Romans, among other oversights. Even if ben Pandira were real, it is definitely not his story being told in the New Testament. Massey explains the difficulty with the Ben Pandira theory. It has generally been allowed that the existence of a Jehoshua, the son of Pandira, acknowledged by the Talmud, proves the personal existence of Jesus the Christ as an historical character in the Gospels. But a closer examination of the data shows the theory to be totally untenable. Jehoshua ben Pandira must have been born considerably earlier than the year 102 BC. The Jewish writers altogether deny the identity of the Talmudic Jehoshua and the Jesus of the Gospels. The Jews know nothing of Jesus as the Christ of the Gospels, CXVI. Of the Pandira Padera story, Larson states, throughout the Middle Ages, the legend of Padera and Yeshu, 
considered by most scholars a Jewish invention, continued to persist, CXVII this Jewish invention may have been created in order to capitulate to the Christian authorities, who were persecuting unbelievers. Thus we find the tale in the Talmud, written after the Christ myth already existed. To quote Wells. Klausner's very full survey of the relevant material in, the Talmud, led him to the conclusion that the earliest references to Jesus in rabbinical literature occur not earlier than about the beginning of the second century. If there had been a historical Jesus who had anything like the career ascribed to him in the Gospels, the absence of earlier references becomes very hard to explain. When rabbis do begin to mention him, they are so vague in their chronology that they differ by as much as 200 years in the dates they assign to him. It is clear from this that they never thought of testing whether he had existed, but took for granted that this name stood for a real person. But let us see what modern Jewish scholarship, as represented by Sandmel and Goldstein, has to say about Jesus' historicity. Sandmel concedes that what knowledge we have of him comes only from the NT, since he went unknown. In the surviving Jewish and pagan literature of his time, and that passages about him in the ancient rabbinical literature of reflect NT material and give no information that is independent of Christian tradition. That the Talmud is useless as a source of reliable information about Jesus is conceded by most Christian scholars. CXIAC. Other Talmudic references to Jesus, cloaked by the name Balaam, are derogatory condemnations written centuries after the purported advent, thus serving as commentary on the tradition, not testimony to any history. Wells further states. Now that so much in the NT has fallen under suspicion, there is a natural tendency to exaggerate the importance of non-Christian material that seems to corroborate it even though Christian scholars past and present have admitted that, on the matter of Jesus' historicity, there is no pagan or Jewish evidence worth having. CXX to reiterate, the forged New Testament booklets and the foolish writings of the fathers, are the sole evidence we have for the alleged facts and doctrines of our most holy faith, as, adds Wheelis, is admitted by the Catholic Encyclopedia itself. CXXI as it is said, extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof, yet, no proof of any kind for the historicity of Jesus has ever existed or is forthcoming. 6. Further evidence of a fraud. There is basically no textual evidence of the existence of Jesus Christ, other than forged biblical books and epistles. In our quest we will now examine what proponents and opponents of the Christian religion were claiming beginning in the second century, during which the new faith actually arose. Little of the actual works of most opponents survives, unfortunately, because the Christian conspirators went on a censorship rampage for centuries. However, in their refutations the Christians themselves preserved their opponents' main points of contention, the most important of which was that the whole story was fabricated. In fact, from their own admissions the early Christians were incessantly under criticism by scholars of great repute whom the Christians at first viciously impugned and later murdered by the thousands. Yet, it was not only the dissenters and pagans who apprehended the truth, as the Christians themselves continuously disclosed that they knew the story. And religion of Jesus Christ were not original but were founded upon more ancient myths and ideologies throughout the known world. For example, the eminent church Dr. Augustine readily confessed that Christianity was a rehash of what already existed long prior to the Christian era. That which is known as the Christian religion existed among the ancients, and never did not exist, from the beginning of the human race until the time when Christ came in the flesh, at which time the true religion, which already existed, began to be called Christianity. CXXI. In addition, in the face of criticism that Christianity was fabricated, Eusebius sought to demonstrate it was not novel or strange by claiming it was based on older ideas. Says he. Although we certainly are a youthful people and this undeniably new name of Christians has only lately become known among all nations, nevertheless our life and mode of conduct together with our religious principles, have not been recently invented by us but from almost the beginnings of man were built on the natural concepts of those whom God loved in the distant past. Eusebius thus admitted not only that Christianity was built upon earlier ideologies but also that the name Christian was still undeniably new by his time, 300 years after the purported beginning of the Christian era, 
in spite of the New Testament tales that the gospel had been preached to all the nations and that a vast church network had sprung up during the first century. Regarding these Christian admissions, Doan states. Melito, a Christian bishop of Sardis, in an apology delivered to the Emperor Marcus Ataninus, in the year 170, claims the patronage of the emperor, for the now called Christian religion, which he calls our philosophy, on account of its high antiquity, as having been imported from countries lying beyond the limits of the Roman Empire, in the region of his ancestor Augustus, who found its importation ominous of good fortune to his government. This is an absolute demonstration that Christianity did not originate in Judea, which was a Roman province, but really was an exotic oriental fable, imported from India, CXXE. As this exotic oriental fable settled in, it was placed in Judea and based on Old Testament tales as well, as is affirmed by Tertullian in his Against Praxias, in which he gives the following ludicrous argument, when confronted with the similarities between Christ and a number of OT characters, such as Joshua, or Jesus, as his name is in Greek. Early manifestations of the Son of God, as recorded in the Old Testament. Rehearsals of his subsequent incarnation. Thus was he ever learning even as God to converse with men upon earth, being no other than the word which was to be made flesh. But he was thus learning, or rehearsing, in order to level for us the way of faith, that we might the more readily believe that the Son of God had come down into the world, if we knew that in times past also something similar had been done. It is more than a little odd that the omniscient God would need to learn how to be a human, especially when humans themselves do not receive such an opportunity to rehearse. In reality, Tertullian's pitiful excuse sounds more as if God is acting in a play, and as if Tertullian has a screw loose. In his first apology, Christian father Justin Martyr, c. 100-165, acknowledged the similarities between the older pagan gods and religions and those of Christianity, when he attempted to demonstrate, in the face of ridicule, that Christianity was no more ridiculous than the earlier myths. Analogies to the History of Christ and when we say also that the Word, who is the first birth of God, was produced without sexual union, and that He, Jesus Christ, our Teacher, was crucified and died, and rose again, and ascended into heaven, we propound nothing different from what you believe regarding those whom you esteem sons of Jupiter. For you know how many sons your esteemed writers ascribe to Jupiter, Mercury, the interpreting Word and Teacher of all, Aesculapius, who, though he was a great physician, was struck by a thunderbolt, and so ascended to heaven, and Bacchus too, after he had been torn limb from limb, and Hercules, when he had committed himself to the flames to escape his toils, and the sons of Leda, and Dioscuri, and Perseus, son of Danae, and Bellerophon, who, though sprung from mortals, rose to heaven on the horse Pegasus. For what shall I say of Ariadne, and those who, like her, have been declared to be set among the stars. And what of the emperors who die among yourselves, whom you deem worthy of deification, and in whose behalf you produce someone who swears he has seen the burning Caesar rise to heaven from the funeral pyre? In his endless apologizing, Justin reiterates the similarities between his godman and the gods of other cultures. As to the objection of our Jesus's being crucified, I say, that suffering was common to all the aforementioned sons of Jove, Jupiter. As to his being born of a virgin, you have your Perseus to balance that. As to his curing the lame, and the paralytic, and such as were cripples from birth, this is little more than what you say of your Aesculapius.cxiv. In making these comparisons between Christianity and its predecessor paganism, however, Marta sinisterly spluttered. It having reached the devil's ears that the prophets had foretold the coming of Christ, the Son of God, he set the heathen poets to bring forward a great many who should be called the sons of Jove. The devil laying his scheme in this, to get men to imagine that the true history of Christ was of the same characters the prodigious fables related of the sons of Jove. CXXV in his dialogue with Trypho the Jew, Marta again admits the pre-existence of the Christian tale and then uses his standard, irrational and self-serving apology, i.e., the devil got there first. Be well assured, then, Trypho, that I am established in the knowledge of and faith in the scriptures by those counterfeits which he who is called the devil is said to have performed among the Greeks, just as some were wrought by the Magi in Egypt, 
and others by the false prophets in Elijah's days. For when they tell that Bacchus, son of Jupiter, was begotten by, Jupiter's, intercourse with Samil, and that he was the discoverer of the vine, and when they relate, that being torn in pieces, and having died, he rose again, and ascended to heaven, and when they introduce wine into his mysteries, do I not perceive that, the devil, has imitated the prophecy announced by the patriarch Jacob, and recorded by Moses. And when they tell that Hercules was strong, and travelled over all the world, and was begotten by Jove of Alcmean, and ascended to heaven when he died, do I not perceive that the scripture which speaks of Christ, strong as a giant to run his race, has been in like manner imitated? And when he, the devil, brings forward Aesculapius as the raiser of the dead and healer of all diseases, may I not say that in this matter likewise he has imitated the prophesies about Christ? And when I hear, Trypho, that Perseus was begotten of a virgin, I understand that the deceiving serpent counterfeited also this. This devil did it response became de Rigeur in the face of persistent and rational criticism. As Dane relates. Tertullian and Saint Justin explain all the conformity which exists between Christianity and paganism, by asserting that a long time before there were Christians in existence, the devil had taken pleasure to have their future mysteries and ceremonies copied by his worshippers, CXVI. Christian author Lactantius, 240-330 in his attempts to confirm the Emperor Constantine in his new faith and to convert the pagan elite, also widely appealed to the pagan stories as proof that Christianity was not absurd but equally viable as they were, even though naturally he dismissed these earlier versions as works of the devil. As Wheeler says, in a word, Christianity is founded on and proved by pagan myths, CXVI other Christians were more blunt in their confessions as to the nature and purpose of the Christian tale making no pretense to being believers in higher realms of spirituality, but demonstrating more practical reasons for fanatically adhering to their incredible doctrines. For example, Pope Leo X, privy to the truth because of his high rank, made this curious declaration, what profit has not that fable of Christ brought us? As Wheelis also says, the proofs of my indictment are marvelously easy. The Gnostics Although the Christian conspirators were quite thorough in their criminal destruction of the evidence, especially of ancient texts, such that much irreplaceable knowledge was lost, from what remains we can see that the scholars of other schools and sects never gave up their arguments against the historicizing of a very ancient mythological creature. This group of critics included many Gnostics, who strenuously objected to the carnalization and Judaization of their allegorical texts and characters by the Christians. The impression has been cast that the philosophy or religion of Gnosticism began only during the Christian era and that the former was a corruption of the latter. However, Gnosticism is far older than Christianity, extending back thousands of years. The term Gnosticism, in fact, comes from the Greek word gnosis, which means knowledge, and Gnostic simply means one who knows, rather than designating a follower of a particular doctrine. From time immemorial, those who understood the mysteries were considered keepers of the Gnosis. The Greek philosophers Pythagoras and Plato were Gnostics, as was the historian Philo, whose works influenced the writer of the Gospel of John. Nevertheless, during the early centuries of the Christian era, Gnosticism became more of a monolithic movement, as certain groups and individuals began to amalgamate the many religions, sects, cults, mystery schools and ideologies that permeated the Roman Empire and beyond, from England to Egypt to India and China. This latest infusion of Gnosticism traced its roots to Syria, oddly enough the same nation in which Christians were first so-called, Atanch. Of this development, Massey says, We are told in the Book of Acts that the name of the Christiani was first given at Atanch, but so late as the year 200 AD no canonical New Testament was known at Ansh, the alleged birthplace of the Christian name. There was no special reason why the disciples should have been named as Christians at Ansh, except that this was a great center of the Gnostic Christians, who were previously identified with the teachings and works of the mage Simon of Samaria. Cxbiii. These Antiochian Gnostic Christians were followers of Simon the Magus, who was impugned as the heresiarch or originator of all Christian heresies. Yet, this Simon Magus appears to have been a mythical character derived from two mystical entities, 
Saman and Mega, esteemed by the Syrians prior to the Christian era. This religion could be called Syro-Samaritan Gnostic Christianity. Syro-Judeo-Gnosticism, on the other hand, was originally a Jewish heresy, starting with Mandeanism, a highly astrological ideology dating to the 4th century BCE that tried to bridge between Judaism and Zoroastrianism and that was very influential on Christianity. The Gnostic tree of thought thus had many branches, such that it was not uniform and was colored by the variety of cultures and places in which it appeared, a development that created competition. Pagel says, these so-called Gnostics, then, did not share a single ideology or belong to a specific group, not all, in fact, were Christians, CXXI indeed, the various Gnostic Christian texts from Chenoboskian were found in non-Christian, pagan tombs. CXXX thus, we find in the ancient world Syrian or Samaritan Gnosticism, Jewish Gnosticism, Christian Gnosticism and pagan Gnosticism. Yet, as stated, Gnosticism was eclectic, gathering together virtually all religious and cultic ideologies of the time, and constituting a combination of the philosophies of Plato and Philo, the Avesta and the Kabbalah, the mysteries of Samothrace, Eleusis and Avorphism, CXXI Buddhism and Osirianism were major influences as well. The Gnostic texts were multinational, using terms from the Hebrew, Persian, Greek, Syriac Aramaic, Sanskrit and Egyptian languages. Although there now seems to be a clear-cut distinction between Gnostics and Christians, there was not one at the beginning, and the fact is that Gnosticism was proto-Christianity. The distinction was not even very great as late as the 3rd century, when Neoplatonic philosopher and fierce Christian critic Porphyry attacked Gnostics, whom he considered to be Christians, as did Plotinus, 205. 270, both of whom indicted the Christians Gnostics for making up their texts. Pagels describes the murky division between the Gnostics and the Christians. One revered father of the church, Clement of Alexandria, writing in Egypt c. 180, identifies himself as orthodox, although he knows members of Gnostic groups and their writings well, some even suggest that he was himself a Gnostic initiate. CXXII. In fact, Bishop Irenaeus was a Gnostic and had a zodiac on the floor of his church at Lyons.CXXII. Furthermore, the great Christian Saint Augustine was originally a Mandean, i.e., a Gnostic, until after the Council of Nicaea, when he was converted, i.e., promised a prominent place in the newly formed Catholic Church, such that he then excoriated his former sect. Concerning this confusion between the Christians and Gnostics, Waite relates, most of the Christian writers of the 2nd century who immediately succeeded the Apostolic Fathers, advocated doctrines which were afterward considered heretical, CXXXIV yet, the Orthodox Christians used whatever doctrine they could to benefit their cause, exalting these same heretics, including Origen, at 185-254, and Tertullian, as founding fathers. Many Christian concepts are in fact Gnostic, such as the disdain for the flesh and for matter in general. In actuality, the Gnostic Christian ideology deemed as evil both matter and the god of the material world, the Demiurge, also called the god of this world, or the prince of this world, as well as Yaldabaoth, the jealous god. Jesus's own Gnosticism is revealed at John 7 7, the world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify of it that its works are evil. And Paul's Gnostic thought appears where he reveals his abhorrence of the flesh and at 2 Corinthians 4 4, for example, where he speaks Gnostically about the God of this world being evil. In this passage, the Apostle also reveals that the scriptures were tampered with and suggests that he and his cohorts themselves were at some point guilty of underhanded ways, apparently including such mutilation of texts, which they were thereafter giving up. We have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways, we refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled only to those who are perishing. In their case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers, to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. Concerning these sentiments, Massey comments. Speaking from his Gnostic standpoint, Paul declared to the historic Christians who followed John and Peter, that God had sent them a working of error, that they should believe a lie, because they rejected the truth as it was according to his spiritual gospel, 
CXXXV not only was Paul propounding a veiled or spiritual gospel, he was a classic Gnostic, called, in fact, the Apostle of the Gnostics, in that he did not acknowledge a historical Christ. As Massey further says, Paul opposed the setting up of a Christ carnalized, and fought the circulators, carnalizers, tooth and nail. If the writings of Paul were retouched by the carnalizers, that will account for the two voices heard at times in his epistles and the apparent duplicity of his doctrine. Paul passed away and his writings remained with the enemy, to be withheld, tampered with, re-indoctrinated, and turned to account by his old opponents who preached the gospel of Christ carnalized. CXXVI. The Gnostic Christ of Paul is also reflected at Galatians 3 27-8, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Regarding this concept, Massey says, The Christ of the Gnostics was a mystical type continued from mythology to portray a spiritual reality of the interior life. Hence the Christ in this human phase could be female as well as male, for such to become historical, or be made so, except by ignorantly mistaking a mythical impersonation for a hermaphrodite in person, CXXVI. The Gnostic focus on attaining Gnosis, or the kingdom of God within, is also a concept that made it into the Christian religion and Bible but that is widely ignored in favor of anosis, or ignorance, and pistis, or blind faith. The fact is that Gnosticism existed first and was eventually changed into Orthodox Christianity around 220 CE. As time went on, the carnalizing Christians created distance between themselves and their Gnostic roots by rewriting texts for their own benefit. As Jackson says, it will be noticed that generally speaking the earlier epistles show signs of Gnostic influence, while the later show signs of anti-Gnostic bias, CXXVI in turn. The Gnostics likened the Orthodox Christians to dumb animals and stated that it was the Orthodoxy, not the Gnostics themselves, who were the blasphemers, because the Orthodoxy did not know who Christ is, CXXX as Pagels. Relates, Gnostic Christians castigated the Orthodox for making the mistake of reading the scriptures, and especially Genesis, literally, and thereby missing its deeper meaning, CXL in fact, as Massey says. Historic Christianity originated with turning the Gnostic and esoteric teachings inside out and externalizing the mythical allegory in a personal human history. CXLI. As stated, many of the Gnostics were fervently antimaterial, such that when the historicizers appeared and began to insist that the Christian Saviour had indeed come in the flesh, the Gnostics equally zealously held that their Christ could never take human form. These, in fact, were the Christian heretics noted by Taylor as the first class of professing Christians. This denial of Christ come in the flesh was called deceitism, a term used by the conspirators to gloss over the disbelief in the Incarnation by saying it meant that Christ existed but had never taken a material body, rather than serving as a rejection of the Gospel story. While later Gnostics may have followed this opinion, the pioneers did not, nor did the pagans who were more blunt in their assessment as to the historical nature of Christ. Of Deceitism, Massey says. The Deceity sects, for example, are supposed to have held that the transactions of the gospel narrative did occur, but in a phantasmagoria of unreality. This, however, is but a false mode of describing the position of those who denied that the Christ could be incarnated and become human to suffer and die upon the cross. The Christians who report the beliefs of the Gnostics, Deceti, and others, always assume the actual history and then try to explain the non-human interpretation as an heretical denial of the alleged facts. But the Decetic interpretation was first, was pre-historical, Kexley I. In Against Heresies, Irenaeus speaks of the followers of the Gnostic Christian Valentinus, second center, who preceded Irenaeus and was so orthodox that he was nearly elected bishop. For, according to them, the Word did not originally become flesh. For they maintain that the Saviour assumed an animal body, formed in accordance with a special dispensation by an unspeakable providence, so as to become visible and palpable. At the same time, they deny that he assumed anything material, into his nature, since indeed matter is incapable of salvation. Irenaeus further complains about and threatens the Decetics, 
while acknowledging them as followers of the Master, i.e., Christians. He shall also judge those who describe Christ as, having become man, only in, human, opinion. For how can they imagine that they do themselves carry on a real discussion, when their master was a mere imaginary being? Or how can they receive anything steadfast from him, if he was a merely imagined being, and not a verity? And how can these men really be partaken of salvation, if he in whom they profess to believe, manifested himself as a merely imaginary being? In addition to denying that Christ came in the flesh, the early followers were extremely confused as to the history of their Saviour, depicting his death, for example, in dozens of different ways, even though such astounding events should have been seared into memory. Irenaeus recounts other Gnostic Christian heresies, beginning with the Samaritan belief that it was not Christ who had died on the cross but Simon, a peculiar development if Jesus's history had been based in fact and widely known from the time of his alleged advent. In his diatribe against the Gnostics Valentinus, Marcion, Basilides and Saturninus, in particular, Irenaeus recapitulates their diverse beliefs and doctrines. But according to Marcion, and those like him, neither was the world made by him, nor did he come to his own things, but to those of another. And, according to certain of the Gnostics, this world was made by angels, and not by the word of God. But according to the followers of Valentinus, the world was not made by him, but by the Demiurge. For they say that he, the Lord and creator of the plan of creation, by whom they hold that this world was made, was produced from the mother, while the gospel affirms plainly, that by the word, which was in the beginning with God, all things were made, which word, he says, was made flesh, and dwelt among us. But, according to these men, neither was the word made flesh, nor Christ, nor the Saviour, Sota. For they all have it, that the word and Christ never came into this world, that the Saviour, too, never became incarnate, nor suffered, but that he descended like a dove upon the dispensational Jesus, and that, as soon as he had declared the unknown Father, he did again ascend into the Pleroma. But according to the opinion of no one of the heretics was the word of God made flesh. Other sects, such as the followers of Apelles, held that Christ's body was made of star stuff, and the Ebionites claimed that Christ was a type of Solomon or type of Jonah, appropriate designations, as we shall see. Obviously, the Gnostics were not uniform in their beliefs and doctrines, despite their attempts at harmonization, mainly because Gnosticism encouraged creativity and freedom of expression. The most disturbing of these heresies, of course, was the denial of Christ's historicity. In his Twelve Topics of the Faith, Gregory Thaumaturgus, 205-265, head of the Alexandrian school, wrote. If anyone says that the body of Christ is uncreated, and refuses to acknowledge that he, being the uncreated word, God, of God, took the flesh of created humanity and appeared incarnate, even as it is written, let him be anathema. As topic I, this subject was obviously the most important and once again reveals that the fathers were under incessant charges of fraud in presenting Jesus Christ as a historical personage. Doras reveals the ultimate heresy of the Gnostics, although he is interpreting it as if the history were first. Firstly, a flood of light is thrown upon the strange figure that the Gnostics made of Jesus. For them, his incarnation was fictitious, and so was his crucifixion. Xli. In other words, they denied Jesus Christ ever existed, in fact, the earliest Gnostic Christians were not even aware of the claims that he had. As noted, others were revolted by the concept. Concerning one of the most widespread and influential Gnostic Christian sects, Manichaeism, Doan relates. The Manichaean Christian bishop Faustus expresses himself in the following manner, Do you receive the gospel? Ask ye. Undoubtedly I do. Why then, you also admit that Christ was born? Not so, for it by no means follows that believing in the gospel, I should therefore believe that Christ was born. Do you think that he was of the Virgin Mary? Mainzoth said, Far be it that I should ever own that our Lord Jesus Christ, descended by scandalous birth through a woman. Cxiv. Faustus's gospel was apparently the same in concept as Paul's spiritual gospel and Martian's non historicizing gospel of the Lord. 
Like Mark Ion, Faustus expresses an extreme manifestation of the Gnostic distaste of flesh and matter, i.e., misogyny, the contempt for women, which was reasoned because the word matter or mater, as in material, was also the word for mother, and matter was deemed female. Thus, the absolute separation of spirit and matter found within the Christian religion has its roots in Gnosticism, as does the attendant sexism. Yet, other Gnostic sects were more balanced and addressed the feminine aspect of the divine. Graves summarizes the Manichaean's perspective. One of the most primitive and learned sects, says a writer, were the Manichaeans, who denied that Jesus Christ ever existed in flesh and blood, but believed him to be a god in spirit only, CXLV. These heretics were so common that the conspirators had to forge the two epistles of John to combat and threaten them, every spirit which confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God, and every spirit which does not confess Jesus is not of God. 1 JN 4 colon 2 3, and again at 2 John 7, for many deceivers have gone out into the world, men who will not acknowledge the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh, such a one is the deceiver and the antichrist. Of these Johann 9 passages, Higgins says. This is language that could not have been used, if the reality of Christ Jesus's existence as a man could not have been denied, or, it would certainly seem, if the apostle himself had been able to give any evidence whatever of the claim. Massey comments. We see from the epistle of John how mortally afraid of Gnostic spiritualism were the founders of the historical fraud. Many deceivers are gone forth into the world that confess not that Jesus Christ cometh in the flesh. These words of John state the Gnostic position. Their Christ had not so come, and could not be carnalized. These Gnostics were in the world long before they heard of such a doctrine, but when they did they denied and opposed it. This, says John, is Antichrist.CXLVI. Ignatius, Bishop of Anch. It was evidently the task of Antiochian Bishop Ignatius, c. 50-98117, to convince those inclined to deceitism that Christ really and truly lived, by way of writing letters to the churches of Asia Minor and Rome. Of Ignatius, Wheelis says. He was the subject of very extensive forgeries, fifteen epistles bear the name of Ignatius, including one to the Virgin Mary, and her reply, two to the Apostle John, others to the Philippians, Tartians, Antiochians, Ephesians, Magnesians, Trallians, Romans, Philadelphians, Smyrnians, and to Polycarp, besides a forged materium, the clerical forgers were very active with the name of Saint Ignatius.CXLVI. As Waite says, it is now established that the only genuine writings of Ignatius extant, are the Curitan epistles. These consist of about 12 octavo pages. They were written AD 115 CXLVI by a few decades later, some 100 pages had been forged in his name. The Curitan epistles comprised the three Syriac texts, the epistles to Polycarp, to the Romans and to the Ephesians. The other epistles, then, are late forgeries, and those that were original, not necessarily from the hand of Ignatius but of the early 2nd century, were interpolated after the beginning of Roman dominance at the end of that century. The older elements reflect Gnosticism, which, as noted, preceded Orthodox, historicizing Christianity and which emanated out of Syria, in particular Anche, where Ignatius was alleged to have been a bishop. For example, the Gnosticizing Ignatius makes reference to the delusion-inducing prince of this world, such as in Ephesians, in which he says, so you must never let yourselves be anointed with the malodorous chrism of the prince of this world's doctrines. The malodorous chrism of which Ignatius speaks is apparently the mystery of the lingam or phallus, practiced in a variety of mystery schools for centuries prior to the Christian era, including by Old Testament characters. By the term malodorous, Ignatius is also evidently addressing the highly esoteric chrism or anointing that used semen. The purpose of many of the epistles attributed to Ignatius was to deal with those blasphemers who denied his Lord ever bore a real human body, Smyrnians, and to program his followers into believing Jesus's history. In his, forged, epistle to the Magnesians, Ignatius exhorts his followers to resist such heresies. But be ye fully persuaded concerning the birth and the passion and the resurrection, which took place in the time of the governorship of Pontius Pilate, 
for these things were truly and certainly done by Jesus Christ our hope. And again, in the letter to the Smyrnians, Ignatius begins by emphatically protesting that. Suffer he did, verily and indeed, just as he did verily and indeed raise himself again. His passion was no unreal illusion, as some skeptics aver who are all unreality themselves. For my own part, I know and believe that he was in actual human flesh. Further in Smyrnians he reiterates. Our Lord is truly of the race of David according to the flesh, but Son of God by the divine will and power, truly born of a virgin and baptized by John that, all righteousness might be fulfilled, by him, truly nailed up in the flesh for our sakes under Pontius Pilate and Herod the Tetrarch, of which fruit are we, that is, of his most blessed passion. In his epistle to the Trallians, Ignatius repeats the conditioning of his flock. Close your ears, then, if anyone preaches to you without speaking of Jesus Christ. Christ was of David's line. He was the son of Mary, he was verily and indeed born, and ate and drank, he was verily persecuted in the days of Pontius Pilate, and verily and indeed crucified. He was also verily raised up again from the dead. And in his epistle to Mary, Ignatius does continue to protest too much, and reveals how prevalent were the denials of the history. Avoid those that deny the passion of Christ, and his birth according to the flesh, and there are many at present who suffer under this disease. Next, Ignatius programs the Philippians against the unbelievers and Gnostics, ironically using a Gnostic concept to threaten them, and sets the stage for centuries-long persecution with his calumny against the Jews. Christ was truly born, and died, for there is but one that became incarnate. The Son only, who became so not in appearance or imagination, but in reality. For the Word became flesh. And God the Word was born as man, with a body, of the Virgin, without any intercourse of man. He was then truly born, truly grew up, truly ate and drank, was truly crucified, and died, and rose again. He who believes these things, as they really were, and as they really took place, is blessed. He who believeth them not is no less accursed than those who crucified the Lord. For the prince of this world rejoiceth when any one denies the cross, since he knows that the confession of the cross is his own destruction. And thou art ignorant who really was born, thou who pretendest to know everything. If any one celebrates the Passover along with the Jews, or receives the emblems of their feast, he is a partaker with those that killed the Lord and his apostles. In all his protestation, Ignatius offers no proof whatsoever of his claims and heinous accusations except his word that Jesus the Lord was truly born and crucified. This utterly unscientific habit occurs repeatedly throughout the Christian Father's works, without a stitch of tangible proof and hard evidence. It is upon this fanatic protestation and not factual events that Christianity's history is founded. Obviously, if everyone in the early Christian movement had known and or believed that Jesus Christ had existed in the flesh, the authors of the Ignatian epistles would not have needed continually to make known their historicizing. Contentions Regarding Ignatius's assorted historicizing elements, Al Doherty Says, the Jesus puzzle, before Ignatius, not a single reference to Pontius Pilate, Jesus' executioner, is to be found. Ignatius is also the first to mention Mary, Joseph, Jesus' father, nowhere appears. The earliest reference to Jesus as any kind of a teacher comes in 1 Clement, just before Ignatius, who himself seems curiously unaware of any of Jesus' teachings. To find the first indication of Jesus as a miracle worker, we must move beyond Ignatius to the epistle of Barnabas. Despite Ignatius's attempts, by Irenaeus's time, Around 170, the Gnostics were still so powerful that Irenaeus felt compelled to spend a great deal of effort refuting them, even though he himself was Gnostic. In his attacks, Irenaeus was forced to take on the most influential of all Gnostics, Marcion. Marcion of Pontus. The Cappadocian Syrian Samaritan Marcion had an enormous impact on Christianity, publishing the first New Testament, upon which the canon was eventually based. Although he was considered a Christian even by his adversaries, Marcion was one of those heretics who vehemently denied that Christ had come in the flesh, died and been resurrected. Marcion was antimatter, 
and his Gnostic God was not the same as the violent, angry YHWH of the Old Testament, a book Mark Ion rejected. Like others before and after him, Mark Ion viewed as evil the God of this world, a notion reflected in the works of Paul, whom Mark Ion considered the truest apostle. As stated, the one historical fact from Martian's gospel used by the later historicizers was, in the fifteenth year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Jesus came down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and taught them on the Sabbath days. This coming down at Capernaum was not considered a historical event by Mark Ion, who denied the incarnation, so it was interpreted through the minds of Christian historicizers as meaning that Mark Ion claimed the Lord had been a phantom or spiritual being who literally came down from the heavens at that time. Massey interprets this passage in its proper mythological, allegorical and Gnostic context. Tertullian says, according to the Gospel of Mark Ion, in the fifteenth year of Tiberius, Christ Jesus deigned to emanate from heaven, a salutary spirit. But, he also says, according to this great antichristian, the Christ was a phantom, who appeared suddenly at the synagogue of Capernaum in the likeness of a full-grown man for the purpose of protesting against the law and the prophets. But it is certain that the Lord or Christ of Mark Ion is entirely non-historical. He has no genealogy or Jewish line of descent, no earthly mother, no father no mundane birthplace or human birth. Cxlux. In his On the Flesh of Christ, Spinmeister Tertullian repeats his charges that Mark Ion expurgated Luke by removing historicizing and Judaizing elements, Mark Ion, in order that he might deny the flesh of Christ, denied also his nativity, or else he denied his flesh in order that he might deny his nativity, because, of course, he was afraid that his nativity and his flesh bore mutual testimony to each other's reality, since there is no nativity without flesh, and no flesh without nativity. He will not brook delay, since suddenly, without any prophetic announcement, did he bring down Christ from heaven. Away, says he, with that eternal plaguey taxing of Caesar, and the scanty inn, and the squalid swaddling clothes, and the hard stable. We do not care a jot for that multitude of the heavenly host which praise their Lord at night. Let the shepherds take better care of their flock, and let the wise men spare their legs so. Long a journey, let them keep their gold to themselves. Let Herod, too, mend his manners, so that Jeremy may not glory over him. Spare also the babe from circumcision, that he may escape the pain thereof, nor let him be brought into the temple, lest he burden his parents with the expense of the offering, nor let him be handed to Simeon, lest the old man be saddened at the point of death. Let that old woman also hold her tongue, lest she should bewitch the child. After such a fashion as this, I suppose you have had, O Mark Ion, the hardihood of blotting out the original records, of the history, of Christ, that his flesh may lose the proofs of its reality. In actuality, Mark Ion did not do away with these various historicizing and Judaizing elements, as they were not attached to the story until after Martian's death. Tertullian continues his fact-bending and illogical diatribe. Chapter 5. Christ truly lived and died in human flesh. Incidents of his human life on earth, and refutation of Martian's descetic parody of the same. There are, to be sure, other things also quite as foolish, as the birth of Christ, which have reference to the humiliations and sufferings of God. But Mark Ion will apply the knife to this doctrine also, and even with greater reason. Have you, then, cut away all sufferings from Christ, on the ground that, as a mere phantom, he was incapable of experiencing them? We have said above that he might possibly have undergone the unreal mockeries of an imaginary birth and infancy. But answer me at once, you that murder truth, was not God really crucified? And, having been really crucified, did he not really die? Here Tertullian is actually conceding that Jesus's birth and infancy may have been imaginary and unreal mockeries. To repeat, the Gnostic texts were non-historicizing, allegorical and mythological. In other words, they did not tell the story of a historical Jewish master. As a further example, 
Regarding the Gnostic texts dating from the 4th century and found at Nag Hammadi in Egypt, Frank Muxy exclaims, Still another interesting fact recorded in this same Coptic collection of gospel fragments is that the disciples did not refer to themselves as Jews, but were from other nations, and that Jesus was also not a Jew, cl several other Gnostic texts were non-historicizing and non-Judaizing, such as the diatessaron of the Martianite Christian Tathian. Fluid 170, a gospel purportedly compiled from the four canonical gospels and of which 200 copies were in use in Syrian churches as late as the time of church superintendent Theodoret, for 3-5, who removed them, no doubt violently, because they had no genealogies and did not declare Jesus to be born of the seed of David. Thus, following Mark Ion, Tatian did not believe that Jesus Christ was a historical person nor did he perceive of the Saviour as being Jewish. In reality, Tatian's Gospel was compiled not from the four canonical Gospels but in the manner of the four Egyptian books of magic, using the same sources as the Evangelists. This episode concerning Theodoret and the 200. Texts in the Syrian churches also reveals that well into the 5th century there were still plenty of Christians who did not believe in the Incarnation. The Pagans in addition to the non-carnalizing Gnostics were many non-Gnostic pagan detractors, although pagan was a pejorative term used to describe illiterate country folk and applied by Christians in a fraudulent attempt to demonstrate that they were more learned than their critics. These pagan critics were, in fact, highly erudite in their own right, much more scientific than their adversaries and, as noted, frequently more moral. As non-Christians, the pagans were less euphemistic than the Gnostics in their denial of Christ's appearance in the flesh, calling it a blatant fabrication and subjecting the Christians to endless ridicule, such that a number of Christian apologists were forced to write long, rambling and illogical rants in attempts to silence their critics. One of the harshest critics of Christianity was the Epicurean and Platonist philosopher Celsus, who was so potent in his arguments that Gnostic. Christian Origen was compelled to compose his refutation against Celsus. Regarding Celsus's opinions of the Christian religion and its adherents, Doan relates, Celsus, an Epicurean philosopher, towards the end of the second century, in common with most of the Grecians, looked upon Christianity as a blind faith, that shunned the light of reason. In speaking of the Christians, he says, They are forever repeating, do not examine. Only believe, and thy faith will make thee blessed. Wisdom is a bad thing in life, foolishness is to be preferred. He jeers at the fact that ignorant men were allowed to preach, and says that weavers, tailors, fullers, and the most illiterate and rustic fellows, were set up to teach strange paradoxes. They openly declared that none but the ignorant, were, fit disciples for the God they worshipped and that one of their rules was, let no man that is learned come. Among us CLI. Doan also relates Celsus's general impression of Christianity, one reflected by many others and admitted by Christians. The Christian religion contains nothing but what Christians hold in common with heathens, nothing new, or truly great. Clee. Regarding Celsus's indictment of Christianity, Doris remarks. In this he asserts that the teaching of the Gospel derives, in part, from Plato, from Heraclitus, from the Stoics, the Jews, from the Egyptians and Persians myths and the Kabiri, Klee. Being educated in such philosophies, Celsus had no difficulty determining the biblical narratives as fiction. As Bowersock says, in fiction as history, the fiction and mendacity that Celsus wished to expose in his true discourse were nothing less than the Christian representation of the life and death of Jesus Christ. Cliff Bowersock continues. Origen strained every nerve in the 3rd century to confute Celsus's elaborate attempt to expose the gospel narratives as fiction. For any coherent and persuasive interpretation of the Roman Empire, it becomes obvious that fiction must be viewed as a part of its history. CLV. Under Nero fiction thrived, as the emperor had an insatiable appetite for Greek and Roman literature, such that he sparked a renaissance, no doubt with numerous poets, playwrights and novelists vying for imperial favour and patronage. Such was the atmosphere into and out of which Christianity was born. 
Bowersock also states. Parallels in form and substance between the writings of the New Testament and the fictional production of the Imperial Age are too prominent to be either ignored or dismissed as coincidental. Both Celsus, in his attack on the Christians, and Origen, in his defense of them, recognize the similarities, particularly, where apparent miracles such as the open tomb or resurrection of the dead were at issue. Clvi. Over the centuries, ancient texts were reworked in order to explain the founding of nations and other auspicious events, as was the case with the Roman book Trojan War, which was suddenly discovered centuries after its pretended date and which is a rewriting of the Iliad designed to glorify the foundation of the Roman state. Kelvi every culture and nation had its heroic epics and legendary foundations, including Greece and Rome. Israel was no exception and its legendary foundation related in the Old Testament is as fictitious as the tale of Romulus and Remus, the mythical founders of Rome. The foundation of Christianity is no less fictitious, except in the minds of the people who have been told otherwise. Celsus was not the only vocal and erudite critic of the new superstition, as Christianity was called. Another detractor, ironically also Origen's teacher after Origen defected from Orthodox Christianity, was Ammonia Sackers, a Greek philosopher and founder of the Alexandrian Neoplatonic school of the 3rd century, who taught that Christianity and paganism, when rightly understood, differ in no essential points, but had common origin, and are really one and the same thing. Clvi Higgins reveals another group of pagan critics. Brahmins constantly tell, Christian, missionaries that, the Christian, religion is only corrupted Brahmanism, clicks so widespread was the criticism and ridicule that Christian elder Arnobius, fourth center, complained, the Gentiles make it their constant business to laugh at our faith and to lash our credulity with their facetious jokes, CLX in fact, as Massey states, the total intelligence of Rome, treated, the new religion as a degrading superstition founded on a misinterpretation of their own dogmas. Clexi indeed, in his On the Incarnation, Saint and Alexandrian Bishop Athanasius, c. 293-373, fretted endlessly about being mocked, particularly for believing that Jesus Christ was historical. We come now to the unbelief of the Gentiles, and this is indeed a matter for complete astonishment, for they laugh at that which is no fit subject for mockery, yet fail to see the shame and ridiculousness of their own idols. First of all, what is there in our belief that is unfitting or ridiculous? Is it only that we say that the word has been manifested in a body? Another vocal critic of Christianity was the pagan emperor Julian, who, coming after the reign of the fanatical and murderous good Christian Constantine, returned rites to pagan worshippers, for which he was murdered. Julian expressed his objections to the Christian religion thus. If anyone should wish to know the truth with respect to you Christians, he will find your impiety to be made up partly of the Jewish audacity, and partly of the indifference and confusion of the Gentiles, and that you have put together not the best, but the worst characteristics of them both. In fact, the Christians were not just mocked, they were considered criminals. As Pagels relates. In an open letter addressed to rulers of the Roman Empire, Tertullian acknowledges that pagan critics detest the movement, you think that a Christian is a man of every crime, an enemy of the gods, of the emperor, of the law, of good morals, of all nature, Kelexii. The early Christians were thus accused of heinous behavior, including infanticide and orgies, imputations that Christians themselves later used against their enemies. In the face of such charges, Justin Martyr was forced to say, do you also believe that we eat human flesh and that after our banquets we extinguish the lights and indulge in unbridled sensuality? Clexia and Tertullian was compelled to write, We are accused of observing a holy rite in which we kill a little child and then eat it after the feast, we practice incest. This is what is constantly laid to our charge, Clexif Pagels also relates. The Christian group bore all the marks of conspiracy. First, they identified themselves as followers of a man accused of magic and executed for that and treason, second, they were atheists, who denounced as demons the gods who protected the fortunes of the Roman state. Besides these acts that police could identify, rumor indicated that their secrecy concealed atrocities, their enemies said that they ritually ate human flesh and drank human blood, CLXV. 
Another of the pagan criticisms, as we have seen, was that the Christians were plagiarists, and degraders, of old ideologies and concepts, an accusation that the Christians were compelled to confirm as they attempted to gain respectability for their new superstition. Thus, the Christians admitted the superlative nature and morality of those pagan ideologies. In his apology, Justin Martyr aligned himself with several ideologies that existed long prior to the Christian era. In saying all these things were made in this beautiful order by God, what do we seem to say more than Plato? When we teach a general conflagration, what do we teach more than the Stoics? By opposing the worship of the works of men's hands, we concur with Menander, the comedian, and by declaring the Logos, the first begotten of God, our Master Jesus Christ, to be born of a virgin, without any human mixture, to be crucified and dead, and to have risen again, and ascended into heaven, we say no more in this, than what you say of those whom you style the sons of Jove. Kelexvi. In fact, Plato was widely studied by the Christian fathers' forgers, as is obvious from their writings, particularly those pontificating about the word, an ancient concept refined by the Greek philosopher. Indeed, Justin Martyr was originally a Platonist. As to the purported difference between pagans and Christians, Doan states. The most celebrated fathers of the Christian church, the most frequently quoted, and those whose names stand the highest were nothing more or less than pagans, being born and educated pagans. Kelexvi. These celebrated pagan Christian fathers included Pantinus, Origen, Clemens Alexandrinus, Gregory and Tertullian. The Jews. Naturally, Orthodox Jews also denied the reality of Christ, although, like other cultures, they were eventually forced through violence to recite that the tale had at least some historicity. In his debate with Trypho the Jew, Justin depicts Trypho as saying. If, then, you are willing to listen to me, for I have already considered you a friend, first be circumcised, then observe what ordinances have been enacted with respect to the Sabbath, and the feasts, and the new moons of God, and, in a word, do all things which have been written in the law, and then perhaps you shall obtain mercy from God. But Christ if he has indeed been born, and exists anywhere is unknown, and does not even know himself, and has no power until Elias come to anoint him, and make him manifest to all. And you, having accepted a groundless report, invent a Christ for yourselves, and for his sake are inconsiderately perishing. Trifo's argument reveals not only that the Jews did not accept Christ as a historical person but also Christ's true nature, as his anointer, Elias, is not only a title for John the Baptist but also Alios, the son. To such accusations, Justin attempts to respond in a chapter titled, the Christians have not believed groundless stories, but he offers no proof at all, merely groundless protestations. As to the origins of Christianity, Massey spells it out. Christianity began as Gnosticism, refaced with falsehoods concerning a series of facts alleged to have been historical, but which are demonstrably mythical. By which I do not mean mythical as exaggerations or perversions of historic truth, but belonging to the pre-extant mythos. It is obvious that the Roman Church remained Gnostic at the beginning of the second century, and for some time afterwards. Mark Ion, the great Gnostic, did not separate from it until about the year 136 AD Tatian did not break with it until long after that. In each case the cause of quarrel was the same. They left the church that was setting up the fraud of historic Christianity. They left it as Gnostic Christians, who were anathematized as heretics, because they rejected the Christ-made flesh and the new foundations of religion in a spurious Jewish history. history.Kelksvii. Thus, we can see that the veracity of the gospel story and the historicity of its main character have been called into question since the tale was released upon an unsuspecting public. 7. Physical Evidence It has been demonstrated that there is no reliable textual evidence for the existence of Jesus Christ and that, in fact, his existence and the historicity of the gospel tale were denied from the earliest times by pagans and Christians, heretics, alike. What about the physical remains? What does archaeology tell us about the historicity of the Christian story? In order to determine the evidence, we must look to architecture, monuments, coins, medals, inscriptions, pottery, statues, frescoes and mosaics, 
among other things. Unfortunately, much of the evidence has been completely destroyed, mostly due to religious fervor, however, there remains enough to reveal the conspiracy and fraud. Jesus's Physical Appearance There is no physical description of Jesus in the New Testament, other than that which resembles the Son, such as at his transfiguration at Matthew 17 2, and he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his garments became white as light, a fitting description for the light of the world that every eye can see. The androgynous character at Revelation 1 13-15 has also been interpreted to refer to Jesus, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed in a garment down to the foot, and dirt about his paps, breasts. His head and his hair were white as white wool, white as snow. A number of people have claimed that the woolly hair reference means Christ was a black man, and they cite black crucifixes and bambinos as evidence. As can be seen, the scriptural evidence of Jesus's physicality creates more problems than it solves. In fact, early Christian fathers admitted that Jesus's appearance was unknown. For example, as St. Augustine said of Christ, according to the Catholic Encyclopedia, in his time there was no authentic portrait of Christ, and the type of features was still undetermined, so that we have absolutely no knowledge of his appearance, Clex this deficiency would appear to be very strange, particularly since it was claimed that Jesus was known throughout the world. How, pray tell, did anyone recognize him? Despite the lack of any gospel description, Jesus was alternately described by the early Christian fathers as either the most beautiful of the sons of men or the ugliest of the sons of men another highly strange development, if this character were real. But, as Augustine admitted, this debate existed before the type of features was determined, i.e., fabricated and standardized. Fox relates the ambiguity of Christ's appearance. Nobody remembered what Jesus had looked like. Citing Isaiah, one wing of Christian opinion argued that he had chosen a mean and ugly human form. By c. 200, he was being shown on early Christian sarcophagi in a stereotyped pagan image, as a philosopher teaching among his pupils or a shepherd bearing sheep from his flock. Clxx. It is beyond belief that had Jesus existed and been seen by the multitudes, no one would remember what he looked like. The authors of the Gospels, pretending to be the apostles, professed to remember Jesus's exact deeds and words, verbatim, yet they couldn't recall what he looked like. Many people think that the standard image with the long, dark hair is how Jesus's early followers saw him. In reality, the earliest images of Christ portray a young, beardless boy, at times with blonde hair. As Carpenter relates, the Christian art of, the first three to four centuries, remained delightfully pagan. In the catacombs we see the Saviour as a beardless youth, like a young Greek god, sometimes represented, like Hermes the guardian of the flocks, bearing a ram or lamb round his neck, sometimes as Orpheus tuning his lute among the wild animals. Clexxi. Of these early depictions of Christ, Doan states. One of the favourite ways finally, of depicting him, was, as Mr Lundy remarks, under the figure of a beautiful and adorable youth, of about fifteen or eighteen years of age, beardless, with a sweet expression of countenance, and long and abundant hair flowing in curls over his shoulders. His brow is sometimes encircled by a diadem or bando, like a young priest of the pagan gods, that is, in fact, the favorite figure. On sculptured sarcophagi, in fresco paintings and mosaics, Christ is thus represented as a graceful youth, just as Apollo was figured by the pagans, and as angels are represented by Christians, Kelexxi. According to the Gospel story, Jesus disappeared between the ages of around 12 and 29 before he began his ministry, so this depiction of him at about 15 to 18 years of age certainly would be odd, since his followers never saw him at that age. These depictions demonstrate that Jesus's appearance was arbitrary, allegorical, unhistorical and not based on a single individual. Dujardin says. As to archaeological evidence, the oldest paintings in the catacombs not only display no features that confirm the gospel legend, but represent Jesus under forms that are inconsistent with it. Calc CIII. Furthermore, the Christian crucifix originally held the image of a lamb instead of a man, up until the 8th to 9th centuries, 
at which time Christ was nevertheless depicted as a young, pagan god. The earliest artists of the crucifixion represent the Christian saviour as young and beardless, always without the crown of thorns, alive, and erect, apparently elate, no signs of bodily suffering are there. Clexive. Moreover, some of the earliest images associated with Christ include not only a lamb but also a fish, rather than a man, the fish, in the opinion of antiquarians generally, is the symbol of Jesus Christ. The fish is sculptured upon a number of Christian monuments, and more particularly upon the ancient sarcophagi. It is also upon medals, bearing the name of our Saviour and also upon engraved stones, cameos and intaglios. The fish is also to be remarked upon the amulets worn suspended from the necks by children, and upon ancient glasses and sculptured lamps. Baptismal fonts are more particularly ornamented with the fish. The fish is constantly exhibited placed upon a dish in the middle of the table, at the Last Supper, among the loaves, knives and cups used at the banquet. CLXXV. The fish is in fact representative of the astrological age of Pisces, symbolized by the two fishes. In addition, the archaeological evidence reveals the existence of the dark-haired and bearded Jesus image long before the Christian era. Indeed, Higgins describes a medal of the Saviour found in pre-Christian ruins with the image of a bearded man with long hair on one side and an inscription in Hebrew on the other. He then exclaims, And now I wish to ask anyone how a coin with the head of Jesus Christ and a legend, in a language obsolete in the time of Jesus Christ, should arrive in Wales and get buried in an old Druidical monument, Kel XVXV. The image held today of a white man with long, Dark hair and a beard is also that of Serapis, the syncretic god of the Egyptian state religion in the 3rd century BCE, who was by the 4th century CE the most highly respected god in Egypt. Serapis was in fact considered to be the peculiar god of the Christians. As Doan relates, There can be no doubt that the head of Serapis, marked as the face is by a grave and pensive majesty, supplied the first idea for the conventional portraits of the Saviour. Kel XVI. Coins. Coin evidence is one of the more underrated methods of archaeology, yet it provides a superior dating system for a number of reasons, including that coins do not disintegrate over time. Unfortunately for Christian propagandists, the coin evidence for early Christianity is nil. T. He close consideration of coin evidence may shake the foundations of the literary narrative. This is because coins are produced with immediacy in response to events, whereas the literary record is composed after the event, often much after, and can suffer from bias if not outright distortion or suppression of facts. Why, no Christian coins, dating to the, 1st, 2nd, 3rd century CE? Because the events, were literary events, fiction. Only, Calx viii. Birth caves, tombs, sundry sites. Many people point to Calvary Hill, Jesus's tomb, the Stations of the Cross, and other tourist spots in Jerusalem and Israel as evidence that there must have been somebody there and some drama must have taken place. It is an unfortunate fact that, because of this belief, hundreds of unstable people have been running about these so-called sacred sites trying to get themselves crucified even to this day. It is this same religious madness that has allowed to flourish not only stories such as the Christian myth, at all but also the booming business of relics, holy sites, etc. Of these purported sacred sites, Wells says. There is not a single existing site in Jerusalem which is mentioned in connection with Christian history before 326, when Helena, mother of Constantine, saw a cave that had just been excavated, and which was identified with Jesus' tomb. Kelix X. Indeed, it is reported that when Helena's representative inquired in Jerusalem as to the Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, no one had ever heard of him except, reputedly, one old man, who promptly showed Helena's envoy a field of buried crucifixes, which was apparently evidence satisfactory enough for these great minds and honest characters to settle the matter, such that they claimed to have found the true cross. Doherty addresses the problem of these so-called sacred sites. In all the Christian writers of the first century, in all the devotion they display about Christ and the new faith, not one of them ever expresses the slightest desire to see the birthplace of Jesus, 
to visit Nazareth his hometown, the sites of his preaching, the upper room where he held his last supper, the tomb, where he was buried and rose from the dead. These places are never mentioned. Most of all, there is not a hint of pilgrimage to Calvary itself, where humanity's salvation was consummated. How could such a place not have been turned into a shrine? Is it conceivable that Paul would not have wanted to run to the hill of Calvary, to prostrate himself on the sacred ground that bore the blood of his slain Lord? Surely he would have shared such an intense emotional experience with his readers. Would he not have been drawn to the Jeff's main garden, where Jesus was reported to have passed through the horror? And the self-doubts that Paul himself had known? Would he not have gloried in? Standing before the empty tomb, the guarantee of his own resurrection. Is there indeed, in this wide land so recently filled with the presence of the Son of God, any holy place at all, any spot of ground where that presence still lingers, hallowed by the step, touch or word of Jesus of Nazareth? Neither Paul nor any other first-century letter writer breathes a whisper of any such thing. It is in reality inconceivable, particularly in consideration of the religious. Fanaticism evident even today, that such zealots as Paul and the other early Christians who were purportedly dying for the faith in droves were completely disinterested in such sacred sites and relics. As to the value of the present sites claimed to provide evidence of the Christian story, it should be noted that, much to the dismay of the Christian orthodoxy, the Kashmir Vale in India lays claim to the grave sites of both Moses and Jesus, who, as the wandering prophet Yezusov, allegedly lived there for many years following his resurrection. The evidence may seem convincing to the uninitiated, however, Yezusov is basically the same as Joseph, which was often a title of a priest and not a name. In addition, some have attempted to place Jesus's lost years in India and or Tibet, where the traveller Nicholas Notovich purportedly received a text by Tibetan monks concerning Jesus's life and times. Notovich claimed that the contents of this text were written immediately after the resurrection. The manuscript itself was purported to date from the 2nd or 3rd century after the Christian era and was certainly was not composed immediately after the resurrection. Even if it genuinely dated from the early centuries, the text itself says at the beginning, this is what is related on this subject by the merchants who have come from Israel, thus demonstrating not that Jesus or Issa, as he is called there, lived in India but that the Jesus tradition was brought to India and Tibet by the extensive trading and brotherhood network that readily allowed for such stories to spread. The Notovich text has a cheery view of the Jews, throws the entire onus of the crucifixion on Pilate and the Romans, and was apparently written as not only Jewish but Buddhist propaganda, as evidenced by the following passage, designed to elevate Buddha above Jesus, six years later, Issa, whom the Buddha had chosen to spread his holy word, could perfectly explain the sacred roles. One notable aspect of the text, however, is its pro-women exhortations, which are surely neither Jewish nor Christian. Furthermore, it should be noted that there were innumerable travelling prophets throughout the ancient world, spouting the same parables and platitudes and doing the standard bag of magic tricks as Jesus, as do the countless Indian yogis of today. It is difficult to believe that the Indians or Tibetans would be very impressed by such stories, since their own traditions are full of countless such godmen. Nor is it possible that the Hindus would not have recognized in the life of Christ that of Krishna Krishna, indeed, they did. In addition, concerning the Indian grave of Moses, the name Musa, or Moses, is common in Kashmir, as are graves. Along with the Moses and Jesus graves, there are also at least two tombs of the Apostle Thomas in India. In fact, over the millennia, the establishment of such revered tombs has been routine. Japan also lays claim to the tombs of both Moses and Jesus. The villagers of Shingo insist that Jesus and his brother were buried there, and they have the graves to prove it. As do the Indians and Tibetans with their nations, the Shingoese assert that Jesus was educated by religious masters in Japan during his lost years. The Japanese tale goes further than the Indian and maintains that, after escaping crucifixion when his brother was mistakenly executed in his place, Jesus fled with the remains of his brother and with followers to Shingo, where he married a Japanese woman fathered three daughters and lived to be 106. Although some locals will swear the story is true, 
it turns out that the Shingo graves are those of Christian missionaries dating from the 16th century. This type of confusion between the gods and their messengers is behind many of the tales about this or that god or godman having been real, and having walked or lived here or there. Often the person who is preaching about the foreign or alien. God is called by the same name as the god, hence, his exploits are confused with the mythology he is presenting. For example, a priest of Apollo, becomes priest Apollo and may then be shortened to Apollo. In cases of culture clash, an entire culture or place may be called by the name of a god. When there are migrations, tradition may be garbled such that it seems to be that of an individual rather than a whole culture. Confusion happens as well when a number of individuals hold the same name or title, as in Buddhism, where the exploits and sayings of many Buddhas, mythical and historical, are rolled into one. The existence of tombs or other sacred sites proves little in itself, since it is a common practice to set up symbolic sites, the symbolism of which no doubt becomes lost to the masses. Sacred site making is also great business imagine owning the piece of property where God himself was born, walked and died. Providing an example of this type of profiteering, Fox states. Just outside, Athens, they claimed, was the very cave in which the infant Zeus had been nursed. Claiming the infant Zeus, the city gained honor, visitors and a temple of particular design. The claim, naturally, was contested by other cities that had caves, Zeus's birthplace, like his tomb, became a topic of keen inter-city rivalry. CLXXX The island of Crete also laid claim to both Zeus's birth and death caves. At Delphi, Greece, there are purported graves of Dionysus and Apollo, and Osiris had his tomb at Sais in Egypt. Orpheus had his tomb in Thrace. There are also several places where the Virgin Mary rested and or died, including Bethlehem, Ephesus and Jethsmain, the latter of which did not even exist at the time. Just recently a place in Nepal laid claim to being Buddha's birthplace. Are we to suppose these deities were really born or buried in these places? The pillars of Hercules are celestial, yet they were given geographical location. Does this mean that Hercules was a real man? In the case of the various gods and their locations, the abstract is first, the historical second. Again, sites where this god or that allegedly was born, walked, suffered, died, etc., are found around the world, revealing a common and unremarkable occurrence. That is not monopolized by and did not originate with Christianity. As Walker states, All over India the footprints of Buddha are still worshipped at holy shrines, but some of these Buddhist feet were originally worshipped as the feet of Vishnu. Even earlier, some may have been the red, henna-dyed feet of the goddess. In antiquity, stones dedicated to Isis and Venus were marked with footprints, meaning I have been here. The custom was copied later on Christian tombs, where the footprint bore the legend in Deo. Plex XXI. Such footprints are found over the purported grave of Jesus in Srinagar, India, as well. If proof of the historicity of a god lies in graves, birthplaces and such, then all of these gods must also have been historical, which would mean that Jesus is a Johnny-come-lately in a long line of historical godmen. In reality, this relic and site fabrication is standard behavior in the world of mythmaking and is not indication or evidence of historicity. As noted, these birthplaces, graves and relics of gods, godmen and saints have been hyped in fact for purposes of tourism, i.e., for money. The Shroud of Turin and Other Holy Relics in its quest to create a religion to gain power and wealth, the church forgery mill did not limit itself to mere writings but for centuries cranked out thousands of phony relics of its lord, apostles and saints. Although true believers desperately keep attempting to prove otherwise, through one implausible theory after another, the Shroud of Turin is counted among this group of frauds. There were at least 26 authentic burial shrouds scattered throughout the abbeys of Europe, of which the Shroud of Turin is just one. The Shroud of Turin is one of the many relics manufactured for profit during the Middle Ages. Shortly after the Shroud emerged it was declared a fake by the bishop who discovered the artist. This is verified by recent scientific investigation which found paint in the image areas. 
The Shroud of Turin is also not consistent with gospel accounts of Jesus' burial, which clearly refer to multiple cloths and a separate napkin over his face. KLXXII. As Gerald LaRue says, Carbon 14 dating has demonstrated that the Shroud is a 14th century forgery and is one of many such deliberately created relics produced in the same period all designed to attract pilgrims to specific shrines to enhance and increase the status and financial income of the local church. XII. Walker comments on the Holy Relic Mill. About the beginning of the 9th century, bones, teeth, hair, garments, and other relics of fictitious saints were conveniently found all over Europe and Asia and triumphantly installed in the reliquaries of every church until all Catholic Europe was falling to its knees before what Calvin called its anthill of bones. Saint Luke was touted as one of the ancient world's most prolific artists, to judge from the numerous portraits of the Virgin, painted by him, that appeared in many churches. Some still remain, despite ample proof that all such portraits were actually painted during the Middle Ages. Excessive. And Wells states. About 1200, Constantinople was so crammed with relics that one may speak of a veritable industry with its own factories. Blinsler, a Catholic New Testament scholar, lists, as examples, letters in Jesus' own hand, the gold brought to the baby Jesus by the wise men, the twelve baskets of bread collected after the miraculous feeding of the five thousand, the throne of David, the trumpets of Jericho, the axe with which Noah made the ark, and so on, CLXXXV. At one point, a number of churches claimed the one foreskin of Jesus, and there were enough splinters of the true cross that Calvin said the amount of wood would make a full load for a good ship, KLXVXV the disgraceful list of absurdities and frauds goes on, and, as Pope Leo X exclaimed, the Christ fable has been enormously profitable for the church. Again, it must be asked why force, forgery and fraud were needed to spread the good news brought by a historical son of God. The relic business was not limited to the Christian faith, however, as there have always been relics associated with other luminaries of the vast pantheon found around the world. As Hislop says, If, therefore, Rome can boast that she has sixteen or twenty holy coats, seven or eight arms of Saint Matthew, two or three heads of Saint Peter, this is nothing more than Egypt could do in regard to the relics of Osiris. Egypt was covered with sepulchres of its martyred god, and many a leg and arm and skull, all vouched to be genuine, were exhibited in the rival burying places for the adoration of the Egyptian faithful. KLXVI. As regards other evidence of Christianity, such as weeping or bleeding statues, so much in vogue these days, or visions, voices, or miracles, etc., these too have their pagan predecessors. False prophecies and miracles and fraudulent relics were the chief reliance among the pagans, as among the Christians, for stimulating the faith, or credulity, of the ignorant and superstitious masses. The images of the gods were believed to be endowed with supernatural power. Of some, the wounds could bleed, of others, the eyes could wink, of others, the heads could nod, the limbs could be raised, the statues. Of Minerva could brandish spears, those of Venus could weep, others could sweat, paintings there were which could blush. The holy crucifix of Boxley, in Kent, moved, lifted its head, moved its lips and eyes, it was broken up in London, and the springs exposed, and shown to the deriding public, but this relation is out of place, this was a pious Christian, not pagan, fake. One of the marvels of many centuries was the statue of Memnon, whose divine voice was heard at the first dawn of day. Other holy relics galore were preserved and shown to the pious, the aegis of Jove, the very tools with which the Trojan horse was made, the Cretans exhibited the tomb of Zeus, which earned for them their reputation as liars. But Mohammedans show the tomb of Adam and Christians that of Peter. There were endless shrines and sanctuaries at which miracle cures could be performed. The gods themselves came down regularly and at the fine feasts spread before their statues. Plex VIII. In establishing their holy relics, the Catholics were merely building on a long line of priestly hoaxing. If such relics are evidence of the reality of Jesus and Mary, are they not also evidence of the reality of Venus, whose statue also wept, or of the Indian elephant-headed god Ganesha, whose images drink milk by the bucket? A truly pious person, 
then, would do well to worship them all and not just these meager few from Palestine. Down sums up the quest thus. In vain do the so-called disciples of Jesus point to the passages in Josephus and Tacitus, in vain do they point to the spot on which he was crucified, to the fragments of the true cross, or the nails with which he was pierced, and to the tomb in which he was laid. Others have done as much for scores of mythological personages who never lived in the flesh. Did not Dames, the beloved disciple of Apollonius of Tyana, while on his way to India, see, on Mount Caucasus, the identical chains with which Prometheus had been bound to the rocks? Did not the Scythians say that Hercules had visited their country? And did not they show the print of his foot upon a rock to substantiate their story? Was not his tomb to be seen at Codes, where his bones were shown? Was not the tomb of Apollo to be seen at Delphi? Was not the tomb of Achilles to be seen at Dodona? Was not the tomb of Aesculapius to be seen in Arcadia? Was not the tomb of Deucalion he who was saved from the deluge? Long pointed out, in Athens? Was not the tomb of Osiris to be seen in Egypt? Of what value, then, is such evidence of the existence of such an individual as Jesus of Nazareth, Kel XXX? Basically, there is no physical evidence for the existence of Jesus Christ. In addition, since there are sacred sites all over the globe, for every culture, it is merely cultural bias that allows so many to claim that theirs are the only true ones, that their land is the holy land or some other designation. The Bible as history. Furthermore, if we look to the archaeological evidence to support the Old Testament, we will find much less than expected. Although the texts make the Jewish people appear to have been a force to be reckoned with in the region, there is no evidence of grand buildings, navies or militaries of the Jews. In fact, during the centuries prior to the Christian era, the Greeks barely noticed the Jews, and the famous historian Herodotus could not find the great kingdom of Judah. Solomon, whose magnificent empire was invisible to Herodotus, when searching for kingdoms in Judea, CXC as Hazelrig relates. Where is the empire of Solomon the Magnificent? It is not noticed by Herodotus, Plato, or Diodorus Siculus. It is a most extraordinary fact that the Jewish nation, over whom the mighty Solomon had reigned in all his glory and magnificence scarcely equaled by the greatest monarchs, spending nearly 8,000 millions of gold on a temple, was overlooked by the historian Herodotus writing of Egypt on one side, and of Babylon on the other, visiting both places and of course almost necessarily passing within a few miles of the splendid capital of the national Jerusalem. How can this be accounted for? Suleiman was a Persian title equivalent to the Greek Iolos, and meant universal emperor. Like Pharaoh, it was not a name, but a designation of rank. The Jews, aiming at universal empire, feigned that one of their kings bear this name, and it is with this petty pilfered thane, for in a little place like Judea he could be no other, that the mighty Sulemans of the Orient are confounded alike by the civilized European and the ignorant Bedouin. Kenyali, the Book of God. One need not search very diligently in order to find similar disparities between biblical statement and the inferences of historical evidence. CXCI. This dearth of evidence for such an empire was noticed at least 2,000 years ago and eventually provoked the Jewish historian Josephus to write his Antiquities of the Jews to demonstrate that the Hebrew culture was very old. While the Hebrew culture may have been old, the nation of Israel in fact was not a great empire but a group of warring desert tribes with grandiose stories borrowed from other cultures. Out of this fertile imagination and opportunism came an even more grandiose tale to end all tales, the Christian myth. 8. The Myth of Hebrew Monotheism as demonstrated, the historical and archaeological record fails to provide any evidence whatsoever that the New Testament story is true. Nor does it bear out important Old Testament tales, such that the religion Christianity is purportedly based on is unsubstantiated as well. In fact, the very notion of the monotheistic Hebrew God, as allegedly depicted in the Old Testament, who could produce a son, is baseless. It is a common belief that the Hebrew people, beginning with Moses, were monotheists whose one God, Yahweh, was the only true God, as revealed exclusively to Hebrew prophets. These original monotheists, it is believed, 
were superior to and had the right to destroy the polytheistic cultures around them by killing their people and stealing their towns, booty and virgin girls, which is what God's chosen are recorded as doing throughout the Old Testament. This monotheist versus polytheist scenario is the common perception, but it is incorrect, as the Hebrews were latecomers to the idea of monotheism and were originally themselves polytheists. In actuality, the Hebrews were by no means the originators of the concept of monotheism, as the Egyptians, for one, had the one God at least a thousand years before the purported time of Moses, by orthodox dating. As Wheelis says. T. His finally and very late evolved monotheism is neither a tardy divine revelation to the Jews, nor a novel invention by them, it was a thousand years antedated by Amenhotep IV and Tutankhamen in Egypt nor were even they pioneers. We have seen the, Catholic, admission that the Zoroastrian Mithra religion was a divinely revealed monotheism, ce. 2, 156.cxci. The monotheism of the Persian religion of Zoroastrianism, in fact, is virtually identical to that of Judaism, or Yahwism, which is, in part, an offshoot of Zoroastrianism. Ormuzd says to Zoroaster, in the Bountesh, I am he who holds the star-spangled heaven in ethereal space, who makes this sphere, which once was buried in darkness, a flood of light. Through me the earth became a world firm and lasting, the earth on which walks the Lord of the world. I am he who makes the light of sun, moon, and stars pierce the clouds. I make the corn seed, which perishing in the ground sprouts anew. I created man, whose eye is light, whose life is the breath of his nostrils. I placed within him life's unextinguishable power, Keksi. Prior to the intrusion of monotheistic Yahwism, the Hebrews were not monotheists separate and apart from their polytheistic Gentile neighbors, either before or after Moses. This Hebrew polytheism is why in the Old Testament the Chosen are constantly depicted as going after other gods and why the Lord God himself changes from hero to hero king to king and book to book. As to the polytheism of the Hebrews and the supposed superiority of monotheism, Robertson says. There is overwhelming testimony to the boundless polytheism of the mass of people even in Jerusalem, the special seat of Yahweh, just before the captivity. Monotheism did not really gain a hold in the sacred city until a long series of political pressures and convulsions had built up a special fanaticism for one cult. Monotheism of this type is in any case morally lower than polytheism since those who held it lacked sympathy for their neighbors. Most of the Jewish kings were polytheists. What I am concerned to challenge is the assumption, due to the influence of Christianity, that Jewish monotheism is essentially higher than polytheism, and constitutes a great advance in the progress of religion. If the mere affirmation of a supreme creator God is taken to be a mark of superiority, certain primitive tribes, who hold this doctrine and yet practice human sacrifice must be considered to have a higher religion than the late Greeks and Romans. CXCIV. The Hebrew polytheism is reflected in the various biblical names for God, the oldest of which were the plural Elohim, Balaam and Adonai, representing both male and female deities. In order to make the Hebrews appear monotheistic, the biblical writers and translators obfuscated these various terms and translated them as the singular God. Elohim, the Lord, Adonai, the Lord God, Elohim YHWH, or the Lord, YHWHIEUE. As Higgins states, in the original, God is called by a variety of names, often the same as that which the heathens gave to their gods. To disguise this, the translators have availed themselves of a contrivance adopted by the Jews in rendering the Hebrew into Greek, which is to render the word IEUE, YHWH, and several of the other names by which God is called in the Bible, by the word. Lord. The fact of the names of God being disguised in all the translations tends to prove that no dependence can be placed on any of them. The fact shows very clearly the temper or state of mind with which the translators have undertaken their task. God is called by several names. How is the reader of a translation to discover this, if he find them all rendered by one name? He is evidently deceived. It is no justification of a translator to say it is of little consequence. 
Little or great, he has no right to exercise any discretion of this kind. When he finds God called Adonai, he has no business to call him Jehovah or Elohim. The fact that Abraham worshipped several gods, who were, in reality, the same as those of the Persians, namely, the Creator, Preserver, and the Destroyer, has been long asserted, and the assertion has been very unpalatable both to Jews and many Christians, and to obviate or disguise what they could not account for, they have had recourse, in numerous instances, to the mistranslation of the original, .cxcv. The Biblical Writers Although many people still believe that the Bible is a monolithic product of the Almighty Himself, infallibly recorded by the authors purported, the reality is that Moses did not write the Pentateuch, or first five books, and that the other OT texts are, like those of the NT, pseudepigraphical, i.e., not written by those in whose names they appear. Also like the NT, over the centuries the various texts of the OT were redacted many times, which is a polite way of saying they were interpolated, mutilated and forged. As Wheelis says of the Old Testament, it may be stated with assurance that not one of them bears the name of its true author, that every one of them is a composite work of many hands interpolating the most anachronistic and contradictory matters into the original writings, and often reciting as accomplished facts things which occurred many centuries after the time of the supposed writer, CXCVI. The Pentateuch, for example, had at least four authors or schools of writers. Even though they are of different authors, these separate segments, some of which were written centuries apart, were interwoven in a confusing yet clever manner. The oldest section of these books is called E, for Elohist, so named because the writer mostly uses the word Elohim for God, although it should be rendered gods. The next section is the Yahwist Jahwist or J account wherein God is called Yahweh, designated by the Tetragrammaton YHWH. The major portion of the Pentateuch was created by P, for Priestly, who refers to God mostly as Elohim and less often as Yahweh. The next discernible influence is D, the Deuteronomist, who apparently cobbled together J and E, along with the laws of Deuteronomy, then wrote the history books that follow, including Joshua, Judges, 1 and 2 Samuel, and 1 and 2 Kings. The Deuteronomist is fanatically Yahwist and writes his histories of the kings from a biased perspective, judging their reigns based on whether or not they had done right in the sight of Yahweh. Finally, someone or a school called by scholars the redactor, are, possibly the author of Ezra, pulled together the various works during or after the Babylonian captivity, 586-538 BCE. These various texts and their authors represent different schools of thoughts and influences, as well as competing priesthoods, explaining why the harried folk of the Levant were constantly falling out of favor with their gods. The Elohists' stories are often silly and nonsensical, when taken literally, because they actually represent the mythologies of a variety of cultures from Canaan Phoenicia to Egypt, Persia and India. The Yahwist, who portrays some of the same anthropomorphic myths as E, is, of course, very concerned with the jealous god, Yahweh, as opposed to the various Elohim. P dispenses with the tall tales and portrays his Elohim, now a unified entity. As very cosmic and impersonal, rather than walking about in the Garden of Eden, for example. DNRR, of course, Yahwistic. As stated, in order to represent the polytheistic Hebrews as monotheists the biblical writers mutilated texts and reinterpreted history, while the translators used the trick of rendering these many gods and goddesses as the singular god, lord, or lord. For example, the word YHWH, transliterated as Jehovah, appears over 6,700 times in each of the Darby and Young's literal, YLT, translations, while it is used only four times in the King James Version. KJV, and not once in the most modern versions such as the RSV and NIV. Of these versions, only the Darby retains the word Elohim for gods, and this word almost always is accompanied by Jehovah, even though the Lord God was not called YHWH until the time of Moses. In this way, translators have given the appearance of uniformity where there was none. Elohim the plural term Elohim appears over 2,500 times in the Old Testament but is falsely translated in most versions. 
This fact of plurality explains why in Genesis God said, let us make man in our image. As stated, Elohim refers to both gods and goddesses, and its singular form, El, served as a prefix or suffix to names of gods, people and places, whence Emmanuel, Gabriel, Bethel, etc. Even Satan was one of the Elohim, as Walker relates. In the original wording, Satan was one of the bin Har Elohim, sons of the gods, but Bible translators always singularized the plurals to conceal the facts that the biblical Jews worshipped a pantheon of multiple gods. CXCVI. Of the Elohim, Taylor says. The Jewish Elohim were the decans of the Egyptians, the same as the genii of the months and planets among the Persians and Chaldeans, and Jao, or Yahu, considered merely as one of the beings generically called Elohim or Elohim, appears to have been only a national or topical deity. CXCVI. The Elohim were in reality a number of El gods, such as El Elyon, the God Most High, El Sabaoth, the God of the Heavenly Hosts, El Che, the Living God, El Nekama, the God of Vengeance, El Maal, the God Above, and El Shaddai, the Almighty God. El Shaddai was the name of the God of Abraham, or the God of the Fathers, who was replaced by Yahweh in the sixth chapter of Exodus. And God spake unto Moses and said unto him, I am Yahweh and I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob, by the name of El Shaddai, but by my name Yahweh I was not known unto them. CXCIA. Charles Potter relates that El Shaddai was later demonized in Psalms 106.37, condemned as one of the devils, the Canaanite Shedim, to whom the Israelites sacrificed their sons and daughters. Psalms 106, in fact, provides a concise chronicle of how the chosen people hoard after other gods, i.e., were polytheistic. In a somewhat common development of the human mind, which allows for polytheism, pantheism, monotheism and atheism at once, the Elohim became perceived as one El. The word El also represented a deity both male and female, but the later Jews generally interpreted it exclusively as male. El was the sun or day star, as well as the planet Saturn which at one point was considered the central and everlasting sun of the night sky. El Saturn's worship is reflected in the fact that the Jews still consider Saturday as the Sabbath or God's day. Furthermore, El is Elias, the sun god Elios to whom Jesus called from the cross, cc since El is the sun, the many Elohim of the Bible also represent the stars. The Elohim were not only Phoenician and Canaanite gods but as Ali were. Originally Egyptian the Ali were considered their associated gods or members, i.e. the lips, the limbs, the joints, the hands, etc., of Atom, or Amen, the son of Partak Kai therefore, as in the Indian system, we have a sort of polytheistic monotheism in the Elohim. The son of Partak is also called Iao Iau Yahu Iu, the same as Yahweh. Therefore, the two accounts of Genesis, the Elohist and Jarwist, may be understood as reflecting the older Egyptian religion, thus the Elohim are represented in the first creation of man by the Maker, Partar, and in the second by Ayu, the son of Partar, and Ayu, the son of Partar, is Yahu Elohim, the biblical Lord God, who becomes the creator of the second Adam, Atom, in the second chapter of the Hebrew Genesis, CCII. Balaam and Adonai The god Baal and gods Balaam are mentioned dozens of times in the Old Testament, as the Israelites are frequently castigated or murdered by their own priests for going after Baal. Like the Elohim, the plural Baalim or Baals were often represented by the singular Baal, or Baal, an Egyptian term combining Ba, the symbol of the planet and goddess Venus, with Al or El, the designation of the sun. Thus, Baal was the name for the sun in the age of Taurus, Baal, which was ruled by Venus. The Taurian age is one of twelve ages representing the astrological phenomenon called the precession of the equinoxes, whereby the sun rising at the vernal or spring equinox is backdropped by a different constellation every 2150 years. The precession takes nearly 26,000 years to move through the twelve constellations, a cycle called the Great Year. The knowledge of the precession goes back many thousands of years and is found around the globe from China to Mexico, Chisi reflecting that the so-called primitive ancients were in reality extraordinarily advanced. In addition, 
when the sun was in Taurus, beginning about 6,500 years ago, the bull motif sprang up in many parts of the world, including the Levant, where it symbolized bull. Like the other epithets for God, bull is a title meaning lord or husband, it is, in fact, a very old appellation for the deity, and can be found not only in Egypt but also in India as Bala.ccv in the ancient languages of Ireland and Sri Lanka. Ball means son CCV Ball is in reality the earlier name of the character later known as Yahweh, as is stated at Hosea 2.16. And in that day, says YHWH, you will call me, my husband, and no longer will you call me my Ball. Walker relates that Ball was the lord among ancient Semites, consort of the goddess Astart. Every god was a Ball. The title was introduced into Ireland via Phoenician colonies from Spain. Old Testament Jews worshipped many Balaam as past or present consorts of the goddess Sion, Hosea 2 2-8. Yahweh shared these other gods' temples for a long time, until his priesthood managed to isolate his cult. And suppress the others, CCVI and Blavatsky says, the Baal of the Israelites, the Shemesh of the Moabites and the Moloch of the Ammonites, was the identical son Jehovah, and he is till now the king of the host of heaven, the sun, as much as Astareth, Astart, was the queen of heaven or the moon, CCVI the other Balin worshipped by the Israelites included Balpir, the lord of the gap, and Balbereth, lord of the covenant. Another was Bal Jehoshua, also Joshua or Jesus, the lord of salvation, long before the Christian era. Another word basically the same as Baal is Adonis, which in the plural is Adonai, a term used for lord over 400 times in the Hebrew Bible. Adonis, like Baal and El, is an epithet for the sun. Yahweh The attempted changeover from Elohim Balim Adonai to Yahweh coincided with the arrival on the main stage of the Levitical priesthood, as Moses, to whom Yahweh purportedly first appeared, was said to have been a son of Levi. Among other things, the Levites were fanatic priests obsessed in moving Israel from the age of Taurus into that of Ores, the Ram Lamb. In fact, in Exodus 12 Moses resets the processional clock by changing the beginning of the year and instituting the Passover and the Feast of the Lamb and the salvation of Israel by the blood of the Lamb, CCVII as stated, prior to being labeled Yahweh, the Israelite God was called Baal, signifying the sun in the age of Taurus. When the sun passed into Ares, the Lord's name was changed to the Egyptian IAO, CCIX which became YHWH, IEUE, Yahweh, Yahweh. Jehovah and Jah. This ancient name IAO IAO represents the totality of God, as the I symbolizes unity, the A is the Alpha or beginning, while the O is the Omega or end. In fact, the name Yahweh, IAO, or any number of variants thereof can be found in several cultures. In Phoenicia the sun was known as Adonis, identical with IAO, or, according to the Chinese faith, Yao. Jehovah, the sun, who makes his appearance in the world at midnight of the 24th day of the 12th month, CCXYHWHIEUE was additionally the Egyptian sun god Ra. Ra was the father in heaven, who has the title of Huhi the Eternal, from which the Hebrews derived the name Iha, Xi. Thus, the tetragrammaton or sacred name of God Iao Iee YHWH is very old, pre-Israelite, and can be etymologically linked to numerous gods, even to Jesus, or Yahushua, whose name means salvation or IAOYHWH saves. As Higgins says. The pious Dr. Pockhurst, proves, from the authority of Diodorus Siculus, Varro, S.D. Augustine, etc., that the IAO, Jehovah, or IEUE, or IE of the Jews, was the Jove of the Latins and Etruscans. He allows that this IE was the name of Apollo. He then admits that this IEUE Jehovah is Jesus Christ in the following sentences, it would be almost endless to quote all the passages of scripture wherein the name IEUE is applied to Christ, they cannot miss of a scriptural demonstration that Jesus is Jehovah. But we have seen it is admitted that Jehovah is Jove, Apollo, Sol, whence it follows that Jesus is Jove, etc. CCXI. Yahweh had yet another aspect to his persona as at some early stage the sacred tetragrammaton of God was bigendered. As Walker states, Jewish mystical tradition viewed the original Jehovah as an androgyne, his, her name compounded as Jah, Jod, 
and the pre-Hebraic name of Eve, Hava or Hawa, rendered Hivauhi in Hebrew letters. The four letters together made the sacred tetragrammaton, YHWH, the secret name of God. The Bible contains many plagiarized excerpts from earlier hymns and prayers to Ishtar and other goddess figures, with the name of Yahweh substituted for that of the female deity. CCIII. Thus, even Yahweh was at one time plural, but he eventually became an all male, sky god. This singular Yahweh was a warrior god representing the sun in Ares, which is ruled by the warlike Mars and symbolized by the ram, the same symbolic ram caught in a thicket near Abraham and used by him as a replacement sacrifice for his son Isaac. This warrior god Yahweh was not only jealous but also zealous, as his name is rendered in Young's literal translation. For ye do not bow yourselves to another god for Jehovah, whose name, is, zealous, is a zealous god. Exodus 34:14. In fact, the same word in Hebrew is used for both jealous and zealous, although is transliterated differently, Cana being jealous and Cana, zealous. As El Elyon was but one of the Canaanite Elohim, the Most High God, so was Yahweh, as El Cana, the jealous zealous God, which is why in the Old Testament he keeps sticking his nose in and shouting at everyone. The title jealous zealous is also appropriate for a God represented by a volcano as was Yahweh by the smoky and fiery Mount Sinai. Hence, Yahweh's followers themselves were intolerant and hot-headed zealots. As we have seen, Yahweh represented not only the sky but the sun, the heat, energy and fire of which were localized on the earth in the Jewish Yahweh, whose priests claimed dominance over all other gods and priests by using a volcano to frighten the Hebrews into submission. The word Yahweh or Yahweh in the Sanskrit means overflowing an apt description for a volcano god imposed upon the natives by the use of its eruptions and lava flows. In regard to Yahweh's volcanic nature, Stone relates. In the Exodus account of the mountain of God we read these descriptions, on the third day when the morning came, there were peals of thunder and flashes of lightning, dense cloud on the mountain and a loud trumpet blast, the people in the camp were all terrified. Exod 19.16 and in Exod 20 18 21, when all the people saw how it thundered and the lightning flashed, when they heard the trumpet sound and saw the mountain smoking, they trembled and stood at a distance. CCCIV. Deuteronomy 9 21 relates that Moses took the golden calf, ground it into dust, and threw it into the torrent that flowed down the mountain. Moreover, Numbers 11 and Psalms 11, 18 and 97 speak of the Lord's fire and volcanic activity. As Stone also states, Surely the most vivid description of Yahweh as a volcanic mountain occurs in P.S. 18. Here we read, The earth heaved and quaked, the foundations of the mountain shook, they heaved, because he was angry. Smoke arose from his nostrils, devouring fire came out of his mouth, glowing coals and searing heat. Thick clouds came out of the radiance before him, hailstones and glowing coals. He shot forth lightning shafts and sent them echoing. The imagery is hard to ignore. CCXV. Furthermore, a representation of the Jewish feast of the giving of the law has an image of an erupting volcano, Mount Sinai, with the two tablets of the Ten Commandments above it. As Jordan Maxwell points out, the benediction or blessing sign of the feast is the same as the split fingered, live long and prosper salutation of the Vulcan character Spock on Star Trek. Vulcan, of course, is the same word as volcano, and the Roman god Vulcan was also a lightning and volcano god. In volcano cults, the thunderous noise coming from the mountain is considered the voice of God, the same voice that spoke to Moses in the myth. Indeed, if Yahweh were not a volcano god, his violent and angry persona would be doubly repulsive. As Taylor relates, Sometimes he is described as roaring like a lion, at others as hissing like a snake, as burning with rage, and unable to restrain his own passions, as kicking, smiting, cursing, swearing, smelling, vomiting, repenting, being grieved at his heart, his fury coming up in his face, his nostrils smoking, etc. CCXVI. As stated, Yahweh the volcano God made his entrance at the same time as Moses and Aaron, brothers and sons of Levi. 
Moses and Aaron were in reality only made to appear to be Levites, a tribe that, it is posited, were actually Indo-Europeans invaders who took over the desert tribes and forced a centralized religion on them in order to gain power and wealth. These zealots, however, need not have been invaders as such, since Indo-European Aryans already dwelled among the Semites. Although the house of Levi is purported to descend from the sons of Shem, i.e., to be Semites, it appears that at least some of the Levites may have been sons of Japheth, known as Assyrians, Persians, Babylonians and assorted other Chittim, Kittim or Kittians, a generic Jewish term for Aryans. Both of these groups, Semites and Aryans, are claimed in the Bible to have been sons of Noah who were to share the same tent and to enslave the descendants of Noah's third son, the Hamites, thus, at some point their distinction could not have been very pronounced. In fact, the Aryans and Semites are more intermingled than suspected, as some of the sons of Japheth became Ashkenazi, or European Jews, as stated at Genesis 10-2-3. Indeed, the distinction was made long afterwards, when the Yahwists were compiling their books and attempting to promote themselves as strict segregationists. Furthermore, these Yahweh zealots incorporated Egyptian mythology, such that they were Indo-Aryan Egyptians, precisely the mix found in the Levant. Wherever they were from, the Levites certainly represented a break from the old, polytheistic Semitic Hebrew tribes. This break is thus reflected in the story of Moses, where the Hebrews are portrayed as having a difficult time turning from their ancient worship of the Egyptian god Horus as the golden calf, son of the Egyptian mother goddess, Atha, who was represented as a cow. As Walker states, Egypt revered mother Atha as the heavenly cow whose udder produced the Milky Way, whose body was the firmament, and who daily gave birth to the sun, Horus Ra, her golden calf, the same deity worshipped by Aaron and the Israelites, these be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt, Exodus 32 4.ccxvi. Even though Yahweh was also identified with the sun, the golden calf was so horrifying to the Judean Levites that they wrote diatribes against its worship, such as the book of Hosea, whose author rails against the Baals and the calf of Samaria, the nation also called Israel, as well as Ephraim, after the son of Joseph. Moses's Levitical Yahwist law, however, evidently didn't stick, as even the exalted Hebrew patriarch Solomon set up for his foreign wives altars to the Moabite sun god Chemosh and the Tyrian sun and fire god Molech, Molech, Melech or Melech. Although he was purportedly vilified by the Lord, Chemosh was, as Walker relates, the Hebrew form of Shamash, the sun god of Sippar and Moab, worshipped in the temple of Solomon, 1 Kings 11:17. Because Chemosh was one of Yahweh's rivals, called an abomination by later priests attempting to suppress all cults but their own. He was adopted into the still later Christian pantheon of hell as a demon, CCXVI. Like that of India and Egypt, the Levantine pantheon of the first millennium BCE was in fact burgeoning with deities. As noted, even Yahweh himself was not a single god, nor is he found in any one culture. In fact, Yahweh was at one point associated with the Indian elephant-headed god Ganesha, whose title was Lord of Hosts, also a biblical epithet for Yahweh. As Yahweh is purported to have done in the later gospel story, in Indian mythology Ganesha impregnated the virgin goddess Maya, who subsequently gave birth to Buddha, CCX if Yahweh is the monotheistic father god who gave birth to Jesus, he must also have given birth to Buddha. However, as the Hebrew god Behemoth, Ganesha was later demonized by the Christians. CCXX Yahweh also took many of his attributes from the Babylonian god Marduk, who created the world by separating the celestial and the abyssal waters. CCXI In fact, Marduk and Ishtar were worshipped by the Jews at Elam. CCXII Among these many gods revered by the Hebrews was also the Sumero Babylonian goddess Aruru, who was worshipped in the Jewish temple. CCXII Furthermore, the word Israel itself is not a Jewish appellation but comes from the combination of three different reigning deities, Isis, the goddess revered throughout the ancient world, Ra, the Egyptian sun god, and El. As Hazel Rigg says, Israel, meaning a belt or land of the heavens, the twelve tribes of which compare to the number of constellations that environ the ecliptic, and through which the sun makes his annual circuit. Israel, the kingdom of the moon, Isis, 
Sun, Ra, and Stars, L, dot CCX5. In addition, the Syrian savior Tammuz was the god or genius of Jerusalem, where also the Greek god Dionysus was worshipped under his Phrygian name of Zeus Sabasius, CCXXV. In fact, Jewish coins have been found with the images of Dionysus on one side and the word YHWH on the other. Walker relates that Jews living in Asia Minor said their Jehovah was another form of Zeus Sabasius, CCXVO. The Hebrews are also reported to have sacrificed rams to Jupiter. CCXVO. Thus, as Wheeler says, the Hebrew Christian one God is a patent forgery and myth, CCXVI. The imposition of monotheism. The myth of Hebrew monotheism comes from the Yahweh propagandists who set about to formulate the Jewish religion. While the Elohim were the special gods of the northern tribes and kingdom of Israel, the Levitical Yahweh was in fact the local god of the southern kingdom of Judah. As such, Yahweh is made to elevate Judah above all the other tribes by making it the progenitor of the kings of Israel. In fact, Yahweh and Judah are basically the same word, as Judah is Yahuda, which means Yahweh, I will praise. This name Judah is also the same as Judah's, which was thus likewise the name of the tribal god. Hence, it was the Jews and not all Hebrews and Israelites who were Yahweh fanatics. The other nations, in fact, were frequently both disinterested in and repulsed by the violent, angry, jealous, zealous God that Yahweh became. As Knight and Lomas say. For many, Yahweh was no more than the Israelite war God, useful in time of battle but a fairly lowly figure when viewed against the full pantheon of the gods. The names given to notable Israelites down the ages shows a strong respect for Baal, and even the most ardent Yahwist would not pretend that the Jews of this period believed in only one god. CCXX. The Yahwists were in reality a rude bunch of marauders who pretended to speak for their Lord and who then spent centuries destroying the ancient Hebrew polytheism so they could hold total power over the people. Their favorite targets were the followers of the great goddess, who were ubiquitous in the ancient world. Larson illustrates how prevalent and long-lived was the worship of the goddess and how great the zeal to destroy it. The Old Testament contains at least 40 passages in which the Yahweh prophets denounce the temple groves of Ashtoreth, Ishtar, with their sacred prostitution, and it is obvious that the Israelites celebrated her ritual almost universally until the Middle of the 7th century. CCXXX, the much vilified biblical character Jezebel was in reality a refined priestess of Baal and Astareth, the goddess, while her main nemesis, Elijah, a Yahweh zealot, as evidenced by his name, was a crude, dirty, and hairy wildman. Except in the eyes of the Yahwists, Jezebel was considered Hebrew royalty, and her worship of the great goddess was consistent with what had existed prior to the Yahwist invasion. In fact, in the Old Testament the Yahwist priests are depicted as virtually foaming at the mouth in describing their people as worshipping Baal and Astareth, but many of their people at this time were virgin girls who had been the only ones spared as the Yahwist thugs captured town after town, slaughtering the inhabitants, stealing their property and raping their young, Num 31-17-18, et al. These surviving girls continued their ancient tradition of worship, including that of the goddess and Assorted Baals, much to the constant frustration and outrage of the sexist, patriarchal and virgin enslaving Yahwists. In order to establish their supremacy, the creed and duty of the Yahwists were as follows. You shall surely destroy all the places where the nations whom you shall dispossess served their gods, upon the high mountains and upon the hills and under every green tree, you shall tear down their altars, and dash in pieces their pillars, and burn their ashram with fire you shall hew down the graven images of their gods, and destroy their name out of that place. Jute 12 2-3 Part of the Hebrews' ancient worship included the establishment of high places where they set up altars and other religious accoutrements, including the ashram, or singular ashira, the stylized multibranched tree symbolizing the great goddess of Canaan, CCXXI. The ashram were erected by Hebrews such as the patriarch Abraham in Beersheba. Yet later Yahwist fanatics destroyed them. CCXI these ashram in sacred groves served as astronomical instruments, reflecting the connection between trees and the stars, which possessed the names of trees. CCXI these sacred high places were specially constructed all over the Levant as sites of sacrifice, both animal and human, by non-Semites and Semites alike, 
the latter of whom were, in fact, the last people to maintain human sacrifice, into Hadrian's time, when it was banned. CCXXI these sacrifices on high places, however, served not only for the propitiation of the gods but also to provide food, and this was the major reason the monopolizing Yahwists went after the high places, so that they could control the Hebrews down to the food they ate, giving the priests tremendous power. Obviously, it is more than unreasonable to insist that, in order to eat, the people of a nation must all go to a centralized place, where they are compelled to pay a priest to sacrifice their food animals, thus, the people relentlessly rebuilt the high places and ignored the centralizing priests. When the threats and destruction of the high places failed to end the polytheism, however, the Yahwists repeatedly butchered their own people, Num 25, Ezek 9, demonstrating that the repressive, despotic monotheism is no more moral than other religious or secular ideologies and governing systems. In the face of such unbearable oppression as having their food controlled, the people not only rebelled against the imposed jealous zealous god, YHWH, they turned to other gods to get rid of him. In fact, according to the biblical story it was this oppression that split the kingdom in two after Solomon's death, at which time the northern kingdom of Israel returned to the old polytheism under the Ephraimite king Jeroboam. Jeroboam, it should be noted, was appointed by Solomon to be the foreman over the slaves of the house of Joseph, i.e., Ephraim Manasseh, 1 Kings 11:28, who had originally inhabited the northern lands but whom the genocidal tribe of Judah had been unable to exterminate, 1 Kings 9:20. The division actually occurred after the people, including Jeroboam, asked Solomon's son Rehoboam to lighten the yoke of his father. Jeroboam then made two golden calves at the Hebrew sacred sites of Dan and Bethel and said to the northern Israelites, you have gone up to Jerusalem long enough. Behold your gods, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Jeroboam was thus expressing the frustration of the people, Jews and Gentiles alike, who had been slaves to the Jerusalemite priests. The king was also stating that it was the golden calf of Horus Baal Iusa, as opposed to the volcanic Yahweh, who brought Israel out of Egypt. According to the story, Jeroboam's efforts were doomed to failure, however, because a couple of centuries later two reformer kings, Hezekiah and Josiah, arose to reinstate the repressive and exploitative centralized worship. Hezekiah, 715-687 BCE, in fact, purged Judah and Ephraim of their high places and Ashram in a frenzied rampage that destroyed centuries-old religious sanctuaries. Friedman says of this purge. The religious reform meant more than breaking idols and cleansing the temple. It also meant destroying the places of worship of Yahweh outside of the temple in Jerusalem. In addition to the temple, there had been various local places where people could go to sacrifice to God. These places of worship in the local communities were called high places. Hezekiah eliminated them. He promoted the centralization of the religion at the temple in Jerusalem. CCXXXV the high priest of Jerusalem, therefore, came to hold enormous power, as Jerusalem was the only Jewish religious center left. Hezekiah also purportedly destroyed the bronze serpent of Moses, a 500-year-old religious relic, striking a blow at the Levitical priesthood traced through Moses, Mushites, an act that leaves one to wonder how Hezekiah could represent a great exemplar of the Mosaic law and religion. After Hezekiah's death, his son Manasseh returned the local pagan worship to the people, but the reformers struck back with their favorite king Josiah, who was even more vehement than Hezekiah in his assaults on the old religion. In order to explain why the Hebrews kept going after other gods, the biblical writers pretended that the Book of the Law of Moses had been lost and found 600 years later, 622 BCE, by Josiah's high priest. Hilkiah, a son of Zadok or Sadducee. After reading the law, or before, depending on which of the contradictory accounts in the infallible word one reads, Josiah goes on a rampage and purges the high places. The tale is obviously fictitious, as, in reality, it cannot be explained why, if Moses had been real and had such a dramatic and impactful life, his law would have been lost in the first place. And if it had been lost, how did Hezekiah know to follow it when he made his purges and reforms? 
It is also inexplicable as to why the Lord would have gone to so much trouble to talk regularly with Moses and Aaron, give them an enormous amount of detailed instructions, and then just let his chosen put it all away for six hundred years. Where was the Lord during this time? He was purportedly involved in every little detail of Israelite life, yet he never reminded them of the long-lost law. The truth is that Hilkiah's book of law was created in his time or afterward in order to consolidate the power of the priesthood, in particular that of the Judean Levites. Shortly thereafter, Jerusalem was destroyed because it was considered troublesome, an oppressive atmosphere that may have been one of the reasons the majority of Jews did not return to Palestine after the end of the Babylonian captivity. This important incident of Josiah and the new law provides an example of how the Old Testament was not produced in the manner commonly portrayed but represents the work of several hands or schools. The early stories basically constitute ancient myths mixed with the tribal histories, with a number of people over the centuries rewriting them for propagandistic purposes, long after their purported era. The fact is that the Hebrews Israelites were polytheists before and after the supposed finding of the law, and that the law itself was variously interpreted by the different tribes' nations. In addition to the variety of gods and doctrines represented by the biblical writers are these various tribes, with the Elohist, for example, affiliated with the kingdom of Israel and the Jahwist, Judah. The differing accounts, then, were combined in an attempt to unify the kingdoms, and the tribe God whose scribes wrote the stories was elevated above the rest. As Robertson says, Yahweh, or Yah, or Yaha, was simply a local worship aggrandized by the, tribal, king and imposed on the fictitious history of the Hebrews long. Afterwards, CCXVI. Doan sums up the state of Israel during biblical times. It is supposed by many, in fact, we have heard it asserted by those who should know better that the Israelites were always monotheists, that they worshipped one God only, Jehovah. This is altogether erroneous, they were not different from their neighbours, the heathen, so-called, in regard to their religion. In the first place, we know that, the Israelites, revered and worshipped a bull, called APIs, just as the ancient Egyptians did. They worshipped the sun, the moon, and the stars and all the host of heaven. They worshipped fire, and kept it burning on an altar, just as the Persians and other nations. They worshipped stones, revered an oak tree, and bowed down to images. They worshipped a queen of heaven called the goddess Astarte or Mylitta, and burned incense to her. They worshipped Baal, Moloch, and Chamosh, and offered up human sacrifices to them, after which in some instances, they ate the victim. CCXYI. The Hebrews were thus not distinct from their polytheistic neighbours, except after centuries of programming and conditioning that eventually caused them to become a race separate and apart from the rest of the world. Stone relates. As George Mendenhall writes, ancient Israel can no longer be treated as an isolated independent object of study, its history is inseparably bound up with ancient oriental history, whether we are concerned with religion, political history or culture, CCXVI. The Levant, in fact, was a melting pot of ideologies and gods of all sorts from around the known world, out of which would arise a king of kings and lord of lords to beat them all. 9. The Characters We have seen that there is no evidence for the historicity of the Christian founder, that the earliest Christian proponents were as a whole either utterly credulous or astoundingly deceitful and that said defenders of the faith were compelled under incessant charges of fraud to admit that Christianity was a rehash of older religions. It has also been demonstrated that the world into which Christianity was born was filled with assorted gods and goddesses, as opposed to a monotheistic vacuum. In fact, in their fabulous exploits and wondrous powers many of these gods and goddesses are virtually the same as the Christ character, as attested to by the Christian apologists themselves. In further inspecting this issue we discover that Jesus Christ is in fact a compilation of these various gods, who were worshipped and whose dramas were regularly played out by ancient peoples long before the Christian era. Although many people have the impression that the ancient world consisted of unconnected nations and tribes, the truth is that during the era Jesus allegedly lived there was a trade and brotherhood network that stretched from Europe to China. 
This information network included the library at Alexandria and had access to numerous oral traditions and manuscripts that told the same narrative portrayed in the New Testament with different place names and ethnicity for the characters. In actuality, the legend of Jesus nearly identically parallels the story of Krishna, for example, even in detail, with the Indian myth dating to at least as far back as 1400 BCE. Even greater antiquity can be attributed to the well-woven Horus myth of Egypt, which also is practically identical to the Christian version but which preceded it by thousands of years. The Jesus story incorporated elements from the tales of other deities recorded in this widespread area of the ancient world, including several of the following world. Saviors, most or all of whom predate the Christian myth. It is not suggested that all of these characters were used in the creation of the Christian myth, as some of them are found in parts of the world purportedly unknown at the time, however, it is certain that a fair number of these deities were utilized. Thus, we find the same tales around the world about a variety of godmen and sons of God, a number of whom also had virgin births or were of divine origin, were born on or near December 25th in a cave or underground, were baptized, worked miracles and marvels held high morals, were compassionate, toiled for humanity and healed the sick, were the basis of soul salvation and or were called saviour, redeemer, deliverer, had eucharists, vanquished darkness, were hung on trees or crucified, and were resurrected and returned to heaven, whence they came. The list of these saviours and sons of God includes the following. Adad and Marduk of Assyria, who was considered the word, Logos. Adonis, Esclepius, Apollo, who was resurrected at the vernal equinox as the Lamb, Dionys, Heracles, Hercules, and Zeus of Greece. Alcides of Thebes, divine redeemer born of a virgin around 1200. BCXC6. Attis of Phrygia. Paul or Bell of Babylon Phoenicia. Balder and Fry of Scandinavia. Bali of Afghanistan. Bedru of Japan Buddha and Krishna of India Tu Chuluin of Ireland Kodam and Deva Tat of Siam Krite of Chaldea Dalsbog of the Slavs Dumuzi of Sumeria Fahai, Lao Kyun, Tien, and Chanti of China, whose birth was attended by heavenly music, angels and shepherds Xilhamis of Egypt Greece, who was born of the Virgin Maya and called the Logos because he was the messenger or word of the heavenly father, Zeus. Hesus of the Druids and Gauls Horus, Osiris and Serapis of Egypt Indra of Tibet India Ieo of China, who was the great prophet, lawgiver and saviour with seventy disciplesksli Issa Isa of Arabia, who was born of the Virgin Mary and was the divine word of the ancient Arabian Nasara Nazarenes around 400 BCXli Jao of Nepal Jupiter Jove of Rome Mithra of Persia India Odin Woding Wooden Votan of the Scandinavians, who was wounded with a spear, CCXli I. Prometheus of Caucasus Greece. Quetzalcoatl of Mexico. Quirinius of Rome Salivahana of Southern India, who was a divine child, born of a virgin, and was the son of a carpenter, himself also being called the carpenter, and whose name or title means cross-born, salvation, CCX life Tamas of Syria, the saviour God worshipped in Jerusalem Thor of the Gauls universal monarch of the Sibyls Witoba of the Bilinganese Telinganese Salmoxis of Thrace the saviour who promised eternal life to guests at his sacramental last supper. Then he went into the underworld, and rose again on the third day CCXLV Zarathustra Zoroaster of Persia Zor of the Bonzes This list does not pretend to be complete, nor is there adequate room here to go into detail of all these mythological characters. It should be noted that, as with Jesus, a number of these characters have been thought of in the past as being historical persons, but today almost none of them are considered as such. The Major Players Attis of Phrygia The story of Attis, the crucified and resurrected Phrygian son of God, predates the Christian saviour by centuries, in the same area as the Gospel tale. Attis shares the following characteristics with Jesus. Attis was born on December 25th of the Virgin Nana. He was considered the saviour who was slain for the salvation of mankind. His body as bread was eaten by his worshippers. His priests were eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven. He was both the divine son and the father. On Black Friday, he was crucified on a tree, from which his holy blood ran down to redeem the earth. 
he descended into the underworld. After three days, Attis was resurrected on March 25th, as tradition held of Jesus, as the Most High God. Dan provides detail of the Attis drama, which was a recurring blood atonement. Attis, who was called the only begotten son and savior was worshipped by the Phrygians, who were regarded as one of the oldest races of Asia Minor. He was represented by them as a man tied to a tree, at the foot of which was a lamb, and, without doubt also as a man nailed to the tree, or stake, for we find lactantious making. Apollo of Miletus say that, he was a mortal according to the flesh, wise in miraculous works, but, being arrested by an armed force by command of the Chaldean judges, he suffered a death made bitter with nails and stakes, CCXVI and in Christianity before Christ Jackson relates. In the Attis festival a pine tree was felled on the 22nd of March and an effigy of the god was affixed to it, thus being slain and hanged on a tree. At night the priests found the tomb illuminated from within but empty, since on the third day Attis had arisen from the grave. CCXVI the drama or passion of Attis took place in what was to become Galatea, and it was the followers of Attis to whom Paul addressed his epistle to the Galatians at 3 colon 1, O foolish Galatians! Who has bewitched you? before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Since the Galatians presumably were not in Jerusalem when Christ was purportedly crucified, we may sensibly ask just who this was publicly portrayed as crucified before their eyes? This portrayal certainly suggests the recurring passion of the cult of Attis. Again, in addressing the Galatians, Paul brings up what is obviously a recurring event, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed be every one who hangs on a tree. Galen 3.13 As followers of Attis, the Edrises would understand the part about every one who hangs on a tree, since they, like other biblical peoples, annually or periodically hung a proxy or effigy of the god on a tree. As is the case in the Old Testament with ritualistic hangings, this cursing is in fact a blessing or consecration. Attis was popular not only in Phrygia Galatea but also in Rome, where he and Sibylle, the great mother of the gods, had a temple on Vatican Hill for six centuries. CCXVI so similar was the Attis myth to the Christian story that the Christians were forced to resort to their specious argument that the devil had created the Attis cult first to fool Christ's followers. Buddha Although most people think of Buddha as being one person who lived around 500 BCE, the character commonly portrayed as Buddha can also be demonstrated to be a compilation of godmen, legends and sayings of various holy men both preceding and succeeding the period attributed to the Buddha, Gautama Gautama, as was demonstrated by Robertson. Gautama was only one of a long series of Buddhas who arise at intervals and who all teach the same doctrine. The names of 24 of such Buddhas who appeared before Gautama have been recorded. It was held that after the death of each Buddha, his religion flourishes for a time and then decays. After it is forgotten, a new Buddha emerges and preaches the lost Dhamma, or truth. It seems quite probable in the light of these facts that any number of teachings attributed to the Buddha may have been in existence either before or at the time when Gautama was believed to have lived. The name Gautama is a common one, it is also full of mythological associations. There, was admittedly another Gautama known to the early Buddhists, who founded an order. So, what proof is there that the sayings and doings of different Gautamas may not have been ascribed to one person? CCXLX. Because of this non historicity and of the following characteristics of the Buddha myth, which are not widely known but which have their hoary roots in the mists of time, we can safely assume that Buddha is yet another personification of the ancient universal mythos being revealed herein. The Buddha character has the following in common with the Christ figure. Buddha was born on December 25 THCCL of the Virgin Maya, and his birth was attended by a star of announcement, CCLI wise menkli and angels singing heavenly songs. Kli at his birth, he was pronounced ruler of the world and presented with costly jewels and precious substances, cliv. His life was threatened by a king who was advised to destroy the child, as he was liable to overthrow him, CCLV. Buddha was of royal lineage. He taught in the temple at 12.CCLVI. 
He crushed a serpent's head, as was traditionally said of Jesus, and was tempted by Mara, the evil one, when fasting. Buddha was baptized in water, with the Spirit of God or Holy Ghost present. CCLVI. He performed miracles and wonders, healed the sick, fed 500 men from a small basket of cakes, and walked on water. Call the III. Buddha abolished idolatry, was a sower of the word, and preached the establishment of a kingdom of righteousness. Clicks. His followers were obliged to take vows of poverty and to renounce the world. CCLX. He was transfigured on a mount, when it was said that his face shone as the brightness of the sun and moon. CCLXI. In some traditions, he died on a cross. Kelsey He was resurrected, as his coverings were unrolled from his body and his tomb was opened by supernatural powers. Kelsey. Buddha ascended bodily to nirvana or heaven. He was called Lord, Master, the light of the world, God of gods, Father of the world, Almighty and all knowing ruler, Redeemer of all, Holy One, the author of happiness, possessor of all the Omnipotent, the Supreme Being, the Eternal One, Kulsiv. He was considered the Sin-Bearer, Good Shepherd, CCLXV the Carpenter, CCLXV the Infinite and Everlasting, KexVI and the Alpha and Omega, KexVIII. He came to fulfill, not destroy, the Lord. CCLX. Buddha is to return in the latter days to restore order and to judge the dead, CCLXX. In addition to the characteristics of the teaching Saviour God as outlined above, the Buddhistic influence in Christianity includes, renouncing the world and its riches, including sex and family, the brotherhood of man, the virtue of charity and turning the cheek, and conversion. That Buddhism preceded Christianity is undeniable, as is its influence in the world long prior to the beginning of the Christian era. As Walker relates, Established 500 years before Christianity and widely publicized throughout the Middle East, Buddhism exerted more influence on early Christianity than church fathers like to admit, since they viewed Oriental religions in general as devil worship. Stories of the Buddha and his many incarnations circulated incessantly throughout the ancient world, especially since Buddhist monks traveled to Egypt, Greece, and Asia Minor for centuries before Christ, to spread their doctrines. Many scholars have pointed out that the basic tenets of Christianity were basic tenets of Buddhism first, but it is also true that the ceremonies and trappings of both religions were more similar than either has wanted to acknowledge. CCXI as to Buddhistic influence in the specific area where the Christ drama purportedly took place, Larson states. Buddhist missionaries penetrated every portion of the then known world, including Greece, Egypt, Bactria, Asia Minor, and the Second Persian Empire. Palestine must have been permeated by Buddhist ideology during the first century. The literature of India proves that Jesus drew heavily upon Buddhism, directly or indirectly, to obtain not simply the content of his ethics, but the very form in which it was delivered. Both Gautama and Jesus found parable effective. CLXI indeed, it seems that a number of Jesus's parables were direct lifts from Buddhism, for example, that of the prodigal son. Kexii the existence of Buddhism in the Middle East during the Christian era is acknowledged by Christian apologists themselves, such as Cyril and Clement of Alexandria, who said the Samanians or Buddhists were priests of Persia. CKLXIV. Furthermore, a number of scholars have pushed back the origins of Buddhism many thousands of years prior to the alleged advent of Gautama Buddha. Albert Churchward also traces the Buddha myth originally to Egypt. The first Buddha was called Hermias, and can be traced back to Set of the Egyptians, he originated in the Stellar Cult. Later, however, the Solar Cult was carried to India, and the Buddha is there the representative of Parta of the Egyptians. Sakya Muni or Gautama, whose life and history were evolved from the pre-extant Mythas, the true Buddha, could become no more historical than the Christ of the Gnosis. If Buddhism could but explicate its own origins, it would become apparent that it is both natural and scientific, i.e. the old stellar cult of Egypt. But the blind attempt to make the Buddha historical in one person will place it ultimately at the bottom of a dark hole. CCLXXV. Higgins also evinced that true Buddhism is much more ancient than the legends of the Buddha, 
since in ancient Indian temples long predating the era of Gautama are depictions of the Buddha as a black man, not only in color but in feature. CCXVI in Higgins's opinion, Buddhism has been the most widespread religion on the planet, also found in England, where it was the religion of the Druids. He also states that the Hermes of Egypt, or Buddha, was well known to the ancient Canaanites, i.e., the people who preceded and in large part became the Israelites. Therefore, Buddhism was no doubt an early influence on Hebrew thought and religion. Dionys Bacchus Dionys or Bacchus is thought of as being Greek, but he is a remake of the Egyptian god Osiris, whose cult extended throughout a large part of the ancient world for thousands of years. Dionysus's religion was well developed in Thrace, northeast of Greece, and Phrygia, which became Galatea, where Attis also later reigned. Although Dionys is best remembered for the rowdy celebrations in his name, which was Latinized as Bacchus, he had many other functions and contributed several aspects to the Jesus character. Dionys was born of a virgin on December 25 Thekexvi and, as the holy child, was placed in a manager. He was a traveling teacher who performed miracles. He rode in a triumphal procession on an ass, kexviii. He was a sacred king killed and eaten in an Eucharistic ritual for fecundity and purification. Dionys rose from the dead on March 25th. He was the god of the vine, and turned water into wine. He was called king of kings and god of gods. He was considered the only begotten son, saviour, redeemer, sin-bearer, anointed one, and the alpha and omega, see Calexix. He was identified with the ram or lamb. CCLXXX. His sacrificial title of dendrites or young man of the tree intimates he was hung on a tree or crucified. CCXI. As Walker says, Dionysus was a prototype of Christ with a cult center at Jerusalem, where during the 1st century BCE he was worshipped by Jews, as noted. Dionysus Bacchus's symbol was IHS or IES, which became Isisus or Jesus. The IHS is used to this day in Catholic liturgy and iconography. As Roberts relates. IES, the Phoenician name of the god Bacchus or the sun personified, the etymological meaning of that title being, either one and is the fire or light, or taken as one word IES the one light. This is none other than the light of St. John's Gospel, and this name is to be found everywhere on Christian altars, both Protestant and Catholic thus clearly showing that the Christian religion is but a modification of oriental sun worship, attributed to Zoroaster. The same letters IHS, which are in the Greek text, are read by Christians J's, and the Roman Christian priesthood added the terminus us. And Larson states, Dionys became the universal saviour god of the ancient world. And there has never been another like unto him, the first to whom his attributes were accredited, we call Osiris, with the death of paganism, his central characteristics were assumed by Jesus Christ. CCXII. Like Jesus the Nazarene, Dionysus is the true vine, and the grape imagery is important to both cults. As Walker says, the grape vine was preeminently an incarnation of Dionysus, or Bacchus, in his role of sacrificial savior. His immolation was likened to the pruning of the vine, necessary to its seasonal rebirth. In Syria and Babylon the vine was a sacred tree of life. Old Testament writers adopted it as an emblem of the chosen people, and New Testament writers made it an emblem of Christ, John 15 1, 5. When accompanied by wheat sheaves in sacred art, the vine signified the blood, wine, and body, bread, of the Saviour, an iconography that began in paganism and was soon adopted by early Christianity. CCXII. On Crete, Dionysus was called Iasius, Sikekex of a title also of the godman of the Orphic Mysteries of Samothrace, who has been identified with Dionysus and who was promulgated by the Apostle Orpheus in his missionary work as he took the same route later purportedly travelled by Paul. Iasius, Iasius or Jason is in fact equivalent to Jesus. Hercules Heracles Heracles, or Hercules, is well known for his twelve labours, which correspond to the twelve signs of the zodiac and are demonstrations of his role as saviour. Born of a virgin, he was also known as the only begotten and universal word, CCLXXXV the virgin mother of Heracles Hercules was called Alcmene, 
whose name in Hebrew was Alma, the moon woman, who, as Walker says, mothered sacred kings in the Jerusalem cult, and whose title was bestowed upon the Virgin Mary. Parallels between earlier myths of Alcmene and later myths of Mary were too numerous to be coincidental. Alcmene's husband refrained from sexual relations with her until her God-begotten child was born. CCXVI Walker also recounts the story of Hercules and its relationship to the Christian tale. His twelve labors symbolized the sun's passage through the twelve houses of the zodiac. After his course was finished, he was clothed in the scarlet robe of the sacred king and killed, to be resurrected as his own divine father, to ascend to heaven. The influence of Heracles's cult on early Christianity can hardly be overestimated. St. Paul's hometown of Tarsus regularly re-enacted the sacred drama of Heracles's death by fire, which is why Paul assumed there was great saving virtue in giving one's body to be burned, like the Heracles martyrs, 1 Corinthians 13 3. Heracles was called Prince of Peace, Son of Righteousness, Light of the World. He was the same son greeted daily by the Persians and Essenes with the ritual phrase, He is risen. The same formula announced Jesus's return from the underworld, Mark 16 6. He was sacrificed at the spring equinox, Easter, the New Year festival by the old. Reckoning. He was born at the winter solstice, Christmas, when the sun reaches his nadir and the constellation of the Virgin rises in the east. As Albert the Great put it centuries later, the sign of the celestial Virgin rises above the horizon, at the moment we find fixed for the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ, CCXYI. Horus Osiris of Egypt The legends of Osiris Horus go back thousands of years, and many people over the millennia have thought Osiris to be a real person, some claiming he lived up to 22,000 years ago. The cult of Osiris, Isis and Horus was widespread in the ancient world, including in Rome. In the Egyptian myth, Horus and his once and future father, Osiris, are frequently interchangeable, as in I and my father are one. Concerning Osiris, Walker says, of all saviour gods worshipped at the beginning of the Christian era, Osiris may have contributed more details to the evolving Christ figure than any other. Already very old in Egypt, Osiris was identified with nearly every other Egyptian god and was on the way to absorbing them all. He had well over 200 divine names. He was called the Lord of Lords, King of Kings, God of Gods. He was the Resurrection and the Life, the Good Shepherd, Eternity and Everlastingness, the God who made men and women to be born again. Budge says, from first to last, Osiris was to the Egyptians the God-man who suffered, and died, and rose again, and reigned eternally in heaven. They believed that they would inherit eternal life, just as he had done. Osiris's coming was announced by three wise men, the three stars Mintika, Anilam, and Alnitak in the belt of Orion, which point directly to Osiris's star in the east, Sirius, Sotis. Significator of his birth Certainly Osiris was a prototypical messiah, as well as a devoured host. His flesh was Eaten in the form of communion cakes of wheat, the plant of truth. The cult of Osiris contributed a number of ideas and phrases to the Bible. The 23rd Psalm copied in Egyptian text appealing to Osiris the Good Shepherd to lead the deceased to the green pastures and still waters of the Nefenefa land, to restore the soul to the body, and to give protection in the valley of the shadow of death, the Tuat. The Lord's Prayer was prefigured by an Egyptian hymn to Osiris Amen beginning, O Amen, O Amen, who are in heaven. Amen was also invoked at the end of every prayer. CCXVI. As Colonel James Churchward naively exclaims, the teachings of Osiris and Jesus are wonderfully alike. Many passages are identically the same. Word for word, CKXXX Massey provides other details as to the similarity between Osirianism and Christianity. For instance, in one of the many titles of Osiris in all his forms and places he is called Osiris in the Monstrance. In the Roman ritual the Monstrance is a transparent vessel in which the host or victim is exhibited. Osiris in the Monstrance should of itself suffice to show that the Egyptian charist, KRST, 
is the original Christ, and that the Egyptian mysteries were continued by the Gnostics and Christianized in Rome. CCXC. Osiris was also the god of the vine and a great traveling teacher who civilized the world. He was the ruler and judge of the dead. In his passion, Osiris was plotted against and killed by Set and the Seventy-Two. Like that of Jesus, Osiris's resurrection served to provide hope to all that they may do likewise and become eternal. Osiris's son or renewed incarnation, Horus, shares the following in common with Jesus. Horus was born of the Virgin Isis Mary on December 25 in a cave manager with his birth being announced by a star in the east and attended by three wise men. His earthly father was named Seb, Joseph. He was of royal descent. CCXCI. At age 12, he was a child teacher in the temple, and at 30, he was baptized, having disappeared for 18 years. Horus was baptized in the river Eridanus or Irutana, Jordan, CCXCI by Anuk the Baptizer, John the Baptist, CCXCI who was decapitated. He had twelve disciples, two of whom were his witnesses and were named Anup and Ain, the two Johns. He performed miracles, exorcised demons and raised El Lazarus, El Osiris, from the dead. Horus walked on water. His personal epithet was Iusa, the ever-becoming son of Parta, the father, CCXCIV he was thus called Holy Child, CCXCV he delivered a sermon on the mount and his followers recounted the sayings of Iusa, CCXVI. Horus was transfigured on the mount. He was crucified between two thieves, buried for three days in a tomb, and resurrected. He was also the way, the truth, the light, Messiah, God's anointed son, the son of man, the good shepherd, the lamb of God, the word made flesh, the word of truth, etc. He was the fisher and was associated with the fish, itches, lamb and lion. He came to fulfill the law. CCXVI. Horus was called the KRSD, or Anointed One, CCXVI. Like Jesus, Horus was supposed to reign 1000 years, CCXCI furthermore. Inscribed about 3,500 years ago on the walls of the temple at Luxor were images of the Annunciation, Immaculate Conception, Birth and Adoration of Horus, with Thoth announcing to the Virgin Isis that she will conceive Horus, with Neph, the Holy Ghost, impregnating the Virgin, and with the infant being attended by three kings, or Magi, bearing gifts. In addition, in the catacombs at Rome are pictures of the baby Horus being held by the virgin mother Isis, the original Madonna and child. As Massey says, It was the Gnostic art that reproduced the Athemeri and Horus of Egypt as the virgin and child Christ of Rome. You poor idiotai, said the Gnostics, to the early Christians, you have mistaken the mysteries of old for modern history, and accepted literally all that was only meant mystically. CCC. Moreover, a churchward relates another aspect of the Egyptian religion found in Catholicism, we see in the ancient Catholic churches, over the main altar, an equilateral triangle, and within it an eye. The addition of the eye to the triangle originated in Egypt, the all-seeing eye of Osiris, Kai. Krishna of India The similarities between the Christian character and the Indian Messiah Krishna number in the hundreds, particularly when the early Christian texts now considered apocryphal are factored in. It should be noted that a common earlier English spelling of Krishna was Krishna, which reveals its relation to Christ. Also, in Bengali, Krishna is reputedly Christus, which is the same as the Greek for Christ and which the soldiers of Alexander the Great called Krishna. It should be further noted that, as with Jesus, Buddha and Osiris, Many people have believed and continue to believe in a historical Krishna. The following is a partial list of the correspondences between Jesus and Krishna. Krishna was born of the Virgin Devaki, Divine One, on December 25th. CCCI. His earthly father was a carpenter, CC who was off in the city paying tax while Krishna was born. CCCIV. His birth was signaled by a star in the east and attended by angels and shepherds at which time he was presented with spices. The heavenly hosts danced and sang at his birth. CCCV he was persecuted by a tyrant who ordered the slaughter of thousands of infants. 
Krishna was anointed on the head with oil by a woman whom he healed. CCCVI. He is depicted as having his foot on the head of a serpent. He worked miracles and wonders, raising the dead and healing lepers, the deaf and the blind. Krishna used parables to teach the people about charity and love, and he lived poor and he loved the poor, CCCVI. He castigated the clergy, charging them with ambition and hypocrisy. Tradition says he fell victim to their vengeance, CCCIII. Krishna's beloved disciple was Arjuna or Arjuan, John. He was transfigured in front of his disciples. He gave his disciples the ability to work miracles. CCCIX. His path was strewn with branches. CCCX. In some traditions, he died on a tree or was crucified between two thieves. Krishna was killed around the age of 30. CCCXI and the sun darkened at his death. CCCII. He rose from the dead and ascended to heaven in the sight of all men. CCCII. He was depicted on a cross with nail holes in his feet as well as having a heart emblem on his clothing. CCCXCI. Krishna is the lion of the tribe of Saki, CCCXV. He was called the shepherd god and considered the redeemer, firstborn, sin-bearer, liberator, universal word, CCCVI. He was deemed the son of God and our Lord and Savior, who came to earth to die for man's salvation. CCCVI. He was the second person of the Trinity. His disciples purportedly bestowed upon him the title Jesus, or Jesus, meaning pure essence, CCCVI. Krishna is to return to judge the dead, riding on a white horse, and to do battle with the prince of evil, who will desolate the earth. CCCX. The story of Krishna as recorded in the ancient Indian legends and texts penetrated the West on a number of occasions. One theory holds that Krishna worship made its way to Europe as early as 800 BCE, possibly brought by the Phoenicians. Higgins asserts that Krishna worship in Ireland goes back even further, and he points to much linguistic and archaeological evidence of this early migration. Krishna was re-injected into Western culture on several other occasions, including by Alexander the Great after the expansion of his empire and his sojourn in India. It is also claimed that his worship was reintroduced during the 1st century CE by Apollonius of Tyana, who carried a fresh copy of the Krishna story in writing to the West, where it made its way to Alexandria, Egypt. Graham relates the tale. The argument runs thus, there was in ancient India a very great sage called Deva Bodhisattva. Among other things he wrote a mythological account of Krishna, sometimes spelled Krishna. About 38 or 40 AD, Apollonius while traveling in the east found this story in Singapore. He considered it so important he translated it into his own language, namely, Samaritan. In this he made several changes according to his own understanding and philosophy. On his return he brought it to Anch, and there he died. Some thirty years later another Samaritan, Markion, found it. He too made a copy with still more changes. This he brought to Rome about 130 AD, where he translated it into Greek and Latin. CCCXX thus, we have the apparent origins of Martian's Gospel of the Lord, which he claimed was the Gospel of Paul. In addition to the Gospel story, the moralistic teachings purportedly introduced by Jesus were established long before by Krishna. These similarities constitute the reason why Christianity has failed, despite repeated. Efforts for centuries, to make headway in India, as the Brahmins have recognized Christianity as a relatively recent imitation of their much older traditions, which they have considered superior as well. Higgins relates. The learned Jesuit Baldias observes that every part of the life of Krishna, Krishna, has a near resemblance to the history of Christ, and he goes on to show that the time when the miracles are supposed to have been performed was during the Dwaprajag, which he admits to have ended 3,100 years before the Christian era. So that, as the Cantab says, if there is meaning in words, the Christian missionary admits that the history of Christ was founded upon that of Krishnu, Krishna, .cccxi. Mithra of Persia Mithramitra is a very ancient god found both in Persia and India and predating the Christian saviour by hundreds to thousands of years. 
In fact, the cult of Mithra was shortly before the Christian era the most popular and widely spread pagan religion of the times, as Wheeler says. Wheeler continues. Mithraism is one of the oldest religious systems on earth, as it dates from the dawn of history before the primitive Iranian race divided into sections which became Persian and Indian. When in 65-63 BC, the conquering armies of Pompeii were largely converted by its high precepts, they brought it with them into the Roman Empire. Mithraism spread with great rapidity throughout the empire, and it was adopted, patronized and protected by a number of the emperors up to the time of Constantine. CCCXI indeed, Mithraism represented the greatest challenge to Christianity, which won out by a hair over its competitor cult. Mithra has the following in common with the Christ character. Mithra was born of a virgin on December 25 in a cave, and his birth was attended by shepherds bearing gifts. He was considered a great traveling teacher and master. He had twelve companions or disciples. Mithra's followers were promised immortality. He performed miracles. As the great bull of the sun, Mithra sacrificed himself for world. Peace. CCCIII. He was buried in a tomb and after three days rose again. His resurrection was celebrated every year. He was called the Good Shepherd and identified with both the Lamb and the Lion. He was considered the Way, the Truth and the Light, and the Logos, Redeemer, Saviour and Messiah. His sacred day was Sunday, the Lord's Day, hundreds of years before the appearance of Christ. Mithra had his principal festival on what was later to become Easter. His religion had a Eucharist or Lord's Supper, at which Mithra said, He who shall not eat of my body nor drink of my blood so that he may be one with me and I with him, shall not be saved. CCCXI His annual sacrifice is the Passover of the Magi, a symbolical atonement or pledge of moral and physical regeneration. CCCXXV Furthermore, the Vatican itself is built upon the papacy of Mithra, and the Christian hierarchy is nearly identical to the Mithraic version it replaced. As Walker states, the cave of the Vatican belonged to Mithra until 376 AD, when a city prefect suppressed the cult of the rival saviour and seized the shrine in the name of Christ, on the very birthday of the pagan god, December 25. CCCXVI Walker also says, Christians copied many details of the Mithraic mystery religion, explaining the resemblance later with their favourite argument that the devil had anticipated the true faith by imitating it before Christ's birth. CCCXVI. Shmuel Golding states, in the book your church doesn't want you to read. Paul says, they drank from that spiritual rock and that rock was Christ, I call. 10 colon 4, these are identical words to those found in the Mithraic scriptures, except that the name Mithra is used instead of Christ. The Vatican Hill in Rome that is regarded as sacred to Peter, the Christian rock, was already sacred to Mithra. Many Mithraic remains have been found there. The merging of the worship of Attis into that of Mithra, then later into that of Jesus, was effected almost without interruption. CCCXVI In fact, the legendary home of Paul, Tarsus, was a site of Mithra worship. Of Mithraism, the Catholic Encyclopedia states, as related by Wheelis, the fathers conducted the worship. The chief of the fathers, a sort of pope, who always lived at Rome, was called Pater Patratus. The Mithraic Pope was also known as Papa and Pontimus Maximus. Virtually all of the elements of the Catholic ritual, from mitre to wafer to altar to doxology, are directly taken from earlier pagan mystery religions. As Taylor states, that popery has borrowed its principal ceremonies and doctrines from the rituals of paganism, is a fact which the most learned and orthodox of the established church have most strenuously maintained and most convincingly demonstrated. Prometheus of Greece. The Greek god Prometheus is said to have migrated from Egypt, but his drama traditionally took place in the Caucasus Mountains. Prometheus shares a number of striking similarities with the Christ character. Prometheus descended from heaven as God incarnate to save mankind. He had a especially professed friend, Petraeus, Peter, the fisherman, who deserted him. CCCXIX. He was crucified, suffered and rose from the dead. He was called the Logos or Word. Quetzalcoatl of Mexico. 
Modern scientific orthodoxy allows neither for the date provided by graves, i.e., that the Mexican Quetzalcoatl originated in the 6th century BCE, nor for pre-Columbian contact between the Old and New Worlds. The evidence, however, reveals that the Mythos was indeed in Mexico long before the Christian era, suggesting such contact between the worlds. In fact, tradition holds that the ancient Phoenicians, expert navigators, knew about the lost land to the west. One would therefore not be surprised to discover that the stories of the New World were contained in ancient libraries prior to the Christian era, such as at Alexandria, as was averred by graves.cccxxx however it got there, there can be no doubt as to the tremendous similarity between the Mexican religion and Catholicism. As Doan remarks, For ages before the landing of Columbus on its shores, the inhabitants of ancient Mexico worshipped a saviour, as they called him, Quetzalcoatl who was born of a pure virgin. A messenger from heaven announced to his mother that she should bear a son without connection with man. Lord Kingsborough tells us that the Annunciation of the Virgin Soquiquetzal, mother of Quetzalcoatl, who was styled the Queen of Heaven, was the subject of a Mexican hieroglyph.cccxi. Quetzalcoatl was also designated the Morning Star, was tempted and fasted for forty days, and was consumed in a Eucharist using a proxy, named after Quetzalcoatl. As Walker says, This devoured saviour, closely watched by his ten or twelve guards, embodied the god Quetzalcoatl, who was born of a virgin, slain in atonement for primal sin, and whose second coming was confidently expected. He was often represented as a trinity signified by three crosses, a large one between the smaller ones. Father Acosta naively said, it is strange that the devil after his manner hath brought a trinity into idolatry. His church found it all too familiar, and long kept his book as one of its secrets. CCCXI. The Mexicans revered the cross and baptized their children in a ritual of regeneration and rebirth long before the Christian contact. CCCXI in one of the few existing codices is an image of the Mexican savior bending under the weight of a burdensome cross in exactly the same manner in which Jesus is depicted. The Mexican crucifix depicted a man with nail holes in feet and hands, the Mexican Christ and Redeemer who died for man's sins. In one crucifix image, this saviour was covered with sons.cccxi furthermore, the Mexicans had monasteries and nunneries, and called their high priests papes. CCCXXXV The Mexican saviour and rituals were so disturbingly similar to the Christianity of the conquering Spaniards that Cortés was forced to use the standard, specious complaint that the devil had positively taught to the Mexicans the same things which God had taught to Christum. CCCXV The Spaniards were also compelled to destroy as much of the evidence as was possible, burning books and defacing and wrecking temples, monuments and other artifacts. Serapis of Egypt Another god whose story was very similar to that of Christ, the evidence of which was also destroyed, was the Egyptian god Serapis or Serapis, who was called the Good Shepherd and considered a healer. Walker says of Serapis. Syncretic god worshipped as a supreme deity in Egypt to the end of the 4th century AD. The highly popular cult of Serapis used many trappings that were later adopted by Christians, chants, lights, bells, vestments, processions, music. Serapis represented a final transformation of the saviour Osiris into a monotheistic figure, virtually identical to the Christian god. This Ptolemaic god was a combination of Osiris and Apis. As Christ was a sacrificial lamb, so Serapis was a sacrificial bull as well as god in human form. He was annually sacrificed in atonement for the sins of Egypt. CCCXY as we have seen, the image of Serapis, which once stood tall in the Serapian Serapium at Alexandria, was adopted by the later Christians as the image of Jesus, and the cult of Serapis was considered that of the original Christians. As Albert Church Ward states, The catacombs of Rome are crowded with illustrations that were reproduced as Egyptonostic tenets, doctrines, and dogmas which had served to Persian, Greek, Roman, and due as evidence of the non-historic origins of Christianity. In the transition from the old Egyptian religion to the new cult of Christianity there was no factor of profounder importance than the worship of Serapis. As the Emperor Hadrian relates, in his letter to Servianus, 
those who worship Serapis are likewise Christians, even those who style themselves the bishops of Christ are devoted to Serapis, CCCXVI. Zoroaster Zarathustra As they do concerning the founders of other religions and sects, many people have believed that Zoroaster was a single, real person who spread the Persian religion around 660 BCE. However, Zoroastrianism is asserted to have existed 10,000 years ago, and there have been at least seven Zoroasters recorded by different historians, CCCXX. Thus, it is clear that Zoroaster is not a single person but another rendering of the ubiquitous mythos with a different ethnicity and flavor. Zoroaster's name means son of a star, a common mythical epithet, which Jokoliat states is the Persian version of the more ancient Indian Zuryastara, who restored the worship of the sun, from which comes this name of Zoroaster, which is itself but a title assigned to a political and religious legislator. Zoroaster has the following in common with the Christ character. Zoroaster was born of a virgin and immaculate conception by a ray of divine reason, CCCXL. He was baptized in a river. In his youth he astounded wise men with his wisdom. He was tempted in the wilderness by the devil. He began his ministry at age 30. Zoroaster baptized with water, fire and holy wind. He cast out demons and restored the sight to a blind man. He taught about heaven and hell, and revealed mysteries, including resurrection, judgment, salvation and the apocalypse.cccxl. He had a sacred cup or grail. He was slain. His religion had a Eucharist. He was the Word made flesh. Zoroaster's followers expect a second coming in the virgin born Saoshiant or Saviour, who is to come in 2341 CE and begin his ministry at age 30, ushering in a golden age. That Zoroastrianism permeated the Middle East prior to the Christian era is a well known fact. As Mazdaism and Mithraism, it was a religion that went back centuries before the purported time of the historical Zoroaster. Its influence on Judaism and Christianity is unmistakable. When John the Baptist declared that he could baptize with water but that after him would come one who would baptize with fire and with Holy Ghost, he was uttering words which came directly from the heart of Zoroastrianism. I. Zoroaster considered nomads to be evil and agriculturalists good, and viewed Persia, or Iran, to be the Holy Land. Like his Christian missionary counterparts, he believed that the devil, Angra Mainyu or Araman, sowed false religions, which his followers later claimed to be Judaism, Christianity, Manichaeism, and Islam. Islam.ccslii and, like its offspring Yahwism, Zoroastrianism was monotheistic and forbade images or idols of God, who was called in Zoroastrianism or Muzd or Ahura Mazda. Thus, religious intolerance may also be traced to its doctrines. Larson relates the influence of Zoroastrianism on Christianity. Among the basic elements which the synoptics obtained from Zoroastrianism we may mention the following, the intensely personal and vivid concepts of hell and heaven, the use of water for baptism and spiritual purification, the saviour born of a true virgin mother, the belief in demons who make human beings impure and who must be exorcised, the messiah of moral justice, the universal judgment, based upon good and evil works, the personal immortality and the single life of every human soul, the apocalyptic vision and prophecy, and the final tribulation before the parousia. In addition, Paul, Revelation, and the fourth gospel drew heavily upon Zoroastrianism for elements which are absent from the synoptics, example, the doctrine of absolute metaphysical dualism, the logos concept, transformation into celestial spirits, the millennial kingdom, Armageddon, the final conflagration, the defeat of Satan, the renovation of the universe, and the celestial city to be lowered from the supreme heaven to the earth. CCCX Live. As Wheeler states, all these divine and revealed doctrines of the Christian faith we have seen to be originally heathen Zoroastrian mythology, taken over first by the Jews, then boldly plagiarized by the ex pagan Christians. CCCXLV. Other saviors and sons of God. Many of the other sons of God, and several daughters of God and goddesses such as Diana Sotera as well, share numerous aspects with the Christian Saviour, such as the following notable examples. 
The Arabian Issa purportedly lived around 400 BCE in the Western Arabian region of Hejaz, where also existed places called Galilee, Bethsaida and Nazareth, a town that was not founded in Palestine until after Jesus of Nazareth's alleged era. The similarities between the Arabian Issa and the Palestinian Jesus are many and profound. Asclepius is the great healing god of the Greeks who had long, curly hair, wore robes and did miracles, including raising the dead. Of Asclepius, Dujardin relates. The word Sota has not only the meaning of saviour, but also of healer, it is the title given to Aesculapius. It is interesting to realize that the same men who carried to the world the revolutionary message of salvation by union with the God were at the same time an organized group of healers, who day by day earned their living by the practice of healing. CCCXLV. It has also been demonstrated that the Orphic religion is similar to Christianity. In Jesus Christ, Son of God, David Fidela relates of the Greek hero god Orpheus. Orphism promulgated the idea of eternal life, a concept of original sin and purification, the punishment of the wicked in the afterlife, and the allegorical interpretation of myth, which the early church fathers applied to the Christian scriptures. Orpheus was known as the Good Shepherd, and Jesus was frequently represented as Orpheus, playing music and surrounded by animals, a symbol of the peaceable kingdom or golden age, representing the ever-present harmony of the logos. Like Orpheus, Jesus descended to hell as a saviour of souls. CCCXLVI. Indeed, as Werner Keller relates. In Berlin there is a small amulet with a crucified person, the seven sisters and the moon which bears the inscription Orpheus Bacchicos. It has a surprisingly Christian appearance. The same can be said of a representation of the hanging masses in the Capitoline Museum in Rome. CCCIII. Conclusion it is evident that Jesus Christ is a mythical character based on these various ubiquitous godmen and universal saviors who were part of the ancient world for thousands of years prior to the Christian era. As Massey says, The same legend was repeated in many lands with a change of name, and at times of sex, for the sufferer, but none of the initiated in the esoteric wisdom ever looked upon the Kamaiti Ayusa, a Gnostic Horus, Jesus, Tamas, Krishna, Buddha Watoba or any other of the many saviors as historic in personality for the simple reason that they had been more truly taught. CCCX looks. The existence and identity of all these mysterious characters who are so identical in their persona and exploits, constituting the universal mythos, have been hidden from the masses as part of the Christ conspiracy. 10. Astrology and the Bible. For everything there is a season, and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born, and a time to die, a time to plant, and time to pluck up what is planted. Ecclesiastes 3 1-2 The Christian religion was thus founded upon the numerous gods, goddesses, religions, sects, cults and mystery schools that thrived around the globe prior to the Christian era, even in the Hebrew world, where the Israelites worshipped numerous gods, including the sun, the moon, and the stars and all the host of heaven. In order to determine the framework upon which the Christian conspirators hung their myths, in fact, we will need to turn to that ancient body of knowledge which in almost every culture has been considered sacred and which the priests have wished to keep to themselves, the science of astrology. The Christian masses, of course, are repeatedly taught to reject all forms of astrology or stargazing as the work of the devil, and any number of biblical texts are held up to assert that astrology is an evil to be avoided at all costs. This animosity towards studying the heavenly bodies and their interrelationships is in reality propaganda designed to prevent people from finding out the truth about the Bible, which is that it is loaded with astrological imagery, as evidenced by the fact that the Hebrew gods were in large part celestial bodies. The Bible is, in actuality, basically an astrotheological text, a reflection of what has been occurring in the heavens for millennia localized and historicized on earth. This fact is further confirmed by numerous biblical passages concerning the influences of the heavenly bodies, but it also becomes clear through exegesis of the texts from an informed perspective. Although the Catholic Church has feverishly discouraged stargazing by its flock, so frightened in fact were the people of the Church's wrath in regard to astrology that sailors would not look up at the stars, 
a habit crucial to their occupation, the truth is that the church has been a long-time practitioner of astrology. Many of the church hierarchy have not only looked to the stars but have been regular, secret adepts of the same magical arts widely practiced by pagans. But publicly condemned by Christians, CCCL and it would be safe to assume that this practice continues to this day behind the scenes. Numerous churches and cathedrals, such as Notre Dame in Paris, have abundant astrological symbols, full zodiacs, etc. In the 19th century the papal throne, St. Peter's chair, was cleaned, only to reveal upon it the twelve labors of Hercules, CCCLI who, as we have seen, was a sun god. As Walker states, Astrology survives in our own culture because Christianity embraced it with one hand, while condemning it as a devilish art with the other. Church fathers like Augustine, Jerome, Eusebius, Chrysostom, Lactantius, and Ambrose all anathematized astrology, and the Great Council of Toledo prohibited it for all time. Nevertheless, six centuries later the consistory and the dates of Pope's coronations were determined by the zodiac, aristocratic prelates employed their own personal astrologers, and signs of the zodiac appeared all over church furnishings, tiles, doorways, manuscripts, and baptismal fonts. The traditional twelve days of Christmas were celebrated by taking astrological omens each day for the corresponding months of the coming year. CCCLII. Despite its outward vilification by the clergy, astrology has also been used by countless kings and heads of state privy to the astrological, as opposed to literal, nature of the Bible. Not being thus privy, biblical literalists claim that everything in the Bible occurred literally and factually upon the earth, including the talking snake, Noah's Ark, the parting of the Red Sea, the raising of the dead and numerous other incredible miracles that apparently occurred only to the biblical people at that time in that part of the world. The miraculous and implausible exploits of other cultures, however, are to be tossed aside as being unhistorical, mythological and downright ridiculous. As we have seen and will continue to see, these other cultures had the identical stories as those found in the Bible, therefore, following the logic of biblical proponents, we should also toss out the Judeo-Christian versions as merely mythological and allegorical at best, and diabolical at worst. As history, these various biblical tales are no more factual than the stories of the Greek gods or the Arabian Nights. As allegory, however, they record an ancient wisdom that goes back well beyond the founding of the Hebrew nation, into the deepest mists of time. In ascertaining the astrology of the Bible we should first properly define the word astrology. Although many people think astrology is meaningless mumbo. Jumbo, it is not merely casting horoscopes but is in fact a science, as astrology means the study of the celestial bodies, astronomy, and their influences on each other and on life on earth. The only difference between the well-respected astronomy and the vilified astrology is that astronomy charts the movements and constitution of the celestial bodies, while astrology attempts to determine their interrelationships and meaning. The sacred science of astrology began with astronomy, when humans noticed that they could determine some regularity in life by observing the skies and heavenly bodies, both nighttime and daytime. They could thus predict the seasons, including the time of planting and harvest, as well as the annual flooding of the Nile, for example. They also noticed the sun's effects on plants, as well as the moon's waxing and waning and effect on the tides. The knowledge of the heavens was also essential in seafaring, as stated, and a variety of ancient peoples were extraordinary seafarers for millennia, an impossible feat. Without a precise and detailed knowledge of the heavens, which in turn was not possible without the understanding that the earth was round and revolved around the sun, crucial information suppressed by the conspirators, to be seemingly rediscovered late in history. Such information, however, has always been known by those behind the scenes. Thus, in reading the stars, humans could make sense of the universe and find lessons applicable to daily life. Higgins explains. Among all the ancient nations of the world, the opinion was universal that the planetary bodies were the disposers of the affairs of men. Christians who believe in transubstantiation, and that their priests have an unlimited power to forgive sins, may affect to despise those who have held that opinion, but their contempt is not becoming, it is absurd. 
It was thought that the future fortunes of every man might be known, from a proper consideration of the state of the planets at the moment of his birth. This produced the utmost exertion of human ingenuity to discover the exact length of the periods of the planetary motions, that is, in other words, to perfect the science of astronomy. In the course of the proceedings it was discovered, or believed to be discovered, that the motions of the planets were liable to certain aberrations, which it was thought would bring on ruin to the whole system, at some future day. Clesii. As time went on, this science became increasingly complicated, as the infinite stars were factored in and as the heavens changed. Recognizing the interaction between the planetary bodies and their influence on Earth, the ancients began to give the heavens shape and form, persona and attitude. In order to pass along this detailed information, which was, and continues to be, so important to all aspects of life, the ancients personified the heavenly bodies and wove stories about their exploits, giving them unique personalities and temperaments that reflected their particular movements and other qualities, such as color and size. These stories were passed down over the many millennia basically by a priesthood, because they were esteemed for their sacred astronomical, astrological and mathematical value. As Higgins says, astrology was so connected with religion that it was impossible to separate them, CCCLIV these celestial movements and all the revered stories about them were recorded in stone all over the world, in great monuments and in city layouts. These monuments constitute much of our proof that the ancients possessed this amazingly intricate knowledge, but we can also find enormous evidence of it in the legends and writings of the ancients, including the Judeo-Christian Bible, which is rife with symbolism and allegory. Those individuals who believe the Bible to be the literal word of God are not only unaware of its symbolism, they are also ignorant of the passages within the Bible itself which clearly reflect that at least certain aspects of the biblical tales are. Allegory. For example, at Ezekiel 23, the authors tells a long story about two sisters, Ohola and Oholiba, and their faithless harlotry when their breasts were pressed and their virgin bosoms handled. Just as we get to the good stuff, Ezekiel springs it on us that he is speaking allegorically about the cities of Samaria and Jerusalem, which are accused of having played harlot in Egypt, in other words, they worshipped other gods. It is rather evident that Ezekiel is enjoying this sexual allegory, as he goes into gleeful detail about the transgressions of the sisters and their nakedness and bed of love. It is also evident that this type of allegorical speech is used more often in the Bible than its writers and proponents would wish to admit. As in the lusty Ezekiel tale, a number of other biblical places, nations and tribes are frequently referred to allegorically as he or she, which makes it difficult to figure out whether the speaker is talking about a person, group, place or thing. The Christian cheerleader Paul also knew that there was allegory in the Bible. As he so stated at Galatians 4 22-5, in reference to the story of Abraham having sons by two women. As to these women, who we are led in the Old Testament to believe are real, historical characters, Paul clarifies what they actually represent. Now this is allegory, these two women are two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai, bearing children for slavery, she is Hagar. Now Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. She corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. Thus, again, we discover that biblical characters are not actual persons but allegory for places. We also discover that certain places are allegory for other places. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city which is allegorically called Sodom and Egypt, where their Lord was crucified. Rev. 11.8 of course, this fact is hidden by some translators, who render the word allegorically as spiritually. Other early Christians also knew about the allegorical nature of the Bible, but their later counterparts began in earnest the profitable push for utter historicization, obliterating millennia of human study and knowledge, and propelling the Western world into an appalling dark age. Saint Athanasius, bishop and patriarch of Alexandria, was not only aware of the allegorical nature of biblical texts, but he admonishes us that should we understand sacred writ according to the letter, we should fall into the most enormous blasphemies, cccLV in other words, it is a sin to take the Bible literally. Christian Father Origen, called the most accomplished biblical scholar of the early church, admitted the allegorical and esoteric nature of the Bible, 
the scriptures were of little use to those who understood them literally, as they are. Written, CCCLVI St. Augustine, along with Origen, was forceful in his pronouncement of Genesis as allegory. There is no way of preserving the literal sense of the first chapter of Genesis, without impiety, and attributing things to God unworthy of him. Thus, it is understood that there is allegory and symbolism in the Bible. What is also understood is that, despite protestations to the contrary, the stars, sun and moon are described and utilized repeatedly within an allegorical or astrological context by biblical writers. In fact, in examining biblical texts closely, we further discover that various places and persons, portrayed as actual, historical entities, are in fact allegory for the heavens and planetary bodies. In reality, virtually all Hebrew place names have astronomical meanings. CCCLVI so prevalent is this custom of creating as above, so below, it is obvious that the chosen were as enchanted with the heavens as their adversaries and neighbors, such as the Chaldeans, master astrologers jealously reviled by their Hebrew counterparts. Contrary to popular belief, the reverence displayed by other peoples for God's heavens is also exhibited by the Israelites, whose very name, as we have seen, is astrotheological. Indeed, from the very beginning, the biblical people were encouraged to study the stars and signs in the heavens, as at Genesis 1:14, which basically describes the zodiac. And God, Elohim, said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs, and for seasons, and for days, and years. Despite the negative comments and exhortations found in the Bible against astrology, stargazing, soothsaying and divination, we discover various passages that clearly refer to these magical arts and their objects of reverence with fondness. In fact, at several points the heavens are personified and appear as wondrous characters whose praises are sung by biblical characters, in precisely the same manner as their pagan counterparts. The authors of Job is one such character, and it is in this book we find unambiguous references to astrology. In Job, the Lord personifies the morning stars, the sons of God, and has them joyfully crying out. In trying to make Job feel small and obey him, the Lord presents a list of his own godly attributes, including the ability to command the happy heavens. Can you bind the chains of the Pleiades, or loose the cords of Orion? Can you lead forth the Moseroth in their season, or can you guide the bear with its children? Do you know the ordinances of the heavens? Can you establish their rule on the earth? Job 38 31-33. The Moseroth is, in fact, the zodiac. Orion is a prominent player on the cosmic stage, as is the bear. The Pleiades, or Seven Sisters, have been since very ancient times elements of many mythologies and astrotheologies, including the Egyptian, Babylonian, Indian, Greek and Mexican. The presentation of the Seven Sisters as judges is a common theme, and it was thought at times that they required sacrifice as propitiation. The Pleiades factor into Judaism more than is admitted, as some of the numerous sevens mentioned throughout the Bible refer to these sisters, as Walker relates. The Pleiades were probably represented in pre-patriarchal Jerusalem by the holy menorah, seven-branched candlestick, symbolizing the sevenfold menhori or moon priestesses, as shown by its female genital decorations, lilies and almonds, Exodus 2533.ccci. After the patriarchy took over, it would seem, the menorah came to represent only the sun, moon and five inner planets, as will be seen. Also in Job, a book replete with celestial imagery, the author portrays the Lord as he who described a circle upon the face of the waters at the boundary between light and darkness. The pillars of heaven tremble, his hand pierced the fleeing serpent. In mythology the heavens are depicted as an abyss of waters, so this scripture is referenced to the zodiacal circle, described or drawn by God. The boundary between light and darkness is, naturally, the horizon, and the trembling pillars of heaven are the same held up by Samson, the bright Sunday. In addition, his hand piercing the fleeing serpent could refer to the Egyptian god Set Seth, the constellation of serpents, or the sky itself, however, 
This last part could also be translated as the crooked serpent who does not flee but is formed by the Lord's hand, representing Scorpio. Of this mysterious and clearly astrological work attributed to Job, Anderson says, the whole book is a complete description of the Masonic ceremonies or Egyptian masonry, or trial of the dead by Osiris, CCCLI in Psalms 19. We hear about the heavens telling the glory of God, there is no speech, nor are there words, their voice is not heard, yet their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. To the uninitiated, this sounds strange, how can the heavens tell the glory of God? And how do their voice and words go out to the end of the world without speech or words? The word for voice in the Hebrew is properly translated as line. This line or lines are the cosmic rays coming off the various planetary bodies, lines that were perceived by the ancients to penetrate the earth as well, a perception that caused them to be anxious about establishing the kingdom of heaven on earth by emulating what was happening in the heavens. Anderson explains the importance of the lines or rays. Among the Eastern nations it was taught that all spiritual life first came from the sun, and its magnetic descent to the earth, becoming earthbound, or dwelling in the earth, and after passing through a series of evolutions, and different births and changes from the mineral, vegetable, and animal kingdoms, ascending or descending the scale, like Jacob's angels, according to the good or evil magnetic rays at its births and its various probationary existences, at last purified and intellectually refined, and master of itself, the pure ra, or astral body, at last was drawn back into the bosom of the Father, Son, from whence it was first originated. CCCLX. Thus, astrology, or astrologos in the Greek, has been considered the word of God, as is evidenced by the biblical singing stars and heavens passing along their voice and words through the earth. The Psalms passage continues, In, the heavens, he has set a tent for the sun. This tent or tabernacle represents a holy sanctuary or house of worship, thus, the heavens are truly the temple of the sun, as well as of the other celestial bodies. This heavenly temple was, however, continuously recreated all over the planet, as continues to this day, unbeknownst to the masses. At Job 9, it is explicit that God is the divine architect of the zodiac who made the bear and Orion, the Pleiades and the chambers of the south. And again at Amos 5:8, he who made the Pleiades and Orion, and turns deep darkness into the morning and darkens the day into night. The Lord builds his upper chambers in the heavens and founds vaults upon the earth. Amos 9:6, and he is praised for his astrological creation, thou hast made the moon to mark the seasons, the sun to know its time. Like the Lord himself, his creations such as the sun, Moon and skies are considered righteous and eternal, as is reflected at Psalms 89:37 and at Daniel 12:3. Thus, the heavenly bodies served as sacred symbols and representatives of God. From these various biblical passages, it is obvious that the Lord is not only the architect of the heavens but is pleased with both his stellar creations and his ability to command them. That being the case, it is equally obvious that astrology is not evil, unless the Lord is evil an idea widely subscribed to by the Gnostics, who made the assessment that anyone in charge of this chaotic and crude lower world must be a villain. But, if God is good, then his creation must be good, and the biblical writers make it clear that astrology and the zodiac are their Lord's creation. That the stars, moon and sun were considered to have personality is also explicit from biblical texts. Early church father Origen opined, and was ridiculed by heretics and heathens for his opinion, that all the stars and heavenly bodies are living, rational beings, having souls, and he quotes Isaiah 14:12 in his proof of this, saying that the Lord has given commandments to all the stars, cccLx at Psalms 147:4, the stars have names, given to them by the Lord. That biblical writers were aware of the constellations is also clear from Isaiah 13:10 for the stars of the heavens and their constellations will not give their light. The fact that the Hebrews believed the sun and moon had personality and animation is further reflected at Isaiah 24:23. then the moon will be confounded, and the sun ashamed. The sun and moon are again anthropomorphized or personified at Psalms 148:3, when they are asked to praise the Lord. The importance of the skies is repeatedly emphasized throughout the Old. 
Testament, with the sun and moon even considered the rulers of the day and night, made out of the Lord's steadfast love, P.S. 136.9. In the Song of Solomon, an embarrassment to God-fearing Christians for its overt sexuality, Solomon uses celestial imagery to describe his beloved, who is this that looks forth like the dawn, fair as the moon, bright as the sun. Sol 6.10, the sun and moon are also considered to be healing, as is reflected at Isaiah 30 26, in which the light of the sun and moon increase in the day when the Lord binds up the hurt of his people, and heals the wounds inflicted by his blow. And this from a loving God. Furthermore, the arts of medicine and astrology were inextricably linked, because medicines were frequently dispensed not only based upon symptoms but also on natal charts and other astrological castings, hence, physicians or doctors were also astrologers, as well as priests and prophets. As Allegro says, To know the correct dosages in these cases required an appreciation of the susceptibility of the patient to the drug's effects, perhaps the most difficult calculation of all. Much depended on the recipient's fate allotted him at his birth, the factor that determined his individuality, his physical stature, the color of his eyes, and so on. Only the astrologer could tell this, so the art of medicine was itself dependent for success on astrology and the considerable astronomical knowledge this presupposed. The combined arts of medicine and astrology were known and practiced by the Sumerians and their Mesopotamian successors, as we know from their cuneiform records as well as the repute they enjoyed in this respect in the ancient world. These traits of character and bodily constitution could be determined by astrological means, so the early doctors were also astrologers. The early doctor was also a prophet, a prognosticator. The arts of healing and religion were inseparable. CCCI. Biblical sun and moon worshippers. Thus, we can see that astrology is not at all evil but a sacred science, as acknowledged abundantly by biblical writers. In fact, as noted, the polytheistic Hebrews and Israelites worshipped a variety of Elohim, Balaam and Adonai, many of which were aspects of the sun, such as El Elyon, the Most High God. In addition, at Amos 5.26 is a verse concerning the mysterious Kaiwan, the star god of the house of Israel. This star god is El, the sun, or Saturn, the central sun, whom, as stated, the Hebrews worshipped, as reflected by their Sabbath on Saturday. As also noted, Yahweh, or Iao, was likewise a sun god. Furthermore, we have already seen that Solomon, for one, worshipped in the manner of the pre yahwist cultures, revering Chemosh, the Moabite sun god, for example. The Hebrews were also moon worshippers in that many of their feasts and holidays revolved around the movements and phases of the moon. Such moon worship is found repeatedly in the Old Testament, P.S. 813, 104,19, is 66,23, and to this day Jews celebrate holidays based on the lunar calendar. At Isaiah 47, these moon worshippers are equated with astrologers, i.e., those who divide the heavens, who gaze at the stars, who at the new moons predict what shall befall you. The Jewish nighttime worship is also reflected in the non-canonical epistle to Diognetus, an early Christian writing which further demonstrates that astrology was important to Christians, as, while the author obviously does not like the way in which the Jews are consulting the heavens, he does consider the cycle of the seasons to be divinely appointed. As for the way, the Jews scrutinized the moon and stars for the purpose of ritually commemorating months and days, and chop up the divinely appointed cycle of the seasons to suit their own fancies, pronouncing some to be times for feasting and others for mourning. As we can see, the Hebrews Israelites, like the other peoples around the world, revered a number of aspects of the heavens, both the night sky and the day. Also clear from biblical texts is that the Hebrew people were constantly confused as to who the Lord really was and what he wanted from his chosen, as they are endlessly being bounced to and fro in their reverence for the heavens. In fact, as is written in the book of Jasher, which is given scriptural authority at Joshua 10.13 and 2 Samuel 1.18 but which was suppressed in large part because of its obvious astrological imagery, Abraham's father Tower had twelve gods of large size, made of wood and stone, after the twelve months of the year, and he served each one monthly, Jas 9.8.
Abram himself is also represented as first worshipping the sun, until it set, and then the moon, and Abram served the sun in that day and he prayed. To it, and Abram served the moon and prayed to it all that night, 9.14-17. Abram eventually realizes that these are not gods that made the earth and mankind but the servants of God. This epiphany is no great thing, actually, as the intelligentsia of virtually all cultures viewed the planetary bodies as divine proxies or limbs of the Almighty itself. Abraham then goes on to destroy his father's gods, yet the Hebrews did not give up their astrotheology, which was, in fact, what the Hebrews Israelites were constantly whoring after. As noted, by the time of reformer King Josiah, the kings of Judah reportedly erred terribly when they established the worship of the heavens, even though their predecessors were applauded for doing the same. And he deposed the idolatrous priests whom the kings of Judah had ordained to burn incense in the high places at the cities of Judah and round about Jerusalem, those also who burned incense to Baal, to the sun, and the moon, and the constellations, and all the host of heavens. 2 Kings 23 5 these kings of Judah were sun worshippers, as is made clear at 2 Kings 23:11, when Josiah removed the horses that the kings of Judah had dedicated to the sun. It is evident that there are a number of characters or factions in the OT depicting themselves as the Lord, since in one book, the heavens are to be praised as creations of the Almighty Himself, but, in another, to do so is considered idolatrous. On the contradictions within the Judeo-Christian scriptures, eminent freethinker Robert Ingersoll commented, if a man would follow, today, the teachings of the Old Testament, he would be a criminal. If he would strictly follow the teachings of the New, he would be insane. Ezekiel. Likewise, if he were to attempt to make literal the enigmatic passages in Ezekiel, he might go mad. Ezekiel, in fact, provides an interesting testimonial to the practice of polytheism and astrology by the Hebrews Jews as in a vision he is given by Yahweh a tour of Israel's abominations that includes a trip into the Jerusalem temple's inner court that faces north, where was the seat of the image of jealousy, which provokes to jealousy. The image of jealousy, of course, is Yahweh, el Kana, the jealous God, however, it seems that the living God was even jealous of his own image, apparently considering it an idol. Next, Ezekiel is shown a hole in the north court wall, which he excavates to find a door. And, God, said to me, go in, and see the vile abominations that they are committing here. So I went in and saw, and there, portrayed upon the wall roundabout, were all kinds of creeping things, and loathsome beasts, and all the idols of the house of Israel. And before them stood seventy men of the elders of the house of Israel, with Jazaniah the son of Shophan standing among them. Each had his censer in his hand, and the smoke of the cloud of incense went up. Then he said to me, Son of man, have you seen what the elders of the house of Israel are doing in the dark, every man in his room of pictures? For they say, The Lord does not see us, the Lord has forsaken the land. He said also to me, You will see even greater abominations which they commit. Thus we find the elders of Israel performing in the hidden chamber of the temple their secret, esoteric religion, which was basically astrological. This Shophan, father of Jazaniah, evidently and ironically was the scribe of Hilkiah, the Zadokite priest who purportedly found the law that caused Josiah to go berserk and destroy the other gods and high places. It should also be noted that Elkanah's inner court to the north was reserved only for the Zadokite priesthood, which became the Sadducees. Ezekiel then goes on to describe the Hebrew women at the entrance of the temple's north gate who were weeping for Tammuz, the Syrian Samaritan saviour fertility sun god who annually died and was resurrected. Ezekiel is next shown between the porch and the altar of the temple of the Lord some twenty-five men, with their backs to the temple of the Lord, and their faces toward the east, worshipping the sun to the east. Such were the abominations of the house of Israel, for which the jealous zealous God commanded a group of Yahwist thugs to slaughter the Hebrews, smiting old men outright, young men and maidens, little children and women, who were not worshipping properly, according to the Yahwist bias. Consequently, El Elkanah, the jealous zealous God, orders the extermination of Jews and Hebrews who were worshipping other Elohim, as their fathers had before them. Despite the Lord's purported hatred of these abominations, 
He then goes on to show Ezekiel the zodiacal circle, the celebrated wheel within a wheel, about which so much tortured speculation has been put forth, including the latest that the wheel represents a spaceship. Unfortunately for the exfils, Ezekiel's allegories, and he is commanded by the Lord to speak in allegory, 17 colon 1 2, 24 colon 3, are a bit less mysterious, as the wheel is nothing more cryptic than the zodiac, with the four cherubim, the man, ox, lion and eagle, representing the cardinal points and four elements, Aquarius, air, Taurus, earth, Leo, fire, and Scorpio, water. Walker elucidates upon these creatures. Ezekiel's four-faced creature composed of eagle, lion, bull, and man, was piously interpreted as prophesying the four evangelists, but the original biblical description was copied from the fabulous composite beasts of Assyria, who represented the four seasons of the year. CCCI. Biblical diviners and astrologers. In addition to these examples of astrology in the Bible can be found a number of references to esteemed biblical characters using the arts of divination to their and their Lord's benefit. Naturally, where characters are favored by biblical writers, these astrological and magical arts are perfectly good, but when used by those not favored, they are evil. Regardless of this prejudice, there is no doubt that good biblical characters practice the magical arts. In fact, in the earliest parts of the Bible, Divination is praised as a way to commune with God or divine the future, Genesis 30 27. Indeed, the word divination comes from the word divine, which is a demonstration that divination was originally considered godly and not evil. Divination does not fall out of favor until later books, eventually being considered a sin in the first book of Samuel, in which the Israelite king Saul uses a Diviner to divine for me by a spirit and bring up for me whomever I shall name to. You. The diviner or medium, whom Saul is approaching in disguise, objects to his request, saying, Surely you know what Saul has done, how he has cut off the mediums and the wizards from the land. Why then are you laying a snare for my life to bring about my death? It is interesting that this Saul, like the Saul of the New Testament, is notorious for persecuting people of a different faith. Moreover, when describing the men who joined David in his fight against Saul, biblical writers obfuscate the occupation of the men of the tribe of Issachar, of Issachar men who had understanding of the times, to know what Israel ought to do, 200 chiefs, and all their kinsmen under their command. 1 CHR 1232, in reality, these men who had understanding of the times are astrologers, and quite a lot of them at that. It is obvious that, Despite protestations to the contrary, the Israelites used astrologers to know what Israel ought to do. Furthermore, from the repeated biblical exhortations against these magical arts, it is clear that large numbers of people in Israel and Judah were practicing astrology and divination, as indicated at Isaiah 3 2, for example, where the Lord takes away from Judah and Jerusalem the judge and prophet, the diviner and elder. The judges in the OT are also priests and, in fact, judicial astrologers. CCCLCI. Furthermore, although Abraham in Jasher is represented as turning away from the sun and moon, his title of the Chaldeans was a reference to his status as an astrologer, a fact confirmed by church historian Eusebius who claimed that Abraham taught the science to the priests of Heliopolis or on CCCLXV. Moses and the Tabernacle for centuries, the character Moses has been held in high esteem, his every word studied and each move charted. Yet, few have understood the true nature of his covenant with the Lord, as reflected by the esoteric or mystical meaning of Moses's tabernacle, which, in fact, is the tent of the sun. Respected Jewish historian Josephus, who was an initiate of several secret societies, elucidates upon Moses's tabernacle. And when, Moses, ordered twelve loaves to be set on the table, he denoted the year, as distinguished into so many months. By branching out the candlestick into seventy parts he secretly intimated the Dakani, or seventy divisions of the planets, and as to the seven lamps upon the candlesticks, they referred to the course of the planets, of which that is the number. Now the vestment of the high priest being made of linen, signified the earth, the blue denoted the sky being like lightning in its pomegranates, and in the noise of the bells resembling thunder. 
Each of the sardonyxes declares to us the sun and the moon, those, I mean, that were in the nature of buttons on the high priest's shoulders. And for the twelve stones, whether we understand by them the months, or whether we understand the like number of the signs of that circle which the Greeks call the zodiac, we shall not be mistaken in their meaning. The twelve stones, of course, are the tribes or sons of Jacob, which Josephus firmly establishes as the constellations. Ccs VLX v Josephus is also explicit in relating other aspects of Jewish history as being astrological. Therefore, this astrological or astrotheological meaning of the Bible has been known a very long time. As Higgins says, the Mosaic account is allowed by all philosophers, as well as most of the early Jews and Christian fathers, to contain a mythos or allegory by Philo, Josephus, Papias, Pantinus, Irenaeus, Clemens Alex, Origen, the two Gregories of Nyssa and Nazianzen, Jerome, Ambrose, Ccsvi. Jacob and his sons and ladder. The father of these twelve constellations or tribes, Jacob, is the supplanter, Iacovo, which was a title for the adversary and twin of the sun, Set, or Seth, the night sky. Each of the twelve tribes had its own totem, god and religious accoutrements, brought out of Egypt. As demonstrated by the biblical texts, these groups did not reside peacefully with each other but fought constantly among themselves and with outsiders over whose god was superior and whose rituals and symbols were divinely inspired and correct. As to their zodiacal designations, Jacob's firstborn, Reuben, is Aquarius, the the beginning of my strength, unstable as water. Simeon and Levi, the brothers, are Gemini. Judah, the lion's whelp, is Leo. Zebulun, who shall be for an haven of ships, may correspond to Libra, the ship sign, or Ark, or Ark, Ccsvii Issachar is a strong ass, crouching between the sheepfold's burdens, possibly. Corresponding to the bull of Taurus, the workhorse. Of Jacob's son Dan, Anderson. Relates. Dan shall be the serpent by the way, an adder in the path, that biteth the horse heels, so that his rider shall fall backwards. This is, the scorpion, or serpent, and alludes to that constellation which is placed next to the centaur or armed horseman, or Sagittarius, which falleth backward into the winter solstice of, Capricorn, .cccx. Jacob's son Gad is a reversal of Dag, the fish god, possibly representing Pisces. It was said of Asher that he would have rich food or fat bread, thus, he would correspond to Virgo, the bread giver or fall harvest. Naphtali is a hind let loose, representing Capricorn, the goat. Joseph, who was fiercely attacked by archers, is Sagittarius. The son of Rachel the ewe, Benjamin, the ravenous wolf who divides the spoil, would be Ares, who comes in like a lion and divides spring and winter. According to Anderson, the fruitful bough of Joseph representing his sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, could share the portion divided between them of the double sign of cancer. Joseph himself, of course, is an interpreter of dreams and a noted magician with a magical silver cup, by which he divines. Jacob's ladder with the seventy-two angels ascending and descending represents the seventy-two decans, or portions of the zodiac of five degrees each. The same ladder story is found in Indian and Mithraic mythology, as Doan relates. Paintings representing a scene of this kind may be seen in works of art illustrative of Indian mythology. Man Rice speaks of one, in which he says, The souls of men are represented as ascending and descending, on a ladder, according to the received opinion of the sidereal metempsychosis. And Count de Volnay says, In the cave of Mithra was a ladder with seven steps, representing the seven spheres of the planets by means of which souls ascended and descended. This is precisely the ladder of Jacob's vision, CCCLXX. In addition, the name Jacob is a title for a priest of the goddess Isis, CCCXI which is fitting, since she is the queen of heaven who rules over the night sky, or set the supplanter. Joshua Jesus, son of Nun. Joshua, or Jesus, son of Nun, the fish, was the second great prophet after Moses, leading the Israelites to the promised land in Jericho first encamping at Gilgal, or Galilee. 
Like Jacob, Joshua also sets up twelve stones representing the tribes and the signs of the zodiac. It is said that in Joshua's day, the sun stood still, an event about which has been put forth much tortured speculation as to how and when it could have occurred. In reality, it occurred quite frequently and still does, at the solstices, as the meaning of the word solstice is sun stands still, the time when the sun changes little in declination from one day to the next and appears to remain in one place north or south of the celestial equator, CCCI the sun also stood still at the death of Krishna, centuries earlier, 1575 years before Christ, after the death of Krishna, Bud the son of Dirka, the sun stood still to hear the pious. Ejaculations of Arjun, CCCII This solstice motif likewise appears in the mythologies of China and Mexico. CCCV of the Book of Joshua, Higgins relates. Sir William Drummond has shown that the names of most of the places in Joshua are astrological, and General Valency has shown that Jacob's prophecy is astrological also, and has a direct reference to the constellations. CCCLXXV. As to Joshua and various other aspects of the Old Testament, Higgins sums it up. The pretended genealogy of the tenth chapter of Genesis, from Noah on down, is attended with much difficulty. It reads like a genealogy, it is notoriously a chart of geography. I have no doubt that the allotment of lands by Joshua was astronomical. It was exactly on the same principle as the gnomes of Egypt, which everyone knows were named astronomically, or rather, perhaps, I should say, astrologically. The double meaning is clear. Most of the names are found in the mystic work of Ezekiel. Genesis's 10th chapter divides the world into 72 nations. Much ingenuity must have been used to make them agree with the exact number of dodecans into which the great circle was divided. CCCXV. Daniel. In the famous scene where Daniel interprets the dreams of Cyrus and Nebuchadnezzar, it is implied that while the others who attempted to do likewise were astrologers, soothsayers and the like, Daniel himself was not. On the contrary, Daniel too was an astrologer, and we also discover he is not a historical character, as Walker relates. Writers of the Old Testament disliked the Danites, whom they called serpents, Genesis 49:17. Nevertheless, they adopted Daniel or Daniel, a Phoenician god of divination, and transformed him into a Hebrew prophet. His magic powers were like those of the Danites emanating from the goddess Dana and her sacred serpents. He served as court astrologer and dream interpreter for both the Persian king Cyrus, and the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel 121, 2 1, indicating that Daniel was not a personal name but a title, like the Celtic one, a person of the goddess Dana. CCSVI. Graham states that, the story of Daniel was taken from a northern Syrian poem written before 1500 BC. The hero, Daniel by name, was a son of El or God, the source of the Hebrew El. He was a mighty judge and lawgiver, also a provider for his people. This poem about him became so widely known that many races used its hero as a model for their own, CCSVII as for his visions, Larson says, it is evident that the apocalyptic tribulations of Daniel and those described in the New Testament are appropriated from the literature of the Zoroastrians, CCCX furthermore, although Daniel's prophecies are frequently held up to have been astoundingly accurate, proving the Bible to be the inspired word of God, they were actually written after the fact. In particular, the so-called prophecy at Daniel 9:24-27, referring to the coming of an anointed one, has been fervently interpreted to mean Jesus's advent. However, in the next paragraph, Daniel reveals whom he is really discussing, King Cyrus. Cyrus, in fact, is called the Lord's Christ, as at Isaiah 45:1, thus says the Lord to his Christ, to Cyrus. Esther. In the story of the heroine Esther, her husband-to-be, King Ahasuerus, becomes enraged by the behavior of his current wife, Queen Vashti, so he takes counsel with the wise men who knew the times, for this was the king's procedure toward all who were versed in law and judgment. These wise men who knew the times were astrologers, whom the king evidently considered versed in law and judgment and indispensable to the workings of his domain. This book is, however, not historical, as Esther is a remake of the goddess and queen of heaven Ishtar, 
Asherah, Astarte, Astareth or Isis, from whom comes Easter. Avesta, Walker relates. Star, the Hebrew rendering of Ishtar or Astarte. The biblical book of Esther is a secularized Elamite myth of Ishtar, Esther, and her consort Marduk, Mordecai, who sacrificed to the god Haman, or Amorn, Haman. Yahweh was never mentioned, because the Jews of Elam worshipped Marduk, not Yahweh. Even the Bible story admits that Esther Ishtar was not the real name of the Elamite Jewish queen. Her real name was Hadosa, Esther 27.cccLXXX. Walker continues. The story of Esther is an allegorical tale of the intercession of Ishtar, whom the Jews worshipped at the time, with the king who was supposed to be her consort, on behalf of the subject Jewish tribes. Interwoven with this theme is that of the ritual sacrifice. CCCXI. The Dial of Ahaz. In the second book of Kings and in Isaiah, the reformer King Hezekiah on his deathbed calls upon the Lord who adds fifteen years onto Hezekiah's life by making the shadow cast by the declining sun on the dial of Ahaz turn back ten steps, so the sun turned back on the dial the ten steps by which it had declined. This story represents the correction of the calendar to align with the changing heavens. Higgins elucidates. The cycles would require correcting again after several revolutions, and we find Isaiah making the shadow go back ten degrees on the dial of Ahaz. This would mean nothing but a second correction of the Nero's, 600-year cycle, or a correction of some cycle of a planetary body, to make it agree with some other. In the annals of China, in fact of the Chinese Buddhists, in the reign of Emperor Yao, a very striking name, being the name of the God of the Jews, it is said that the sun was stopped ten days, that is, probably, ten degrees of Isaiah, a degree answering to a year. 360 degrees and 360 days. CCCXCI. Deborah. The great biblical prophet Deborah is also an astrologer, who, in order to defeat Sisera's armies, uses the stars, from heaven fought the stars, from their courses they fought against Sisera. Judges 520, naturally, like Daniel, Esther, et al., Deborah is a deity of an older age rendered human. Queen B a ruler of Israel in the matriarchal period, bearing the same name as the goddess incarnate in early Mycenaean and Anatolian rulers as the pure mother bee. The Bible called her a prophetess or judge to disguise the fact that she was one of the governing matriarchs of a former age, judges for four, dot cccii. In addition to the biblical texts, there is direct evidence of the Jewish use of astrology in the scrolls found at the Dead Sea, specifically the horoscopes dated to the 1st century BCE. These horoscopes are similar to those used today but combine astrology with physiognomy, or the study of physical features. The Dead Sea horoscopes seem basically to be templates to determine who will be a good man and who will be bad, rather than castings for particular individuals. Also, as Zakaria Sitchin reports. Earlier in this century archaeologists uncovered in the Galilee, in northern Israel, the remains of synagogues dating to the decades and centuries immediately following the destruction of the Second Temple in Jerusalem by the Romans, in AD 70. To their surprise, a common feature of those synagogues was the decoration of their floors with intricate mosaic designs that included the signs of the zodiac. CCCXIV. Astrology in the New Testament The biblical astrological imagery does not end with the Old Testament, however, as the New Testament is also an astrotheological text. Although the biblical and Christian admonitions against astrology are pitched and hysterical, from the beginning of the Gospel tale we encounter astrology, as the three wise men or magi who used the stars to find the babe in the manager represent astrologers. Of this event, Ben Yehoshua says. It should be noted that the center of astrological superstition in the Roman Empire was the city of Tarsus in Asia Minor, the place where the legendary missionary Paul came from. The idea that a special star had heralded the birth of Jesus, and that a solar eclipse occurred at his death, is typical of Tarsian astrological superstition. Furthermore, at John 14 2 Jesus says, In my Father's house are many rooms, which is also translated many mansions. Walker explains. The original meaning of these mansions was houses of the moon, that is, 
the zodiacal constellations through which the moon goddess passed on her monthly round. CCCLXXXV. These houses, of course, are also applicable in the story of the sun. As Paul says at 1 Corinthians 15:41, revealing his astrotheological thinking, there is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for star differs from star in glory. In the Gospels, Jesus refers to different ages, which are in fact the divisions that constitute the procession of the equinoxes. As Moses was created to usher in the age of Ares, so was Jesus to serve as the avatar of the age of Pisces, which is evident from the abundant fish imagery used throughout the Gospel tale. This zodiacal connection has been so suppressed that people with the fish symbol on the back of their cars have no idea what it stands for although they are fallaciously told it represents ICHTHYS, an anagram for Jesus Christ, Son of God, Saviour, itch is also being the Greek word for fish. The residual symbols of the previous age of Ares can be found in the Lamb designations of Jesus, including the Agnus Dei, or Lamb of God. In addition, Jesus makes mention of the procession of the equinoxes or the change of the ages when he says to the disciples, who are asking about how to prepare for the Passover, behold, when you have entered the city, a man carrying a pitcher of water will meet you, follow him into the house which he enters. L.K. 22.10, this famous yet enigmatic passage refers to the house or age of Aquarius, the waterbearer, and Jesus is instructing his disciples to pass over into it. Furthermore, the upper room where Jesus sends his disciples to make ready is the same upper chambers in the heavens found in Amos. That the ancients, including Christians, were well aware of astrology and its influence is evident not only from the canonical biblical texts but also from those that did not make the final cut. For example, the non-canonical epistle of Barnabas, c. 100-120 CE, speaks of a 2000-year eon, clearly referring to one of the equinoctial ages, and the author of 1 Clement also expresses his knowledge of astrology, as well as his love for it. The heavens are moved by his direction and obey him in peace. Day and night accomplish the course assigned to them by him, without hindrance one to another. The sun and the moon and the dancing stars according to his appointment circle in harmony within the bounds assigned to them, without any swerving aside. The earth, bearing fruit in fulfillment of his will at her proper seasons, putteth forth the food that supplieth abundantly both men and beasts and all living things which are thereupon, making no dissension, neither altering anything which he hath decreed. In fact, the earliest Christians, the Gnostics, also were astrologers, and their texts are permeated with astrological imagery. The Gnostics developed the ages-old notion that the celestial bodies represented guides and levels through which the soul must pass after death, some paying penance in a temporary hell and others going directly to peace or heaven. As Allegro says, Thus for the Gnostic, as for religionists all over the world, the heavenly bodies were imbued with divinity and honoured as angelic bodies. CCCXV. The Gnostics also knew the allegorical and astrotheological nature of the life of Christ, as admitted by Christian father Irenaeus, and which was at the root of their denial of the historical Christ. As Graham relates. Irenaeus said, the Gnostics truly declared that all the supernatural transactions asserted in the Gospels were counterparts of what took place above, CCCXV. The astrological imagery was the major difference between Gnosticism and Christianity, and the primary reason the Gnostics were refuted and their texts destroyed or mutilated. There are many references to astrology in the canonical scriptures that are not as clear as those examined herein. What is clear is that the Hebrews and Christians were no more astrologer-free than any of their contemporaries or predecessors, although said predecessors, such as the Chaldeans and Babylonians, were in general far more skilled and Gnostic in the astrological arts. Indeed, Carl Anderson, master navigator and author of Astrology in the Old Testament, calls the Bible the greatest of all astrological works, CCCXVI Jordan Maxwell concurs. The Bible is nothing more than the greatest astrological, astronomical story ever told. It is pure astrology, based on the zodiac. The fact of the matter is, if you've done your homework, you're going to find out that the Bible is nothing more than astrotheology, 
the worship of God's heaven. CCCXIX. Astrology is no more evil than are the sky and the heavenly bodies, which biblical writers claimed were divine emanations of the grand architect. The vilification of astrology is not merely a sign of ignorance but, by insisting that its adherents were either lacking in wisdom or led astray by the devil, of cultural bigotry, as astrology has been appreciated and utilized in countless cultures around the globe. The ancients were, in fact, constantly re-enacting the heavens, a re-enactment that was eventually literalized and carnalized as the greatest story ever sold. 11. The Son of God is the Son of God. There is nothing new under the sun, Ecclesiastes 1 9. Over the ages, the ancients did not simply observe the movements of the celestial bodies but personified them and created stories about them that were recreated upon the earth. Out of this polytheistic, astrological atmosphere came the greatest story ever told, as the gospel tale is, in fact, astrotheological and non historical, recording the mythos found around the globe for eons. Thus, the Christian religion, created and shored up by forgery, fraud and force, is in reality astrotheological and its founder mythical, based on many thousands of years of observation by the ancients of the movements and interrelationships of the celestial bodies and the earth, one of the favorite of which was, understandably, the sun. The sun figured in the stories of virtually every culture worldwide. In many places and eras, the sun was considered the most visible proxy of the divine and the most potent bestower of spirit. It was regarded as the first entity in the void and the progenitor of all life and matter. The sun also represented the archetypal man, as human beings were perceived as solar entities. In addition to being a symbol of the spirit because it rises and sinks, the sun was the soul of the world, signifying immortality as it is eternally resurrected after dying or setting. It was also considered the purifier of the soul, as noted. Hence, from at least the Egyptian age down to the Gnostic Christians, the sun, along with the moon and other celestial bodies, was viewed as a guide into the afterlife. By the Gnostic Zoroastrians, the sun was considered the Archimagus, that noblest and most powerful agent of divine power who steps forth as a conqueror from the top of the terrible Alborj to rule over the world which he enlightens from the throne of Ormuz. CCCXC long before the Christian era, the sun was known as the son of Ormuz, the mediator, while his adversary, Araman, represented the darkness, which caused the fall of man. CCCXC. The sun was considered the savior of the world, as it rose and brought light and life to the planet. It was revered for causing seeds to burst and thus giving its life for plants to grow, hence, it was seen to sacrifice itself in order to provide fertility and vegetation. The sun is the tutelary genius of universal vegetation, CCCXCI as well as the god of cultivation and the benefactor of humankind. When the sun dies in winter, so does the vegetation, to be resurrected in the spring. The first fruits, vine and grain were considered symbols of the sun's strength and were ritualistically offered to the divine luminary. The solar heroes and gods were said to be teachers as well, because agriculture, a science developed out of astronomy, freed mankind to pursue something other than food, such as other sciences and the arts. The various personifications of the sun thus represent the image of fecundity which perpetuates and rejuvenates the world's existence, CCCII in their fertility. Aspects, the sun was the phallus, or lingam, and the moon was the vulva, or yoni, the male and female generative principles, the generators of all life on earth. In the mythos, the two pillars or columns of the celestial temple, the mysterious Jachin and Boaz, are the sun and moon. CCCCI of the relationship between the sun and moon, Hazelrig adds, the sun may be likened to a wire through which the planetary messages are electrically transmitted and of which the lunar moisture is the insulation, CCCXCV in the ancient world, light was the subject of awe, and the sunlight's ability to make plants grow was considered magical and miraculous. So special is light that the writer of Ecclesiastes waxes, light is sweet, and it is pleasant for the eyes to behold the sun. We know that it is not pleasant for the eyes to behold the direct light of the sun, it is, however, pleasant for humanity to behold the sun as it rises in the morning, bringing light and life. 
Indeed, the sun itself is the face of the divine upon which it is impossible to look. Thus, the sun was very important to the ancients, so much so that around the world for millennia a wide variety of peoples have built solar temples, monuments and entire religions with priestesses and priests of the sun, along with complex rituals and accoutrements. Within these religions is contained the ubiquitous mythos, a template or archetypical story that personifies the heavens and earth, and rolls them into a drama about their interrelationship. Rather than being an entertaining but useless fairy tale, as myths are erroneously considered to be, the mythos is designed to pass along from generation to generation information vital to life on earth, so that humans do not have to learn it repeatedly but can progress. Without the knowledge, or gnosis, of the celestial mythos, humankind would still be in caves. The celestial mythos is complicated because the solar myth is intertwined with the lunar, stellar and terrestrial myths. In addition, some of the various celestial players were introduced later than others, and many of them took on new functions as the focus switched from stars to moon to sun to other planets, and back again. For example, Horus is not only the sun but also the North Pole star, and his twin brother come adversary, Set, represents not only darkness but also the South Pole star. Furthermore, as time progresses and the skies change, as with the procession of the equinoxes and the movements of the sun annually through the zodiac and daily through its houses, as well as with cataclysm, the attributes of the planetary bodies within the mythos also change. Moreover, the incorporation of the phases of moon into the mythos adds to its complexity. The moon, like the sun, changed continually the track in which she crossed the heavens, moving ever to and fro between the upper and lower limits of the zodiac, and her different places, phases, and aspects there, and her relations with the sun and the constellations, have been a fruitful source of mythological fables. CCCXV. An example of the complexity of the mythos is provided by the story of the Queen of Heaven, the goddess Isis, mother of Horus, who is not only the moon that reflects the sun, she is the original creator, as well as the constellation of Virgo. As the moon, she is the woman clothed with the sun, and as the virgin, she is the sun's mother. She is also Stella Maris, the star of the sea, as she regulates the tides, a fact known of the moon beginning eons ago, as were the facts of the roundness of the earth and of the heliocentricity of the solar system again, knowledge never actually lost and rediscovered, as popularly portrayed. The sun and moon were deemed to be one being in some cultures or twins in others. When eclipses occurred, it was said that the moon and sun were uniting to create lesser gods. Thus, the pantheon kept growing. Although it is generally now considered to be male, the sun was also regarded as female in several places, including Alaska, Anatolia, Arabia, Australia, Canaan, England, Germany, India, Japan, North America and Siberia. The sun's feminine side was, naturally, suppressed by the patriarchy. As Walker says, the popular European tradition usually made the sun male and the moon female, chiefly to assert that his light was stronger, and that she shone only by reflected glory, symbol of the position of women in patriarchal society. However, Oriental and pre-Christian systems frequently made the sun a goddess. When one factors into this complexity the fertility aspect of the gods and goddesses of the grape and grain, along with the sexual imagery found in all mythologies and religions, one can understand why it has been so difficult to sort it. All out. The Zodiac. As the mythos developed, it took the form of a play, with a cast of characters, including the twelve divisions of the sky called the signs or constellations of the zodiac. The symbols that typified these twelve celestial sections of thirty degrees each were not based on what the constellations actually look like but represent aspects of earthly life. Thus, the ancient peoples were able to incorporate these earthly aspects into the mythos and project them onto the all-important celestial screen. These zodiacal designations have varied from place to place and era to era over the tens of thousands of years during which the skies have been observed, for a number of reasons, including the changes in the skies brought on by the procession. For example, Scorpio is not only the eagle but also the scorpion. It is difficult to determine absolutely all of their origins, but the current zodiacal symbols or totems. 
are all may have been devised as follows, based on the formula made by inhabitants of the Northern Hemisphere. Aries is represented as the ram lamb because March-April is the time of the year when lambs are born. Taurus is the bull because April-May is the time for plowing and tilling. Gemini is the twins, so called for Castor and Pollux, the twin stars in its constellation, as well as because May-June is the time of the increase or doubling of the sun, when it reaches its greatest strength. After the sun reaches its strength at the summer solstice and begins to diminish in Cancer, June-July, the stars are called the crab, who backslides. Leo is the lion because, during the heat of July-August, the lions in Egypt would come out of the hot desert. Virgo, originally the great mother earth, is the gleaning virgin, who holds a sheath of wheat, symbolizing August-September, the time of the harvest. Libra, September-October, is the balance, reflecting the autumnal equinox, when the days and night are again even in length. Scorpio is the scorpion because in the desert areas the fierce storms of October-November were called scorpions and because this time of the year is the backbiter of the sun as it begins to wane. Sagittarius is the vindictive archer who side wounds and weakens the sun during its approach in November-December towards the winter solstice. In Capricorn, the weakened sun encounters the filthy, ill-omened he-goat, who drags the solar hero down in December-January. Aquarius is the water-bearer because January-February is the time of winter rains. Pisces is represented by the fishes because February-March is the time when the thinning ice is broken and the fattened fish are plucked out. CCCXVI. The story of the skies was so important to the ancients that they were singularly focused on it and their lives in effect revolved around it. As we have seen, however, the heavens were revered not only by so-called pagans but also by biblical peoples, including the Israelites, whose name and various Elohim were also stars and aspects of the solar celestial mythos. In the Bible, the sun is worshipped in various forms by the Hebrews and kings of Judah. It is also overtly personified and imbued with divine and ethical qualities, as in Deuteronomy, that thy friends be like the sun as he rises in his might. Throughout the Old Testament important deeds are done in the sight of this sun, before the sun, or under the sun, revealing the ages-old perception of the sun as God's proxy, judge or eye. So significant was the solar orb that it was ever a grave concern that the sun would go down on the prophets. At Psalms 113.3, the chosen are instructed to praise the Lord from the rising of the sun to its setting. Psalms 85.11 states, Faithlessness will spring up from the ground, and righteousness will look down from the sky. Psalms 84.11 reads, For the Lord God is a sun and shield. At Psalms 68.32-32, the faithful are instructed to sing praises to Jah, to him who rides in the heavens, the ancient heavens, whose majesty is over Israel, and his power is in the skies, exactly as was said about the ubiquitous solar hero. At Psalms 72.17, we read, May his name endure forever, his fame continue as long as the sun, and, at Malachi 1.11, for from the rising of sun to its setting my name is great among the nations. The Lord's name is not said to be great after the setting of the sun, during the night, because his name is the sun, as we have seen Iao, Jar, YHWH and so on, to mean. Thus, the esteem of the sun by the Hebrews is evident, Yet, the story of the solar hero is also found in numerous places in the Old Testament, but these stories are masked by carnalization and historicization. Indeed. So important was the sun to the ancients, including the Israelites, that they created a sun book, a Aelio Biblio, or Holy Bible, CCCX the original of which can be found in the myths encoded in stone and story around the ancient world millennia before the Judeo-Christian Bible was compiled. The word Bible itself comes from the city of the Great Mother, Byblos, in Phoenicia. As Walker relates, Bibles were named after her city because the earliest libraries were attached to her temple, CD as noted, the Judeo-Christian Bible was written by a number of hands, edited numerous times and contains countless errors and inaccuracies. It is a rehash of ancient legends and myths, and is not, therefore, the infallible word of God. Such, says Graham, is the Bible's revealed truth other races' mythology, 
the basis of which is cosmology, Kti the cosmology or celestial mythos has in reality been hidden from the masses for many centuries for the purposes of enriching and empowering the ruling elite. Its conspiring priest kings have ruled empires in full knowledge of it since time immemorial and have lauded it over the heads of the serfs. The Son of God Within the Sun Book or Holy Bible was incorporated by such priestcraft the most consolidated version of the celestial mythos ever assembled, the story of the Son of God. First, we have seen that God is the Sun. Second, in Job 38 the stars are called sons of God, hence, one star would be a son of God, as well as the son of the sun. Thus, the son of God is the son of God. The solar mythos, in fact, explains why the narratives of the sons of God previously examined are so similar, with a Godman who is crucified and resurrected, who does miracles and has twelve disciples, etc., to wit, these stories were in actuality based on the movements of the sun through the heavens. In other words, Jesus Christ and the others upon whom he is predicated are personifications of the sun, and the gospel fable is merely a repeat of a mythological formula revolving around the movements of the sun through the heavens. For example, many of the world's crucified godmen have their traditional birthdays on December 25th, Christmas. This date is set because the ancients recognized that, from a geocentric perspective in the northern hemisphere, the sun makes an annual descent southward until after midnight of December 21, the winter solstice, when it stops moving southerly for three days and then starts to move northward again. During this time, the ancients declared that God's son had died for three days and was born again after midnight of December 24. Thus, these many different cultures celebrated with great joy the son of God's birthday on December 25. The following are the main characteristics of the son of God. The sun dies for three days at the winter solstice, to be born again or resurrected on December 25. The Son of God is born of a virgin, which refers to both the new or virgin moon and the constellation of Virgo. The sun's birth is attended by the bright star, either Sirius Sotis or the planet Venus, and by the three kings, representing the three stars in the belt of Orion. The sun at its zenith, or the twelfth noon, is in the house or heavenly temple of the Most High, thus, he begins his father's work at age twelve. Maxwell relates, at that point, all Egypt offered prayers to the Most High God, CDI. The sun enters into each sign of the zodiac at thirty degree, hence, the Son of God begins his ministry at age thirty. As Hazelrig states, the sun of the visible heavens has moved northward thirty degrees and stands at the gate of Aquarius, the water-bearer, or John the Baptist of the mystic planisphere, and here begins the work of ministry in the Palestine, CDI. The sun is the carpenter who builds his daily houses or twelve two-hour divisions. The sun's followers or disciples are the twelve signs of the zodiac, through which the sun must pass. The sun is anointed when its rays dip into the sea.cdiv. The sun changes water into wine by creating rain, ripening the grape on the vine and fermenting the grape juice. The sun walks on water, referring to its reflection.cdv. The sun calms the sea as he rests in the boat of heaven, cdvi, mount. 8 colon 23-7. When the sun is annually and monthly reborn, he brings life to the solar mummy, his previous self, raising it from the dead. The sun triumphantly rides an ass and her foal into the city of peace when it enters the sign of cancer, which contains two stars called little asses, and reaches its fullness. CDVII. The sun is the lion when in Leo, the hottest time of the year, called the throne of the Lord. The sun is betrayed by the constellation of the scorpion, the Backbiter, the time of the year when the solar hero loses his strength. The sun is crucified between the two thieves of Sagittarius and Capricorn. The sun is hung on a cross, which represents its passing through the equinoxes, the vernal equinox being Easter. The sun darkens when it dies, the solar god as the sun of evening or of autumn was the suffering, dying sun, or the dead sun buried in the netherworld, cdviii. The sun does a stutter step at the winter solstice, unsure whether to return to life or resurrect, doubted by his twin Thomas. 
The sun is with us always, to the close of the age, Mount 28 colon 20, referring to the ages of the procession of the equinoxes. The sun is the light of the world, and comes on clouds, and every eye shall see him. The sun rising in the morning is the saviour of mankind. The sun wears a corona, crown of thorns or halo. The sun was called the sun of the sky, God, all-seeing, the comforter, healer, saviour, creator, preserver, ruler of the world, and giver of daily life, cdix. The sun is the word or logos of God. The all-seeing sun, or eye of God, was considered the judge of the living and dead who returned to earth on a white horse, cdx. A church ward demonstrates the complex yet poetic celestial mythology of the Egyptians, developed around the core mythos long prior to the Christian era. The sun was not considered human in its nature when the solar force at dawn was imaged by the lion-faced atom, the flame of the furnace by the fiery serpent Wati, the soul of its life by the hawk, the ram, or the crocodile. Until Hayor the elder Horus was depicted as the child in the place of the calf or lamb, fish, or shoot of papyrus plant, which now occurred in the solar cult, no human figure was personalized in the mythology of Egypt. Isis in this cult takes the place of Aether as the mother moon, the reproducer of light in the underworld. The place of conjunction and of rebegetal by the sun god was in the underworld, when she became the woman clothed with the sun. At the end of lunation the old moon died and became a corpse, it is at times portrayed as a mummy in the underworld and there it was revivified by the sun god, the solar fecundation of the moon representing the mother, resulting in her bringing forth the child of light the crippled deity, who was begotten in the dark.cdxi Massey provides another sketch of the mythos as applied to Horus, who, like Baal, was the sun in the age of Taurus. The infant Horus, who sank down into Hades as the suffering sun to die in the winter solstice and be transformed to rise again and return in all his glory and power in the equinox at Easter.cdxi. As we have seen, the story of Jesus is virtually identical in numerous important aspects to that of Horus, a solar myth. Higgins spells it out. The history of the sun, is the history of Jesus Christ. The sun is born on the 25th of December, the birthday of Jesus Christ. The first and greatest of the labors of Jesus Christ is his victory over the serpent, the evil principle, or the devil. In his first labor Hercules strangled the serpent, as did Krishna, Bacchus, etc. This is the sun triumphing over the powers of hell and darkness, and, as he increases, he prevails, till he is crucified in the heavens, or is decussated in the form of a cross, according to Justin Martyr, when he passes the equator at the vernal equinox. Cdxii. At Malachi 4:2, YHWH says, But for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness shall rise with healing on its wings. Who is this son of righteousness with healing on its wings? Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament, and this scripture is one of the last in that book, which leads directly into the story of Jesus, who was indeed called by the church fathers the son of righteousness. Malachi's son of righteousness rising with healing on its wings is, in reality, the saving light that ends the gloom of night, the daily resurrection of sunrise, and the birth of the son of a new age, who was carnalized and historicized in Jesus Christ. As Shamash, which is the Hebrew word for sun and the name of the Babylonian sun god, Malachi's righteous son is also Solomon's Moabite god Chamosh, which is the same as Shamash in Hebrew, an ironic development considering Chamosh was later demonized by the Christians. Jesus's solar attributes are also laid plain by the story of his followers waiting to Go to his tomb until sunrise, when he is risen. In John 2, Jesus says, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. However, as John relates, he spoke of the temple of his body, an admission of biblical allegory. In this statement, Jesus describes his own solar resurrection, not that of the Jerusalem temple, although the original temple of the Most High is indeed the same temple of the Son that is Jesus's body. In fact, Jesus is called the Son of the Most High God, LK 828, MK 5:7, and a priest after the order of Melchizedek, who was the priest of the Most High, El Elyon, or Alios, the Son. At Acts 26:13, 13, 
Regarding his conversion Paul says, At midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining round me and those who journeyed with me, the light, of course, being Jesus. The words at midday represent the sun at its zenith, when it is doing its work in the temple of the Most High, brighter than at any other time. As expected, the early Christians were considered sun worshippers, like their pagan counterparts, although sun worship is an inaccuracy, since the ancients did not worship the sun as the one god but revered it as one of the most potent symbols of the quality of divinity. For example, Krishna was considered not just the sun itself but the light in the sun and moon, CDX5 making him, like Jesus, brighter than the sun. Like their predecessor temples, many early Christian churches faced the east, or the place of the rising Sunday. In fact, as Doan relates, Tertullian says that Christians were taken for worshippers of the sun because they prayed towards the east, after the manner of those who adored the sun. CDXV ex-pagan and Bishop of Carthage Tertullian's actual words from his apology are as follows. Others, again, certainly with more information and greater verisimilitude, believe that the sun is our god. We shall be counted Persians perhaps, though we do not worship the orb of day painted on a piece of linen cloth, having himself everywhere in his own disc. The idea no doubt has originated from our being known to turn to the east in prayer. But you, many of you, also under pretense sometimes of worshipping the heavenly bodies, move your lips in the direction of the sunrise. In the same way, if we devote Sunday to rejoicing, from a far different reason than sun worship, we have some resemblance to those of you who devote the day of Saturn to ease and luxury, though they too go far away from Jewish ways, of which indeed they are ignorant. In his protestations and refutations of critics, Tertullian further ironically admits the true origins of the Christ story and of all other such godmen by stating, you say we worship the sun, so do you. CDXVI Interestingly, a previously strident believer and defender of the faith, Tertullian later renounced Christianity. CDXVI Christ was frequently identified as an awe with the sun by other early Orthodox Christian fathers, including Saint Cyprian, D. 258, who spoke of Christ as the true Son, Saul Verus, and Saint Ambrose, at 339-397, Bishop of Milan, who said of Christ, He is our new Sunday CDXVI other church fathers who identified Christ with, if not as, the Son include Saint Gregory of Nazianzus, C. 330-C-389, and Saint Zeno of Verona, D. C. 375, who calls Christ Saul Noster, Saul Verus. Moreover, this overt Christian sun worship was not a short-lived aberration, as Christian proponents would portray it. Wheelis relates that Leo the Great in his day, 440-461, says that it was the custom of many Christians to stand on the steps of the Church of St. Peter and pay homage to the sun by obeisance and prayers, CDXI as to such insider knowledge of the true meaning of Christianity, Doan remarks. Many Christian writers have seen that the history of their Lord and Saviour is simply the history of the Son, but they either say nothing, or, like Dr. Procrust and the Reverend J.P. Lundy, claim that the Son is a type of the true Son of Righteousness. This type of sophistry has been used frequently in religious debate to squeeze out of a tight corner. Yet, the Christian conspirators cannot hide the fact that their Lord's Day is indeed Sunday, hence, their Lord is the Son. Even though this information has been well hidden, the early Christians were aware that Christ was the Son, as they were truly Gnostic and the solar myth was known all around them. When a member of at least one such Gnostic sect wished to become Orthodox, he was compelled to renounce his heresy of equating Christ with the Son. Higgins relates of the influential and widespread Gnostic group called the Manichaeans. When a Manichaean came over to the Orthodox he was required to curse his former friends in the following terms, I curse Sarades, Zarathustra Zoroaster, who, Maine said, had appeared as a god before his time among the Indians and Persians, and whom he calls the sun. I curse those who say Christ is the sun, and who make prayers to the sun, and to the moon, and to the stars, and pay attention to them as if they were really gods, and who give them titles of most lucid gods, and who do not pray to the true god only towards the east, but who turn themselves round, following the motions of the sun with their innumerable supplications. 
I curse those persons who say that Zaradis and Buddhas, Buddha, and Christ and Manichaeus and the Son are all one and the same, cdxx. In his second apology, Justin Martyr acknowledges that the Gnostic Christian Manichaeans were sun worshippers and says. Accordingly, Menander seems to me to have fallen into error when he said, O son! For thou, first of gods, ought to be worshipped, by whom it is that we are able to see the other gods. For the sun never could show me the true God, but that healthful word, that is the son of the soul, by whom alone, when he arises in the depths of the soul, the eye of the soul itself is irradiated. In order to obfuscate the origins of Christianity, Justin is attempting to distinguish between the sun of the Gnostics, which was the solar orb, and the sun, soul, of the soul in the person of Jesus Christ. In fact, the sun of the Gnostics and other sun worshippers also represented the cosmic and cellular sun found in living things, including human beings, who, it was perceived, by Gnosticism can become illuminated. Thus, both Gnostic and Orthodox Christians were addressing the same son of the soul, but the Orthodoxy insisted on putting a particular face and shape to it. One might also wonder how the omnipresent divine is separated out of its creation, such that it is everywhere but not in the sun, moon, stars, sky, earth and all of creation. To reiterate, the ancients were not just monotheistic, polytheistic and atheistic, as the Christians called and were called by their adversaries, but pantheistic, seeing the divine in everything, as is the definition of omnipresence. It is clear that from early times Christ was correctly perceived by the Gnostic sects as the sun, a fact that the historicizing Christians were continuously compelled to combat, as is evidenced by the Antimanichaean oath specifically designed to refute such assertions. Yet, as Higgins states, the sun, Iao, and Jesus, were all taken for the same being by the ancients, and it will require more than the skill of the whole priesthood to disprove it, cdxi furthermore, the adoption, or, rather, creation, of Christianity was not much of a stretch for the Roman conspirators. In the early Christian era, Roman emperors were routinely identifying themselves with the sun god and all his symbols, cross, eagle, fire, gold, lion, and so on. Constantine I, whom conventional history hails as the first Christian emperor, was actually a worshipper of the sun god, whose image he placed on his coins, dedicated to the invincible sun, my guardian, CDXII. In fact, a 100 lire coin issued by the Vatican depicts a woman, symbolizing the church, holding a cup in her right hand, which represents the pagan sunburst way for God, CDXII this wafer or host used in communion by the Catholic Church as a symbol for the body of Christ is actually a very ancient symbol for the sun. The Catholic monstrance or ostentorium, the device used to serve the Lord's host, is also a sunburst, as admitted by Catholic authorities. CDXI Christian art, like that of Buddhism and Hinduism, makes extensive use of the halo or sunburst behind its godman, mother of God, and saints. As Massey says, the halo of light which is usually shown surrounding the face of Jesus and Christian saints, is another concept taken from the sun god. The solar nature of Jesus Christ is thus reflected in art, explaining nobody knew what he looked like and why he was variously represented as a sun god, such as Apollo or Elias. As Biederman says, In Christian iconography the sun, rising over and over again in the east, symbolizes immortality and resurrection. There are 4th century mosaics showing Christ as a alios figure in a solar chariot surrounded by sunbeams, or surrounded by a solar nimbus. Since Christ is also triumphant over time, chronocrator, he is frequently associated with the sun, which measures out the length of each day, in Romanesque art.cdxxv. The term associated with is a typical historicizing obfuscation, because Christ is the sun, which Christian artists have obviously known. The Apollo Alios Jesus image is often very light of complexion, with short blonde hair, reflective not of an actual person but of the light and color of the sun. Other solar depictions include men with red hair, representative of the setting and summer sun, and black images symbolizing the orb in the dark underworld of night, which is the reason for the black bambinos and crucifixes in churches around the globe, not only of Jesus but also Krishna and other solar heroes. As stated, these black crucifixes have led some to posit that Jesus was black, i.e., African, however, 
Despite this compulsion to make Christ all things to all people, these images depict the black or nighttime Sunday. In fact, they are part of the mythos, which holds that the solar orb and night sky are a dual-natured god, represented by twins battling for supremacy. Let us now see further how the solar mythos was passed to us as the Christian myth. To do so, we will also be following the sun's annual movements through the heavenly zodiac. According to legend, Jesus was born in a stable between a horse and a goat, symbols of Sagittarius and Capricorn. He was baptized in Aquarius, the water-bearer. He chose his first disciples, fishermen, in Pisces, the sign of the fishes. He became the good shepherd and the lamb in Ares, the ram. Jesus told the parables of the sowing and tilling of the fields in Taurus, the bull. In Cancer, the celestial sea of Galilee, CDXVI he calmed the storm and waters, spoke of backsliders, the crab, and rode the ass and foal in triumph into the city of peace, Jerusalem. Jesus was the lion in Leo. In Libra, Christ was the true vine in the garden of Jethsemane, the wine press, as this is the time of the grape harvest. Jesus was betrayed by Judas, the backbiter, or Scorpio. In Sagittarius, Jesus was wounded in the side by the centaur, or centurion. He was crucified at the winter solstice between the two thieves of Sagittarius and Capricorn, who sapped his strength. Roberts elaborates the solar drama. The passage of the sun, in its annual course through the constellations of the zodiac, having his birth in the sign of the goat, the Augean stable of the Greeks, his baptism in Aquarius, the John the Baptist in the heavens, his triumph when he becomes the Lamb of God in Ares, his greatest exaltation on St. John's, the beloved Disciples' Day, on the 21st of June, in the sign of the twins, the emblem of double power, his tribulation in the Garden of Jethsemane, in the sign of the rural Virgo, his betrayal in the sign of Scorpio, the malignant emblem of his approaching death in the stormy and adverse sign, Sagittarius, and his resurrection or renewed birth on the 25th of December in the same sign of the celestial goat. Regarding the mysterious garden of Jethsemane, Wells says, they went to a place which is called Jethsemane. Nothing is known of such a place, CDXVI in fact, the garden exists in the sky. In addition, Jesus in the upper room symbolizes the sun in the upper signs. As the two equinoxes divide the solar orbit into two halves, also represented by the two genealogies of Jesus in the Gospels. CDXVI Hazelrig gives the astrological meaning of the Annunciation of the Divine One's birth. Directing our gaze to the right, we see rising on the eastern angle of the planisphere the constellation of the Virgin, the sixth sign of the zodiac, or sixth month, reckoning from March, Aries. And in the sixth month the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a virgin espoused by a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. Luke I 26, 27. CDXX. He further explains the passion as it appears in the Mythos. In due order, the next quarter introduces the passion, a term appositely chosen and applied, prefaced under Ares, the first sign of the fiery triplicity, which is the veil of Gehenna. Thence comes Calvary, conformably with the crucifixion of the Son of Nature at the gate of Libra, with the zodiacal virgin recumbent next to this point of supreme sacrifice. CDXXX. The story of the Son is a daily, monthly, annual and processional drama that takes place cyclically and over thousands of years. In order to change the mythos into the life of a man, in other words, to personify and historicize it it was necessary to make the tale linear, such that there are discrepancies between the stories of the Son and that of the historical Jesus. For example, while the Son dies and is reborn or resurrected daily, monthly, annually and processionally, as a person Jesus can only undergo such experiences once. In the early Christian period, when the story was still being formulated, yet another debate raged as to how long after beginning his ministry Christ was supposed to suffer his passion, with a common portrayal that it occurred in the twelfth month after his baptism, i.e., at the winter solstice, following his baptism in Aquarius, as acknowledged by Irenaeus, who wrote against the heretics, t. He affirm that he suffered in the twelfth month, so that he continued to preach for one year after his baptism. 
Irenaeus then insists that Christ did not suffer in the twelfth month after his baptism, but was more than fifty years old when he died. Irenaeus's statements reveal not only Jesus's solar nature, but also that by his time, c. 140 c. 200, the gospel story was not set in stone, as it would have been, had it happened in history. In fact, some of the writings of the early Christian fathers demonstrate that they are discussing a number of different individuals, which is to be expected, since the Christ character is a composite of many. These various debates reflect the complexity of the mythos, as further illustrated by Massey. When it was discovered that the moon was a mirror to the solar light, the sun god as Osiris was reborn monthly in awe of the moon. Thus, the resurrection in three days became that of the lunar solar god. The Christ who rose again in three days for the fulfillment of scripture must be the Christ according to that scripture which contained the mythos, and the fulfillment of scripture was the completion of astronomical cycles, whether lunar, solar, or processional. CDXXI. As stated, the character of Jesus Christ was in fact created as the solar avatar or hero of the age of Pisces, into which the sun was moving during the first centuries before the Christian era, an ill-omened time between ages of celestial no man's land. Jesus as the Lamb of God was a remnant of the previous age of Ares. And as it approached the gates of spring, the Lamb of God, or the Lamb of March gathered up the sins of the world, or the sins of the winter, and bore them away. And thus was realized, astronomically, not only the Lamb of God taking away the sins of the world, but also the death and resurrection of the Son of God, or the Son God, more properly. CDXII. Massey describes the changes of the ages. When Horus had fulfilled the period of 2,155 years with the Easter equinox in the sign of Ares, the birthplace passed into the sign of Pisces, when the ever-coming one, the renewer as the eternal child who had been brought forth as a lion in Leo, a beetle in Cancer, as one of the twins in Gemini, as a calf in the sign of the bull, and a lamb in the sign of the ram, was destined to manifest as the fish, in the sign of the fishes. The rebirth of Atom Horus, or Jesus, as the fish users, and the bread of Nephthys, was astronomically dated to occur in Bethlehem, the house of bread about 255 BC, at the time the Easter equinox entered the sign of Pisces, the house of corn and bread. Massey also states that Horus in Egypt had been a fish from time immemorial, and when the equinox entered the sign of Pisces, Horus was portrayed as itches with the fish sign of over his head. He further says, the Messiah who manifested in this sign was foreordained to come as Itches the fisherman, or, doctrinally, the fisher of men, CDXIO thus, Jesus is the Piscean fish god, who, at Luke 24 11 2 upon his resurrection is made to ask, do you have any fish, establishing the choice of communion food of the new age. Hence, the fish was ordered to be eaten in Catholicism. In addition, the Early Christians were called Pisciculi little fishes CDXXI as the solar hero of the Piscean age, Jesus is also made to say, I am with you always until the close of the age. It is now the close of the age of Pisces, and the sun is moving into the age of Aquarius, a second coming that signifies the changing of the guard.